I wish you could come to work with me some days and listen to all the married Christian women who are struggling and who are in deep pain and deep disappointment because no man can be your salvation. Okay, so when it comes to marriage, um, we see a lot of people go into marriage with a, a lot of expectations, big ideas, how amazing it's going to be, how perfect it's going to be. We know that marriage isn't like absolutely everything. It is not um, just this, once you get married, life just becomes this perfect fairy tale romance and everything is easy. And as long as you have that attraction, it's just absolutely incredible. Yes, oh, like why? I'm so mad at it. It's so, destroying so many lives under the guise of being this like sexual freedom. And my mom would ask me questions like, and it might sound cringe, okay? But my mom would ask me questions like, so how did you feel in your body when that happened? And like what she was getting at is, did you get turned on? Right? And because in a marriage, it's not going to be all like rainbows and butterflies all the time. They're going to be those highs. But they're also going to be those lows. They're going to be hardships. They're going to be tragedies. They're going to be difficulties that you will face as a couple. It's different from season to season. There are going to be seasons where sex does not feel easy. And I think that's quite normal. I've experienced that for myself. I've ex I've heard of it in so many of my clients' lives. There Unfortunately, there are just a lot of couples who are not doing very well and who are not very happy. And if marriage and passion and romance were the answer, then more couples would be in love through the distance. But we expect romance to carry us and then we find ourselves very disappointed. Today is literally so freezing. I am filming wrapped in a heated blanket. It is so cold we've had snow recently i am thoroughly not enjoying this <laughs> hopefully as we go along with filming i'm going to heat up a little bit and i won't be quite so shivery and cold but hi everyone <laughs> today we are going to be reviewing bethany beale of girl defines sex course for single women and i'm very excited to tell you that this video is sponsored by Valesa, one of my favorite brands to work with i'm really happy they've decided to sponsor me again so i'll tell you a little bit more about them in just a bit now if you've seen my videos before you may know that a couple of months back i made a big in-depth review of bethany's first course her first sex course for married women and it was something <laughs> It was poorly made, it was filled with misinformation or just incomplete information. It felt like the guest speakers were chosen more because Bethany had questions for them about her own marriage than because they actually had anything of value to provide to the audience, the viewer, the people paying for this course. The lessons were incredibly unstructured, they were repetitive interviews that didn't really teach you anything about anything overall not worth the 80 quid that I paid for it and definitely not worth the $169 original asking price that Bethany had for the course. But reviewing that course did have some benefit because I because I ended up donating like something around 15% of the pre-tax revenue I made on that video to the charity Mermaids which helps trans youth and their families in the UK and I think is a really good cause. So something good did come out of Bethany's marriage course. And so now that I'm reviewing her singles course as well, I also want to make a charity donation as well based on what I make in this video. I did manage to get a discount code for this second course as well, so thankfully I didn't pay full price for it because I'm trying to limit the money that I give to Bethany. We do not want to be funding her harmful beliefs if we can. So once again, I'm going to be donating 80 quid of my own money because that's what I paid for this course. Um, I'm going to be donating that to a charity and again, 10 to 15% of the ad revenue that I make on this video. I'm not sure how much that's going to be yet, obviously, but Obviously the more views it gets, the more money it makes, the more I can donate, which is really, really great. This time I'm donating to a charity that is really, really close to my heart and that is Refuge. Refuge helps support women and children who are getting away from domestic violence and helps keep them safe and helps make sure they don't end up back in those really dangerous environments. So I think they're wonderful and I'm glad that some good can come out of the absolute trash that Bethany Beale is putting out into the world. I also just want to take a moment to just like clear something up about the donations that I made to Mermaid because I saw a content creator who doesn't like me very much calling me a fraud and saying I was donating other people's money so it doesn't count and yes I did share the link so people could donate to Mermaids off their own back if they wanted but all the money I donated was my money. The first donation came out of my bank account and the subsequent donations 
that I made based on the ad revenue I got came out of my bank account. Being a YouTuber is my full-time job and the money I make through ad revenue is what pays my bills, it's what pays my rent, I don't have anyone else supporting me, this is my life and my job, so, so my ad revenue is my money that I have to live off, so I took a portion of that and donated it to mermaids. That's not donating other people's money, that's my money, and I'm doing it because I believe it's a good cause and they deserve the support, that's all there is to it. I think I was pretty transparent in sharing my receipts of like what I donated, like I posted on the video the 80 quid or whatever donation that I made, I posted on my community tab about like a couple of the donations, like one of them was for like 300 pound I think and stuff like that, so I've been very transparent with it and I, I don't really understand how anyone can have a problem with that but yeah. I just wanted to clarify that and just keep being transparent going forward. Okay, now all that is out of the way, let's take a closer look at the Ultimate Sexuality Mentorship course for single women. This two-week intensive is deigned to help you navigate God's amazing design for your sexuality and thrive right where he has you as a single woman. Hey look, it's full of typos already. Woman instead of women and deigned instead of designed. <sighs> It's funny, there was a typo in the introduction to her marriage course as well. You would think that, you know, in something as important as the title or the introductory sentence, you wouldn't make a mistake, but here we are. <laughs> and the thing is, like, I don't begrudge people making typos and stuff. I make typos all the time. Annoyingly, in my poetry book, I've seen, like, two typos in there that I'm like, oh my god, the amount of times I went through that book and there were still typos I didn't catch, it's very frustrating. But the problem is when they're like pointed out to you and you don't change them, you know? There are honestly just so many typos throughout this entire course and all the written material, it's just a little overwhelming. There's not even that much actual like written material in this course, most of it is just videos, so the fact there are so many typos throughout the text is just like... <laughs> really? One thing I will say before we start looking into the content itself is that Bethany kind of made being the single one her identity for so long, like 30 years, that I do reckon she is far more qualified to teach this course than she was her marriage one, so I don't begr begrudge her that. Hey, well, I am just jumping in with a little Kooby bear because we have something really exciting to tell you. So one of the big things I'm going to be talking about throughout this video is obviously the importance of good sex education, feeling no shame and embracing your sexuality, and in the video chapter on lesson five I'm also going to be talking in quite a lot of detail about the amazing benefits for our health and our happiness that masturbation has. It's a topic which really isn't discussed openly enough and I hope to be a part of changing that. That's where the wonderful sponsor of today's video comes in, without whom I wouldn't be able to keep making educational videos like this. You might have heard me raving about them before but Belessa are a company made by women for women, covering all things to do with sexuality. And just like my content, their goal is to empower everyone to embrace, explore and celebrate their own sexuality, and they're offering an amazing giveaway to my subscribers in the process. So they've sponsored a couple of my videos this year and they've been lovely enough to send me quite a few of their products to try out for myself, and my two favourites at the minute are these little beauties, the Pebble and the Thump. Now the cool thing about all of Blessa's toys is that even though we're all very different, we all like different things, we all need different things, we all want different stimulation in lots of different places on our body, Blessa has something for absolutely everyone. These two in particular are fantastic choices if you want to focus primarily on clitoral stimulation. So look at how ridiculously adorable this little guy is. I swear these are like the prettiest vibrators I have ever seen in my life. This little guy is the Pebble, very very cute, very small, very discreet, so great to travel with. And look how like beautifully it just kind of fits in the palm of your hand, it's so ergonomic, great. This one, really small, really discreet, but it offers both suction and vibration on this end. And while you can choose what speed or intensity you want it at, there's none of the annoying pattern modes that can be a little bit off-putting sometimes. And then you have the thumb. This one offers all the same benefits of the pebble and so much more. It is a little bit bigger but again so ergonomic, fits in your hand beautifully and it just looks so gorgeous. 
So just like the pebble, this offers suction, vibration. And over on this side, you have this little guy here with beautiful soft silicon, which offers these amazing natural feeling palpitations for the clitoris, which is like nothing else I've ever felt before. It's so good. Both these toys are waterproof, come in these adorable cases, which are what you charge them in via USB, and also are really great for traveling with because they can be really discreet. You throw this in your suitcase and you don't have to worry. It literally looks like a glasses case. No one is gonna think twice. The best part about working with Valesa though is that they are offering you guys who watch my videos an amazing giveaway. If you check out the link that is on screen right now and also in the description of this video, then you'll see that Valesa are offering a giveaway where everyone gets something. You have a chance to win a free vibrator of your own or a gift card which you can put towards getting yourself a little something special. I absolutely love what Valesa is doing and really, really appreciate them helping out me and my channel. So if you'd like to check them out too, please follow the link in my video description or the one that's on screen right now. One small thanks again to Blessed for sponsoring this video and now let's jump back into the content. And if you'd like to find out a little bit more about masturbation, the health benefits of it, how it became so taboo in the first place, don't forget to check out the chapter on lesson five in this video. Just like the marriage course, the singles course comes with a workbook, which is again mostly blank with just like the lesson titles and then pages for notes. And it's almost an exact replica of the marriage course book in terms of like the pages at the end for like setting your goals and stuff. Exactly the same as what's in the marriage one, except this workbook is missing the lists of sources that the marriage book had. So it's like the same, but with less. She really has put the bare minimum amount of work into this course. And it's a little disappointing to see, because you know, you'd think people get better all the time, learn new stuff all the time, so they're gonna go above and beyond and try new things, but no. <laughs> So the singles course has 10 modules and also a Facebook group you can join again. Just like last time though, I'm not gonna join the Facebook group and I'm not even gonna look at it because the women in there deserve their privacy and to have a safe space. So it's just, it's not, it's not my place to go looking, you know, simple as that. So I will not. Um, what I will say though is that there's currently only 53 people in that group, or at least there was at the time of writing this script. It might've gone up by one or two more since then. So there's far less people who have bought and taken this course than her marriage one. Now that could just be because it's not been out for as long, or it could be because people are realizing that Bethany doesn't have a clue what she's talking about, or maybe it's just she doesn't really have an audience who are interested in this kind of thing. Who's to say? Overall, to kind of discuss my thoughts on Bethany's switch to sex content kind of throughout all her social media platforms, is that she clearly has a passion for the topics that she talks about. She clearly has an interest in not only sex, but in business and marketing. And she's got that drive that could make her really successful. But what she just lacks is any knowledge, either of the subject matter she's talking about or of business or marketing in general. Like, I think marketing is one of her biggest issues because she, she stumbles at the first hurdle in that she doesn't really understand or know who her target consumer is or what they want. So how can she appeal to them and give them something that provides value if she doesn't know who she's providing for? So take some of her recent Instagram posts, for example. This one uh, was where she was like, oh, when you ask your husband what dish he's most looking forward to eating at Thanksgiving, it wasn't the turkey. So she posted this reel everywhere recently. And to summarize, it's a video of Bethany curling her hair while straight up telling us that Dave is gonna go down on her over Thanksgiving. Yeah. Now, many of her followers called this out. They said it was making them uncomfortable. And her reply was, well, this is for married women. If you're not married, you might be uncomfortable. But she's completely missing their point about why they were uncomfortable. As a sexually active woman myself, although not married, but in a long-term partnership, I was also made uncomfortable by these posts, not because the idea of sex makes me uncomfortable, not because the concept of oral sex makes me uncomfortable, but because I don't need to know these specifics about someone else's sex life. That is too much information. And this is what her audience were complaining about. It's not the fact she talks about oral sex that's a problem, it's that she brags about getting oral sex on very specific occasions. So now anyone sitting down to Thanksgiving dinner is just going to be thinking about Bethany and her husband having oral sex. That's what makes it inappropriate. Some of her followers told her, oh this made me uncomfortable, 
I'm married and this is TMI. I'm married and I don't want to hear about other people's sex life. That's really gross. Keep it in check and honor your spouse. This is weird. Her stuff makes me very uncomfortable. To make her whole social media brand based around sexual things between her and her husband, I feel it pushes a boundary. I'm all about being sex positive for marriage, but I believe that there are things that should remain intimate between you and your husband. But Bethany seems to think it simply comes down to, well, I have sex and they have sex. We're all part of this sex having club, right? So of course they want to hear about my personal experiences, don't they? They don't. No. If sexually active women are following you for your sex advice, give them sex advice. Don't just brag about the fact you are having sex. If she actually understood her target audience and how to make content which provides value for them, she could have posted something like, here are some ideas for flirty lines to initiate intimacy with your partner, how to prioritize your relationship during stressful family holidays, or even ask her audience, what are some flirty comments your partner has made which you liked? These would be giving practical tips to her audience that they can use in their own relationships and to like build intimacy between you know, her audience and their partners and so on. And she can use some of her own experiences as inspiration if she wants, but ultimately by giving actual advice, she's putting her consumer first and not just bragging, hey, lol, look, I have the sexy sex all of the sexy time, sex. But instead of all that, she just says, I'm gonna have some fun, spicy humor here and there. If it's not your humor, that's okay. That's why it's my account and not yours which I get it, you know, it is her personal account, she can technically do what she wants, but when it's public, you know, it's open to criticism, isn't it? So basically, point is, I think Bethany needs to understand her consumers a little more. Just take a basic marketing course or something, you know, learn how to do a SWOT analysis, learn how to profile your customers, you're providing a service here, learn the seven P's of marketing, that sort of thing, you know? You got this. Speaking specifically about the course though, overall, and I didn't expect this, I find that this course for single women actually has so much more potential than the marriage course in terms of the topics Bethany has chosen to speak about. I think so many of them could offer some really, really interesting discussions, but the problem is she just misses at every single opportunity, which makes the overall course end up being fundamentally worse and more harmful than the marriage course in every single way. It's really disappointing. I didn't think I would have quite so much to say about this, but I currently have something like a 30, wait, let's find out how many words this is. A 34,000 word script on this course. So <sighs> let's jump into it. <laughs> Session one is called Single, Sexual and Ready for Marriage. And this lesson or session, or as I like to call them, unedited rambles filmed on a webcam with no lighting is just run by Bethany Beale herself and immediately features a dodgy thumbnail with some errors in how it was made and just a lot of laziness here, you know? But let's see what she has to say. What's up y'all? It's Bethany here and I am so excited to welcome you to the Ultimate Sex Mentorship Course for single women. Now, first up, let's be very, very clear here. When Bethany says single, what she actually means is unmarried. And what she actually means by unmarried is not sexually active. This kind of causes some confusion in the real world because let's be honest, even amongst Christians and other religious people, lots of unmarried people are sexually active. Lots of single people are sexually active. It's interesting that Bethany would class me as a single woman because I'm not married, even though I'm not single and am sexually active. You know, it's just an odd little thing that I thought was worth talking about. But anyway, let's move on with the course. This really is a, like the first of its kind. I can't think of any other course, any other like resource like this. And I'm so proud of you who, for signing up and for joining me with this two-week intensive because... We need to be talking about sexuality in single women. Unfortunately, sexuality in single women is such a hush-hush topic in Christian circles. Yeah, and maybe think about why that is, Bethany. Because of purity culture, which you have been a part of perpetuating throughout your entire career. So much of the content that Bethany and others like her have put out up to this point have made single or rather just unmarried women feel shame and guilt and like they need to repress their sexuality. It's really annoying because we've been seeing this for months now. Bethany comes so close to realizing there's a problem and purity culture's bad, but she refuses to really see what is causing it and how she has been a part of the problem before. And to some extent, in many ways, is still a part of the problem. 
I also did have to laugh at her saying there are no other resources available out there for unmarried women to learn about their sexuality because one, there are so many, <laughs> so many, uh, regardless of if you're uh, atheist or Christian or any other religion, there are resources for you to learn about sex. There absolutely are. And if you are looking for resources like Bethany's that push things like abstinence-only sex education and purity culture and all that sort of thing, there are still resources out there that teach that stuff, like Pam Stenzel's Terrible Sex Education course, uh, the books by Hayley DeMarco and stuff like that. We've covered a lot of them on this channel already. This isn't new. Very odd. And two, Bethany, you've literally made resources like this before. You have. So again, you can't pretend it's new when you've done it before. I just, oh my god. Anyway. <sighs> her and her sister Kristen literally wrote a book called uh, Sex, Purity and the Lungs of a Girl's Heart in which Bethany, as a single, unmarried, non-sexually active woman, wrote about sex as a single woman. As a single woman for single women. So... You know what's really interesting, I mean you know this, but we, the two of us, wrote a book called Sex, Purity and the Longings of a Girl's Heart during, the, it was during the process of me being in a relationship and getting engaged. So I yeah. had the awesome privilege, really, of getting to study God's design for sex, purity, just all of that, our sexuality, like dig into it and really study it because we were writing a book about it. And that actually releases in April of 2019. But I think Ooh. that was really helpful because I was yeah. able to gain such a biblical perspective and really kind of like debunk any false ideas that I had like, oh, sex is bad or, oh, you know, it's gross or awkward. Instead, it's like, wow, this is God's amazing design and intimacy within marriage is such a beautiful thing in the right context. Now, this here was a super interesting moment because here Bethany acknowledges that up until a few months ago, before she actually got married, she still had these preconceptions that sex was gross and awkward. And how did she learn she was wrong about this? By doing research to write a book teaching people about sex. I'm on the first page, not gonna get frustrated. I just want you to know, like up front, I recognize that we are all coming from very different upbringings, very different backgrounds, um, very different levels of how much was talked about this in our homes. If if it was talked about a lot, if it wasn't talked about at all. Um, we have a whole like variety of women coming on from those of you who are just like in your teen years, just thinking about like, you know, getting to adulthood. Those of you who have been married before um, and are now find yourself single again. Uh, so it's just a very, very wide variety. So I just want you to know I acknowledge that and I see that you're coming from your own unique place. Now, I do really believe in giving credit where credit's due. And I do appreciate Bethany being open to people who have different backgrounds and experiences. I really do. I think that shows a lot of growth from her and a lot of maturity from her that we haven't seen before. And it's a really, really good step forward. However, I still think this proves that she is a little unclear about who her target audience is for this course. Because let's be honest, the way you teach sex ed to kids and teens is going to be very different from the way you teach sex ed to, let's say, a 40-year-old divorcee. You know what I mean? I think the fact that she's trying to use the same content to target both is potentially a little inappropriate. Because is this going to be appropriate for the teens? And is this going to be advanced enough and, honestly, frank enough for the already experienced adults? Do you know what I mean? None of us are coming to the table right now with just a perfect <clears throat> life, a perfect, you know, sexual background. And by that, I mean, whether you've had sex or not, we all come to the table with um, confusion, questions, maybe secret struggles that nobody knows about, or maybe struggles that you've been fighting for a long time and you just feel like you can't overcome. Maybe it's a um, an attraction to the same gender that you're like, this is so confusing, or I, I know this isn't in line with God's design. How can I deal with this? Um, maybe it's something secretive you did with someone, or maybe it's something that was sinful and wrong that was done to you, and you are just grappling with that. Maybe people know, maybe they don't know. Bethany, we are less than three minutes in. Can you not equate sexual assault with being gay? Do you have any idea how disrespectful that is? Now, don't get me wrong. That is not to say that people who experience attraction to the same gender don't have struggles. They're just not the ones that Bethany's referring to. 
Bethany implies that the whole act of being attracted to the same gender as you is somehow wrong or sinful or bad and something you should feel shame and guilt for. Which, of course, is a bunch of harmful nonsense. We all know this, right? Or at least I hope you do. But in reality, a lot of gay and bisexual people, uh, they actually struggle with things like being afraid to come out because of, you know, persecution or judgment or anything like that, or because it will make them unsafe or, you know, for any number of reasons. These are things we need to be mindful of and talk about rather than just, ooh, it's bad to have these attractions because it's not. And it's a shame that Bethany isn't focusing on the real problems which, you know, is the prejudices and the oppression and the persecution rather than, you know, being the one to have those views. Does that make sense? Uh, it's still brain foggy. And on top of all that, knowing what we know about Bethany and her sister Kristen's history of talking about people who have experienced sexual assault, I'm really not sure she's the right person to be talking about this very serious and delicate topic. It leaves me concerned. She writes, Dear Girl Define, I'm sure you probably won't read this, but it feels good to let it all out to someone who would have mm. some good advice, and I would really appreciate it if I did get a response. Here's your response. Here's your response. <laughs> I was raised in a Christian household, but as I started getting into my teen years, I found I was straying further and further away from God and his word. Mm. I've done things with my boyfriends in the past with and without consent. Mm. Okay, so let's talk about the one thing that stands out to me in this letter. The line that talks about how I've done things with my boyfriends with and without consent. The thing I want to say to you and to any of us who have experienced sexual impurity, which that's me, that's you, that's everyone. None of us are perfectly pure and that's the whole point of why Christ died. Yeah. We are all sexually broken. We're all impure. We all struggle with us. We all sin and need to repent of that sin before it just, God. It's different ways. It's just know? in different, different ways, ways, different situations, different seasons, yeah. different sin. But at the bottom, at the heart of it, we yeah. are all impure and that is exactly why Christ died because he wants to forgive us yes. of our sins. He died on the cross, not because we're perfect girls, but because we're <laughs> sinful girls. Yeah. That is why Christ died, so that he could forgive our past and redeem our future. This is such an unnecessary kick in the stomach for this poor girl. Let's put all the consensual stuff that she's done aside, right? They're literally saying, okay, you were sexually assaulted and that makes you a sinful girl. You are the reason why this God that you believe in and worship had to die. You're impure. You're sexually broken. These are horrible, horrible words and phrases to use about anyone. Never mind a victim of sexual assault. It didn't take long for us to actually just decide that I was broken. And wow. I accepted that. I'm like, yep, you're right. I'm one of those broken people who- you And know, broken because you. you were, because you say broken, what do you, yeah. Because I, I was so sexually activated, which is the typical male or the vast, yeah. vast majority, it's not hundred percent, but it's pretty close. Um, so I was sexually activated far more readily and far more frequently than she was. Got it. So mm -hmm. obviously she was broken because she was never, I don't mm. like to say never with yeah. human behavior, but she was never sexually activated. So yeah. obviously she's damaged. She's broken mm. and there's just mm. something uh, wrong with her. There was not pleasure in it for well, me. And I mm. didn't actually think there was pleasure in it for any women. This is just a wifely duty thing. And yeah. um, there's no one out there having fun in this arena. Mm. And so that's kind of how we functioned. Like I was like, yeah, I'm broken. Like I didn't even think yeah. that that was a weird sentence, but she said, okay, what can you define broken? What, what are you saying? What yeah. does that mean? And, and then I just said, oh, well, I don't have a clitoris. Um, what do you mean you don't have a clitoris? And our friend, <sighs> after a, a bit said, you know, I, I just feel like taking Phyllis in the back room and showing her what I'm talking about. Mm. Well, Phyllis started to stand up. Mm. Uh, and then this other woman said, but I just can't, I can't do that. Our oldest child had been born, uh, which is a little girl. Oh. And eventually uh, Phyllis was changing uh, our daughter's diaper and uh, the, our friend mm. showed her uh, on wow. um, our little girl, you know, where the clitoris is located, which was, huge information mm -hmm. uh, wow. for fellows. I know we're in session one, so you're all pumped and you're like, here we go. I'm here. Some of you are live. Some of you are watching this later and you're like, yes, I am here. But what I've seen in running other courses is that when we get to week two, when we get to session eight, nine, 10, we have a massive, a massive drop off of women. 
and your life gets busy and you move on. So this is my challenge to you to commit to all 10 sessions. Why does Bethany always do this? God's sake. She did it in her last course too. She absolutely downplays the quality of her, well, the course is crap quality. So I guess she's just preparing people. But surely if you're trying to sell this course and people paid for your course, you'd hype it up, wouldn't you? You wouldn't tell them all how bad it is. Like in the last course, she was like, it has all these faults. Anyway, keep watching. But in this one, she's like, look, I know people are going to get bored of it, but just like, keep watching, okay? Please, because I want you to. She's like, in the last one, people got bored, and I know they got bored, and they didn't finish the course. So for this course, instead of making any changes, I'm just going to tell you to keep going anyway through the boredom. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, she then decides out of nowhere, you know what this course needs? Transphobia. Get out, Bethany. Get out. You will sadly see that this is one of the big themes throughout this course, so please prepare yourself for a lot of harmful stuff going forward. I am so sorry. So a little bit about me for those who don't know you, just so you know, okay, who's leading this and, and what's she all about? Uh, so I started a ministry, Girl Defined Ministries, with my older sister, Kristen, about 10 years ago, and I have such a passion for equipping women with God's design for their womanhood. We also live in a world where gender is absolutely like up for grabs. Anyone can be anyone. Um, there's nothing special about womanhood. Um, we've kind of tried to erase all differences and the world have kind of used that as a equality. So unless we're all the same, then, you know, and I don't believe that. I believe that God designed us to be equally valuable, but purposely different. And so I'm passionate about women seeing their beautiful, good, amazing, creative design in Christ and learning how to live that out well. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. <laughs> there's there's a lot to unpack here. I really do not understand how people like Bethany seem to think that simply accepting that trans and non-binary people exist and giving them the respect they deserve and helping protect their rights means anyone can be anyone and that there's nothing special about womanhood and that we've tried to erase all differences. If you really believe that trans men and women existing means they're trying to erase all gender differences, then why do you think so many of them experience gender dysphoria? No one is saying that gender doesn't exist. No one is saying that gender differences don't exist. People are just now more open to acknowledging that gender is a social construct. Gender is fluid. People can, def people can define and express their own gender in whatever way they want. That doesn't mean we're trying to erase all gender. It it doesn't mean any of these things that Bethany keeps spouting. Even among people of the same gender, there is so much variance in how gender is expressed and displayed, and I think that's a really, really beautiful thing. It's not just that we want everyone to be the same all the time. It's that we know gender is this big, beautiful spectrum, and we should all be allowed to explore it however we like and express ourselves however we like. And when other people come up to us and say, hey, this is who I am, we need to respect that. That's all there is to it. There is a lot more to say, and it is a lot more nuanced than that, but I think you get the idea, you know? I think the problem is that Bethany has grown up constantly hearing trans people bad, talking about gender bad, and so she parrots that without really understanding why people say that, why people think she should think that. And on top of that, she doesn't truly understand the experiences of trans and non-binary people. And I get that it can be difficult for us cisgender people to put ourselves in the shoes of others like that and understand what they're going through and understand what gender dysphoria feels like and things like that. But if you just listen to the stories of people who do experience it, who do feel like that, it makes sense. <laughs> you just need to have a little empathy and compassion and listen, you know? So my point is that Bethany spends a lot of time parroting what she's heard from others without fully understanding what it is she's attempting to critique, you know? I don't think she really understands anything about gender, so a lot of what she says is just empty, harmful nonsense, you know? I think if you guys would like to learn a little bit more and hear from some actual trans people rather than just me, uh, then I have quite a few books to recommend to you that I found really helpful and enjoyed. So first up, I just want to recommend some writing in general by one of my favourite poets ever, and that is Kay Tempest. They are non-binary and incredibly talented, and 
one of my biggest inspirations in the world. I absolutely love them, I think they're wonderful, and they have done a lot of writing in the past about their own gender identity and figuring things out, so, you know. And also, they just write a lot about kind of like society in general, and it's just brilliant. I could do a whole video on Kay, but uh, yet yeah, there's also the book Gender Euphoria, edited by Laura Kate Dale, or if you'd like a more feminist perspective on the experiences of mostly trans women, then I recommend Transgressive, A Trans Woman on Gender, Feminism and Politics by Rachel Ann Williams, or there are some really fun, informative books, I love these. There's Gender, A Graphic Guide by Meg John Barker and illustrated by Jules Scheel, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And Meg John also co-wrote a great book called How to Understand Your Gender alongside Alex Ian Taffy which I also recommend, and I hope I haven't butchered the pronunciation of any of those names. Great books, really recommend them. Uh, they will be down in the list of sources and further readings that I will link in this video description. I have a ton of books for you to go ahead and read based on the things we're gonna be discuss discussing in this video. So you're gonna have a good Christmas. That's a reading for you to do if that's what interests you. <laughs> Hopefully that is a good jumping off place for you all. Now, let's get back to Bethany as she tells us about her background and I think at this point I have heard more retellings of Bethany's origin story than I have of Batman and Superman's put together and you know what a DC fan I am. Um, I was single for a lot of the time. I am 34 right now um, and I now have two kiddos but I got married at 30 and I was hoping to get married much younger. I upheld marriage. I was like oh my goodness it's so amazing like um, you know like uh, yes, marriage. Like, I want to get married. I want to have a lot of kids. Of course, God will bless us. Like, doesn't he want to give that good gift to someone who actually wants it? Um, and that wasn't my story. I went through multiple relationships, intentionally dated all the things, and it just wasn't working out. It wasn't um, happening for me. And it wasn't until I turned 29 that I started dating my now husband, and we got married about a year later. So um, I had to grapple with a lot for me about 10 years of wrestling with my sexuality, of wrestling with my desires, of wrestling with my longings, and trying to figure out, is it possible to thrive if I never have sex or if I never have that long-term committed relationship? Is it possible to thrive if I never become a wife, if I never become a mom? Is it possible for me to have a fully satisfying life as a single woman? Honestly, hearing this makes me quite sad for Bethany. Like, I do think about how different her life would have been if she hadn't been raised in purity culture, if she hadn't been raised with the parents she has, if she'd actually been allowed to explore these things for herself, if she'd actually had a real sex education and not just... To be completely and totally honest, like this was definitely not a conversation that happened in our house. We didn't talk about anything from like natural girl functions like periods to definitely not to sex it was just like the body things that happen with that like not really happening we you know were very much about you know things like oh saving your first kiss for a marriage or you know purity things like that but in a very vague sense and so this is hilarious but the way that i actually even learned about what sex actually was, like what was happening. I did not even understand what it really was until I was probably like 20. And I was babysitting at somebody else's house and they had a children's book that oh was for my. kids explaining like what actually happened. And I literally was like 20 when I finally realized like, oh my goodness, like body parts have to come together. Like a penis actually goes inside. Like, whoa, you know, my mind was blown. And hilariously enough, my husband, he was like 17 or 18 before he actually learned, you know, what like actual wow. intercourse was. <laughs> and so that's kind of where I came from, which I look back and I crack up. I'm like, you know, I, I wanted to know. I wanted to understand more. I didn't want to feel so much like disconnect and shame about my body. Even just, like I said, the natural functions of being a woman. I just felt so embarrassed and so ashamed. Bethany clearly has, and I mean, I mean this in a really positive way, she has a real interest in sex and intimacy and learning more. And I think being curious about this that stuff is a really, really positive thing. Imagine if she'd actually been able to spend her 20s figuring out who she is, what she likes, having guilt-free consensual sex as much or little as she wanted, not just what she'd been told she needed to do. If she'd actually been able to ask questions and explore her relationship with herself, her body, her sexuality, I feel really bad for her. And 
I hate that she's now trying to paint what was clearly a very difficult and repressive time for her as lol, that's just how things are, it's fine, and you need to do it too. It's like she was harmed, but she can't see the harm, so she's helping harm others. And I came to a point in my mid-20s um, where I truly was absolutely loving my life and thriving and came to the point of like, you know, even if I never get married, even if I never have sex, even if I never become a wife or a mom, I can totally live out my purpose and thrive and absolutely have an incredible life even without all of that. Doubt. Come on, Bethany. We were all watching you at that time. We all saw how desperate you were. And I, I kind of get it, you know, some people just want to be in a relationship and are happier and better with a partner, but just at least be aware of it and admit it. Yeah. And just know all of these sessions, you see on my coffee, they're going to be done in a casual way because I want this to feel like we're just a couple of friends hanging out having coffee, talking about the real issues of life. So clearly the singles course is really gonna be the same format as her marriage course, by which we mean no planning, no editing, no structure, and no idea what we're actually paying for. Great. So I want you to think right now, you don't have to like raise your hand or do anything like that, but I just want you to think about what your um, upbringing was like when it came to the topic of sex, sexuality, intimacy. Was this something that was a positive in your home? Was this something that was a negative? Um, was this something that was hurtful, like a hurtful topic because bad things were happening? Um, was this an area of curiosity for you? Was there silence around this topic? Uh, were you someone who got like the talk and then you moved on and you're like, this is so awkward? So I just want you to think about where you come to the table with this topic. It's important sometimes to stop and like reflect about where we come from. Not that we have to stay there, not that we have to carry that with us our whole entire life, but I think it is important to acknowledge like where we're at right now and what impacted that. I wish Bethany would do this self reflecting herself. Do you think we can crowdfund so she can take her course herself and then reflect? <laughs> the thing is about Bethany is that she is so open with her life, she has told us so much about her life that we know your parents messed up and your parents messed you up and your siblings up when it came to sex. Can you please stop pretending otherwise? Bethany's mother, I believe, helped cover up the sexual assault of one of her sons, which is heartbreaking. Um, I'm just gonna kind of like fact check that and bring some clips in here because that's not something I am overly familiar with myself, but other channels are, so. I'll bring that in now. Talking today about Michael Mershon, who is one of the Girl Defined brothers. He recently posted to Reddit like a really bombshell um, story about how he was sexually abused as a child. And he's saying that his mother knew about this and did nothing about it. And then we come to find out quite a few years later, she's like sending him these text messages that are very demeaning and disrespectful and just not wanting to take accountability for it. Truth from the oldest bared child. I am the oldest bared child and I don't align with much, if anything, of what my sisters, girl defined, say. They get enough hate and they don't need it for me as well. That being said, much of what they preach is fundamentalist and does damage, but they are just pawns in a larger game. I'm here to speak my truth about the abuse I suffered at the hands of my parents, but specifically my mother. I was raised in the Gothard ATI world. I was homeschooled my entire life and was a victim of ongoing abuse of multiple kinds. I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse by a female neighbor when I was around seven years old. I know my mother knew about it because she walked in on it happening. It has never been spoken of to this day, and if that were the only time, that would have been bad enough. I was also groomed and sexually abused at around 11 years old by a male neighbor at our next house. I was made to feel like a victim and that it was my fault, which led to repressed memories that didn't resurface till I was in my 30s. It has been roughly five years since I started dealing with my past sexual abuse and to this day have never received anything close to a sincere apology from my mother. To this day, my mother accuses me of, quote, living in a victimhood mentality that I need to take to God and let him heal me from. As we've already shown earlier, Bethany didn't even know what sex was until she accidentally found a children's book in her 20s. The Baird family were raised neck deep in purity culture. Their family, I believe, had ties to the IBLP, if I'm remembering correctly. Again, I'm going to bring some other footage in here to just corroborate that because, again, I'm kind of talking off the top of my head and I want to make sure I'm right. 
In this post, Michael mentions Gothard ATI. If you've seen the Duggar documentary, you know what that is, but if you don't, the Gothard and ATI world is something founded by William Gothard Jr who founded the Institute in Basic Life Principles, otherwise known as IBLP, an ultra-conservative Christian organization. Girl Defined has publicly denied that they were active members of IBLP. Growing up in a homeschool family, um, we were involved in some of those programs. So we did go to some of those conferences. We did attend some of those programs. We were never members. We were never deeply ingrained in the program. We never did any of the curriculum. But According to Michael Mershon, at least through his childhood, this was not the case. And at least in a video, Bethany admitted to meeting Gothard. Did you meet Bill Gothard? Because I remember meeting him yeah. once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I okay. <laughs> Even meeting the man, you know, who's like the big bad man for this whole thing. Like he was kind of a god in that arena. Um, and I remember feeling that like, wow, you sure. know, he was the leader of the entire program. Like it was like meeting the president is how it felt. Yeah. But Gothard has been accused of sexual harassment and molestation. And some of the plaintiffs were minors at the time. He would often place his hands on inappropriate areas. More people than ever have been quite rightly talking about the Institute of Basic Life Principles or IBLP as it's kind of more commonly known online. The Basic Seminar, a ministry of the Institute in Basic Youth Conflicts, as a high schooler, Bill Gothard was concerned about the wrong decisions that many of his classmates were making. The Basic Seminar offers lasting answers for resolving family conflicts, Overcoming feelings of inferiority, removing guilt and bitterness, conquering destructive habits, establishing marriage harmony. And this has finally allowed me a chance to make a video that I've been waiting a couple of years to make, I've been wanting to make for a while, and that is looking at the IBLP's terrible homeschooling curriculum and other educational resources. I spent the last however many months collecting new and old copies of the IBLP's Advanced Training Institute's wisdom books, <laughs> old IBLP seminar workbooks from the 80s, their men's manual, their character studies, their biblical character illustrated curriculum, and basically everything I could find that they have put out as educational resources that I could find online that I didn't have to pay for because I'm not giving them any money. <laughs> I ended up reading around 4,000 pages of material from Bill Gothard and his little minions and I have so much to say. <laughs> I think that it's great that she's trying to get other people to think about this stuff because it can be really, really helpful, but it seems kind of hypocritical when she hasn't addressed it herself and she's so in denial about what her own family and childhood and experiences were like. There are some wrong narratives about sex that many of us were raised with, and this isn't going to cover everyone, but these are some of the most popular that I have heard from you, wrong narratives about sex and sexuality. So the first wrong narrative that many of us were raised in is that sex is a big bad and scary thing. Like it's big, it's bad, it's scary. We don't talk about it. And that is in large part a message that um, purity culture, a lot of this has been um, infiltrating our Christian society because that, and and even in um, secular society, it's kind of like fear tactics. Like, okay, you don't have sex because there could be real consequences. Yes, there could be, um, you know, pregnancy before marriage. Um, there could be STDs. There, of course, there could be all sorts of things. So there has been kind of like a fear tactic to try to get people from having sex. So sex is big, bad, and scary. Don't have it, which is wrong. Yes, God has boundaries, but that is a wrong approach to sex. Yeah, I actually really respect Bethany's overall message here about sex being a good thing and wanting to remove so much of the stigma around sex and to get people educating themselves. But <laughs> I just think, one, she goes about it the wrong way. Two, and we said this earlier, she doesn't realise she's contributed to this harm herself in the past. And three, she doesn't realise that she is still contributing to the culture of shame around sex with her comments about any and all types of sex which aren't cis, het, monogamous, married sex being bad. If you are interested in Bethany's history with purity culture and her childhood and everything like that, and I recommend my video, The Saga of Bethany Beale. That was a marathon to get through. <laughs> Another wrong narrative is that your worth is based on your level of pureness. This is definitely a message that I brought bought into big time as a single, where you are your worth before God, your worth as a woman is based on 
Whatever the standard of purity is in your culture, in your family, your worth is based on how much you can toe the line and maintain that level of pureness. Again, completely anti-biblical, completely anti-gospel message. Um, So if you're someone where you're like, I have totally messed up, which we all have to in some way or another, um, have hope because that is not how God views us. Again, I could really respect this and get behind it if she wasn't actually still pushing the message that your worth is based on your purity because she's telling people that there's only one way to be pure in and out of marriage, one way to have sex, and if you do it any other way and won't repent, repent, repent and start doing things Bethany's way, then you should be ashamed. We're going to be diving a lot deeper into this idea of shame and sex and purity culture in a lot more detail a little later in this video, don't worry. So let's just kind of put a pin in it for now. Another wrong narrative is that purity is only for single people. This is a huge one that I see single women buying into all the time. That, you know, once I get married, it's going to solve all my problems. Sex is just going to be amazing and fulfill me in every way. And I won't struggle with any sexual problems struggles anymore. Um, And again, we know that is totally wrong because there are married women all over the place who are still struggling with porn addictions, who are struggling who with, you know, committing adultery, um, who are struggling with erotica, who are just very dissatisfied in their marriage. And they are struggling all over the place, carrying on private chats, um, emotionally entangling with other men. I mean, the list could go on. So purity is actually for both single and married women, but it's something that stems from the heart ultimately. And it is not a something that is leveled and measured. Um, it is it comes from a heart and a desire to worship God in his good um, design for us, single and married. <laughs> Guess I'm just an impure harlot in Bethany's eyes then and always will be. It's no secret that we in our culture are in such a place of deep, desperate brokenness. I mean, you just look around and there's so much confusion, so much chaos, and it is not making people more satisfied in the long term. It is just a very shallow fix to a deeper heart problem. So we have the whole LGBTQ um, uprising, and it's very much like trying to fix a gaping wound by putting a Band-Aid on it. We can change who we're interested in. We can get hook up with other people. We can do all the things. But at the end of the day, there's like desperate lo- missing <laughs> at the heart level. Um, you know, our culture tells us unlimited sexual partners, as long as it's consensual, that's the only thing that matters. Um, we're, t- you know, we're just told that it's like you do you, it doesn't really matter what you do as long as it's safe or consensual or mutual, whatever, that's the most important thing. Like protect yourself, don't get an STD, things like that. But as long as it's not hurting anyone, you do you, male, female, groups, whatever. I mean, that really is the message that is coming out, like just complete autonomy, complete liberation. And um, we know that ultimately that is not in line with God's word. You really would have thought she would have stopped using the term sexual brokenness by now after she, you know, did the whole calling a rape victim sexually broken thing. But I guess she's not learned her lesson. (laughs) I really, really hate this term though, just in general. Sexual brokenness is not a thing. Some people have sexual trauma. That does not mean they're broken. Some people just don't want to have sex. Doesn't mean they're broken. Some people love sex and feel really, really comfortable with it and enjoy having it and want it as much as possible. Also doesn't mean they're broken. Can we just not? When it comes to sex and relationships and intimacy, there are so many normals. There are so many healthies. It's just about finding what's right for you. And um, I mean, even just seeing things like pornography, it is a multi-billion dollar industry. The horrific abuse that comes from the porn industry that is so concealed, the human trafficking involved with that, and women largely are the ones suffering at the hands of these industries. This I do agree with to some degree actually, but I think it's a sign that we need to change those industries and protect the workers, not just that lust in general is wrong. Again, I think I spoke about this in a lot more detail maybe in the review of the marriage course, but some pornography out there is ethically made and pornography can be ethically consumed. It just depends on a lot of factors and it's quite complicated. Bethany is just, old pornography and just bad is unnuanced, it's unfair, it's just a bit silly, isn't it? It's unhelpful. And the problem is that 
sexual brokenness affects everyone. And I don't mean like broken, like something's wrong with you. I mean, like if sexuality has been marred and everyone has been impacted by the effects of sin um, in this area from teens to singles to marrieds, like we are all impacted by the sin that sexuality in our culture and in within our own hearts has caused. And we know the world rejects God's design in this area. Um, modern culture tells us to follow our heart. And there's a lot of silence within the Christian culture. So a lot of us are just left feeling confused. And we have questions and we're like, finally, hopefully I can get some answers in this course. Um, here are questions that I have had women ask in um, through Instagram, through my DMs, just through email, through Girl Define. Here, and these might be some questions that you've asked as well. Does God care about my sexual longings? Is having sex before marriage really that big of a deal? Is looking at porn really a problem? What should I do with my same-sex attraction? How can I find freedom from my struggle with masturbation? Is lust a girl problem too? Am I the only girl in the world who struggles with, insert, whatever it is, that question you're asking? How can God forgive me for what I've done? Am I stuck in the wrong body? There are the list of questions could go on and on, but those are questions that real women have asked. And yeah, I really can believe uh, that these are questions she gets asked quite a lot. And you know what? They are they are big important problems. The problem is Bethany is not qualified or educated enough to talk about these things, and neither are the expert guests that she has in her courses. She really should not be teaching a course about this stuff. And honestly, it scares me. I think Bethany has good intentions, but not the skill or knowledge to pull it off, and that's why she ends up harming people. Lust is not a guy problem. It is a human problem. Both genders are created equally valuable and purposely different, but both genders are created sexual by design. Like women and men are both sexual beings designed by God to be that way. As single women, sometimes it can be really uncomfortable to call body parts by their anatomically correct names, but we're going to do that um, because our body parts are not bad. A man's body parts are not bad. A woman's body parts are not bad. And we should not be afraid to speak of them with dignity and respect in the way that God created them. So when we think of our own bodies, our breasts, um, our vagina, all of that, we shouldn't be ashamed. There shouldn't be shame attached to using those words. Uh, so I, if we're gonna we're gonna practice that uh, during this course because there shouldn't be any shame associated with that. Oh, I like this bit. This is really good. Yeah, this is positive. Um, one of the issues I had in the marriage course was that a lot of the guests felt really awkward, you know, saying words like vulva, vagina, penis, erection. Morgan was. Morgan of Paul and Morgan was talking about like fertility treatments and IVF and stuff and she couldn't even say the word masturbation when she was talking about what the process was like and it was just it was very awkward and it felt like you were listening to teen girls giggling so I like that you know I'm not saying Bethany got the feedback from me in particular but clearly someone gave her feedback and she's learned that you know what it's actually really okay to say these words and not be ashamed of them and I think that is a really positive thing and it's nice to see that growth in her so good on good on Bethany genuinely. The next part of this course is just as a lot of like, oh, God made us sexual beings. Honestly did over and over. It's like 10 minutes of her saying that. A lot of repetition in this. Honestly, with the actual content in this first lesson, it could be five minutes long, but there is so much repetition. Three quick biblical truths about your sexual design. These are things we're going to dig into, some of them more deeply um, as the, the course goes on. But I want to hit on these just to bring some hope and encouragement in tonight's first session. So truth number one is that sexual identity is a God-assigned reality. And some of you are like, okay, great. That's not really something I'm struggling with. Some of you are like, yeah, I need help with that. But I just want to make sure in the day and age we live in that we are hitting on some of these very important biblical truths. Sexual identity is a God-assigned reality. Who is the authority to decide one's identity? Who is the authority to decide one's gender? Who is the authority to decide what marriage should look like, what a relationship should look like? Is it us or is it God? This bit is just sadly followed by a whole bunch of transphobia where Bethany and the person she's quoting keep mixing up sex and gender and equating them when they're different, not just from a sociological perspective, but just like even in the context she's talking about, she gets them mixed up and it's very odd. <laughs> he says, is gender set by a preference of the individual 
or a providence of God? Or to put it another way, is my sex determined by my decision in my mind or by God's design in my nature? We need to look to Christ and and choose to like walk in a manner that is true and authentic to what he has given us, to not try to change it, to not try to fight against it, but to get our mind in line with um, the body that he has chosen to give us, the female body. And this, kids, is how you encourage people to kill themselves. Stop it, Bethany. You are actively doing harm here. Truth number two, marriage is a covenant between a man and a woman. And so when we think of marriage in our modern day, it's very much viewed as like a contract that as long as our love shall last, we will remain married. And it's very much just like this relationship people enter into, but it's very shallow. But when it comes to God's design for marriage, we are striving for something so much bigger and so much greater. Truth number three for today, sex was created for intimacy within marriage. And it's interesting because I did some research and the in the world, you know, like I said, sex is up for grabs and sex is just kind of happening all over the place. And it really has become this shallow, like bodily exchange. Hookup culture is insane. And one person online said this about how like accessible sex is and just with anyone. They said, I don't know about anyone else, but I have lost complete interest in sex. I've seen it all and done it all. You could say I'm oversexed. I find it to be boring, a boring chore nowadays. And I really see no point in doing it anymore. And many other people in this forum felt the same way. With access to unlimited sexual opportunities and experiences, boredom was the outcome. And this is such a great quote. The world portrays pleasure as a flash in the pan passion that moves from lover to lover and fantasy to fantasy. But does this sort of pleasure really fulfill or does it actually deepen our discontentment? Who clicks on one pornographic picture and stops satisfied? Who fantasizes for a few seconds and then stops satisfied? The offering of worldly pleasure can't satisfy a heart that was created for a deeper, lasting pleasure. I really do feel sorry for this random person that's written in. And I I feel sorry for Bethany if this is how they see sex outside marriage. It just seems like quite a sad life, you know? It kind of sounds to me like Bethany as an individual might only experience sexual attraction once there's an emotional connection, just based on the way she's talking. Um, And there is a word for this, this is called being demisexual, and it's completely normal and completely common. Basically, and I'm, again, kind of oversimplifying, it just means you need to have that emotional connection and intimacy and a bond with someone before you are sexually attracted to them, before you want to have sex with them. It just means you need that. Sounds like maybe that's the kind of relationship with sex that Bethany has absolutely fine, absolutely normal. It's also normal not to have that. Some people just experience sexual attraction straight away. Some people need that sexual connection before they can form an emotional connection. There's lots and lots of normals, it's all good. The problem arises that Bethany doesn't seem to be able to empathize or understand that there are other people out there who experience romantic and sexual attraction in a different way to her. But just because she doesn't understand it, it doesn't mean they don't exist and that their experiences aren't equally as legitimate, you know? I find it very odd when people talk about, like, demisexuality and stuff like that. Like, I've had weird comments where people try to use it as, like, an insult. Like, they were like, oh, but you're one of these feminists who calls himself demisexual. I'm like, well, actually, no, that's not how I experience attraction. But even if it was, it's not a bad thing. It's just a label that helps you understand how you build connections with people. It's actually a really useful thing to know about yourself, if you're demisexual or not, you know? Very odd. Anyway, point is, Bethany really wants everyone to live their lives according to how she feels, and that's absolutely not okay, you know? Because she's cisgender, she wants everyone to be cisgender. Because she's heterosexual, she wants everyone else to be heterosexual. Because she's into monogamy, she wants everyone else to be into monogamy. Because she's demisexual, she thinks everyone should be demisexual. Because she wants kids, she thinks everyone should have kids. You see what I mean? It's a pattern with her and it's frustrating as hell. (laughs) Can you imagine if other people did that to Bethany and told her that she had to have sex with someone before she married them. She had to have sex with them before there was an emotional connection. What if they told her that she had to have sex with women or abstain from sex completely? What if they told her she was never ever ever allowed to have kids? 
Like, those things would be outrageous and wrong, of course they would. So why does Bethany think it's okay to tell people how to do those things in their lives based on her preferences, you know? Anyway, that's where this lesson ends, lesson one. It was... it was a lesson. <laughs> At least this one was actually more structured than her last sex course. So in this, Bethany actually bothered to try and teach some things. She actually had notes. There was a slight structure to it, even if it was harmful nonsense. So I guess that's something... ish. Session two is titled Understanding My Sexuality and Sex Drive and this lesson is unsurprisingly supposed to be all about sexuality and sex drive, except they never actually mention sex drive in the entire lesson, so... <sighs> yeah, I don't know what to say. It's just frustrating, right? <laughs> you would think that on a course like this, you might open a lesson like this by defining some terms. That's generally what you do when you come to a new topic. You define the terms so you know what you're talking about. So since Bethany and Julie don't bother to do this, let's do it ourselves. Seriously, the first thing that Bethany and Julie do in this lesson is upsell her other work and products for sale. Dr. Julie, thank you so much for being here. I am very familiar with your ministry, Authentic Intimacy, and your podcast, Java with Julie, but I would love for you to introduce yourselves for those who don't know you and don't know why someone would start a ministry on sex. Can you kind of share some background and how you started Authentic Intimacy? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so Authentic Intimacy is really a content ministry. We have a podcast and books and online studies and uh, events just helping people understand God's heart related to sexuality. That's it. I've literally just paid for another sales pitch, haven't I? So let's try and understand the terms of sex, sexuality, and sex drive. And we are going to turn to the very, very interesting Matthias Roberts to tell us that sexuality exists at the very core of who we are. It is an inescapable part of our identity. Sex and sexuality are not synonyms. When I refer to sex, I'm talking about a physical act defined as broadly or narrowly as you like. Sexuality, however, is broader. It's what gives birth to the physicality of sex and comprises a vast number of elements, including but not limited to, our sexual and romantic orientations. Sex is an outflowing of sexuality that is connected to an event, and sexuality is a broad and flowing energy linked to our emotional, physical, intellectual, and spiritual identities. If you want to find out more um, about these definitions and like see expanded on and just generally read more from uh, Matthias because it's great, uh, then you can get his book Beyond Shame, Creating a Healthy Sex Life on Your Own Terms, which is one we are going to keep coming back to in this video because it is a fantastic resource and I thoroughly recommend you give it a read for yourself. Um, he even brings in some really great discussions about how Christianity in particular has shaped our conversations around sex, sex and sexuality, especially in America. He writes that the distinction between sex and sexuality will be familiar to people who have spent any time in conversations about sexuality in Christian churches. Some Christians have used this distinction to make the argument that your sexuality itself isn't sinful, but sex and any kind of sexual thoughts are. In this way, faith communities have weaponized these definitions, both in shaping purity culture and in attacking LGBTQ people. The distinction between sex and sexuality has been used to enforce celibacy and regulate who can and cannot have sex and in what contexts. And the great thing about this book is that he doesn't forget to include asexual and aromantic people as well, which is something I've sadly never seen Bethany even acknowledge. Matthias tells us, for our asexual and aromantic siblings, a lack of sexual and or romantic drive is just as significant in terms of defining identity as sexual desire is for those of us who experience it. Too often when we argue that sexuality exists at the core of our personhood, our language excludes an entire group of people who don't experience sexuality or romantic connections. The implicit assumption is that those who don't experience these things or who experience these things differently than we do don't have personhood this is not the case. We can learn much about personhood and relationships from our siblings who move through the world differently than the majority. And I think this is really, really important to keep remembering throughout both this video and any other content you consume about sexuality. Just because we might talk about like certain sex drives being normal or attractions being normal and stuff like that, you also have to remember that for some people, asexuality and aromanticality? 
I don't think that's a word. Being a romantic, that is their normal and there's nothing wrong with it. Okay, so we've got them nailed down. What about sex drive? This one is a little bit more complicated be because you might have heard terms like sex drive or libido used to describe how much or little, essentially how frequently someone wants sex and intimacy, but there's a little more to it than that. In fact, some experts don't even like using the term sex drive or libido at all and instead prefer to talk about this topic in terms of desire. How often do we feel desire? What triggers it? Has there been any change in levels of desire? It's a subtle shift, but it's kind of important, especially when we can't, when we, especially when we start considering the differences in spontaneous and responsive desire. Over our lifetimes, how much desire we feel for sex will absolutely fluctuate. That is normal and natural. For some, it might hover around zero. For some, it might hover around quite a high amount, you know? And for many people, it's somewhere in the middle. It can change depending on our hormones, our health, how much sleep we're getting, our diet, how much stress is in our lives, our age, whole, whole bunch of stuff. Some people lean towards more spontaneous desire, some people lean towards responsive desire, some people flip back and forth depending on the context. Spontaneous desire is when you suddenly feel desire or sexual attraction or a need or want to have sex when there's no necessarily obvious trigger. It might just be suddenly like, oh, you know what, I'm kind of in the mood. Or maybe you see your partner looking pretty beautiful and you're like, oh, hello. Yep, yep, I kind of fancy initiating this. This is particularly common with new partners or at the start of new relationships, but it can happen with anyone at any time. Some myths will claim that men only ever feel spontaneous desire or that only men feel spontaneous desire, but this is of course nonsense. It really just comes down to the individual and the circumstances really. Responsive desire on the other hand is kind of what it says on the tin. A response to arousal or at least erotic content that makes you want to have sex, there's an obvious trigger. So for example, you might not suddenly just want to initiate sex throughout the day, but let's say your partner starts kissing you, starts touching you, gives you a little back massage, and then you start thinking, oh, you know what? I am kind of in the mood. Yeah, I think I wanna do this. That's responsive desire. Both responsive and spontaneous desire are normal and healthy. The other thing we have to consider when talking about sex drives or desire is what's known as the dual control model. And this essentially comes down to accelerators and brakes. If you wanna find out more about this stuff, I thoroughly recommend you check out Emily, Nago Emily Nagoski's book, Come As You Are, which is fantastic. She explains that we all have a sexual excitation system and a sexual inhibition system. Depending on which one is more stimulated determines whether we want to have sex or not. The sexual excitation system, that's kind of our accelerators. And in the words of Nagoski, it's the accelerator of your sexual response. It receives information about sexually relevant stimuli in the environment, things you see, hear, smell, touch, taste, or imagine, and sends signals from the brain to the genitals to tell them, turn on. Meanwhile, the sexual inhibition system, that's your brakes. Again, to quote Nagoski, it notices all the potential threats in the environment, everything you see, hear, smell, touch, taste, or imagine, and sends signals saying, turn off. Just as the accelerator scans the environment for turn-ons, turn the brake scans for anything your brain interprets as a good reason not to be aroused right now. For example, the risk of STI transmission, unwanted pregnancy, or social consequences. For every different person, these systems are more or less sensitive, you know? If you have a very sensitive inhibition system, you might need a lot more excitation stimuli to actually want to have sex and get those accelerators going. But if you have a very sensitive excitation system and even a little bit makes you excited, then it might take a hell of a lot for the inhibition system to kick in of you to actually say, oh God, no, wait, I can't do this. I don't want to do this. Again, all depends on the individual, all depends on the circumstances and the context, all is normal and healthy. And again, if you wanna learn a little bit more about where you think you're more or less sensitive, then the book Comes You Are has some really great little tests in there that you can take and like figure out what works for you, what doesn't, what's an accelerator and inhibitor and which one's more sensitive and all that sort of thing. Really, really useful. It can be really, really helpful to just take some time to understand what does your body respond to? What does your system like and dislike? How sensitive are you? Just really get to know yourself. 
But just remember, again, there is no right or wrong way to be. I'm gonna keep saying that because it's so important. The beauty of humans is that we're all so different and half the fun of sex and intimacy with a partner is figuring out what our partners respond to, what they like, even figuring out what they don't like and understanding it and respecting it and like, you know, staying away from that. Discovery is all part of the fun. So please don't ever feel like your particular, you know, excitation or inhibition system is a burden or anything like that. Please don't ever think that just because you have a more spontaneous or responsive desire, that's a burden or difficulty or anything like that. It's not. It's an exciting journey of discovery and you should approach it that way and it'll be really, really fulfilling. So anyway, sorry, back to the lesson. <laughs> lesson. This one is co-hosted by Julie Slatterly, who is a clinical psychologist with a dozen years of experience since God put the topic of sexuality into her heart. Yeah, let's take a look at some clips. I'm a clinical psychologist, so I always love to just take God's word and say, okay, how does this apply to difficulties we face in life? But uh, it really wasn't until about maybe a dozen years ago that God really put on my heart this topic of sexuality and just sexual brokenness and being raised in a Christian environment, doing ministry among a lot of Christians, just seeing that this was one area where I felt like all we ever talked about was the rules mm -hmm. and there was no integration of, well, where's God in the midst of this? Uh, by nature, I'm a conflict avoider. I like to please people. So I'm like the least uh, equipped person to enter into conversations about sexuality because you're always uh, you're always entering into conflict no matter what you say and any conversation about sexuality is likely going to make people feel uncomfortable at this point my notes just said what in all capital letters why are you even here i had no patience mm -hmm. now i think back to when i was single so i got married at 30 and i I grew up in a Christian church, grew up in a Christian family, but sex intimacy was pretty much just not talked about. It was kind of mm -hmm. not so much the idea that like I was a sexless human being, but almost like, okay, I need to kind of pretend I don't exist in that area of my life. And then once I get married, like, okay, I can really, that's when you can really embrace that side of you. But it was hard because it's just, you know, like such a lack of understanding of God's good design and why did he create me as a sexual being? And I've heard from so many other single women who are struggling with that and they're struggling to find answers. And you wrote a book called Sex and the Single Girl, which is absolutely amazing. And one I wish I would have read or known about when I was single. Like I wish I had a resource like that. So from your perspective, why did you think it was important to write a book on sex for single women? Hmm. Uh, some of it is what you just explained there. And I feel like when we have conversations with women about sexuality, it's always within the context of marriage. Mm. And some of our conversations about sex and marriage have been unbalanced and unhealthy too. So I feel like it's not just single women that are saying, please give me yeah. insight, help me. Mm -hmm. But I do feel like within the single population, like you can't even talk about sex, yeah, like to sure. even ask a question makes you feel ashamed. Like, am I the only one who has sexual desire? The only one struggling? What do I do with my sexual shame? Um, what do I do with the trauma I've experienced? Uh, just, you know, where do I go? The dreams I have, yeah. you know, where do I go for help in dealing with masturbation and fantasy? And so I feel like there are some places where married women feel like they can go even under the umbrella of I'm working on my marriage. But with single women, there are very few spaces where they can even vocalize a question without feeling like they're being judged to ask that question. Yeah, and again, whose fault is that? We spoke about this earlier. We spoke a lot about purity culture in my saga of Bethany Beale video. And we are gonna be talking about shame a little bit later in this video. But again, this whole conversation about like purity culture and shame, this is your fault. You are a part of this problem. I actually, um, after this script was all finished and done, I came back and I want to add in another little part here because um, yesterday morning I saw this video from Bethany in which she is very angry. So let's take a watch of that. 
people coming onto my page and being like, hmm, the reason you have to talk about intimacy so much and the complications is because of your religion. Like intimacy is really not that complicated. And like, what's the deal? And I hate that so much because one, like, yes, figuring out the motions and getting two bodies together to make like certain actions happen. No, that's not that difficult. But true intimacy, being raw and real and vulnerable and truly connected, not just to hook up, like true connection, true deep knowing that is hard. We're humans. We all come with our own baggage with our own difficulties with our own struggles to open up that's why there are books like come as you are and sex talks and books that are written for religious and non-religious people alike because it's complicated if you actually want to be truly known and to know the other person so if you're someone you're like what's the big deal like we're talking about more than a hookup we're talking about true deep all-knowing intimacy true connection real vulnerability and that is something that doesn't come naturally to most of us so Bethany, why does she always make me, f I look like a marshmallow, don't I? I'm not gonna do that. Why, why does she always make me feel such conflicting things? Like on the one hand, I wanna be annoyed with her because of just how smug she is here and just, she annoys me a bit. Um, but on the other hand, I just really feel sorry for her. I just wanna give her a hug. Like what, ugh, why do I even start with this? Okay, so let's have this conversation talking only about that level of emotional intimacy with sex, right? Let's leave everything else out of this conversation for now. Casual sex, no, let's leave all of that out, yeah? Yes, some people do find it very hard to be intimate with someone. I know, personally, while I've never had issues with the sex side of things, I have had a lot of trouble opening up to people emotionally and trusting them and you know, that is due in part to my childhood and also due in part to being a survivor of domestic violence and intimate partner abuse. So I understand that. For me, I had to go through a lot of therapy to be able to trust people again and open up and yeah, so I can relate there. And sadly, I think a lot of other people can too. A lot of people do have trauma around sex and relationships and intimacy and all of that. And sadly, it is common but that doesn't mean it's normal and it doesn't mean it's healthy. Just because something is common, it doesn't make it normal. Does that make sense? I would say that with perhaps a few exceptions, struggling with things like sex and intimacy and everything isn't generally something we're born with. It's generally, and again, there might be exceptions, it's generally something caused by trauma. And so when Bethany literally spends half her course talking about how her church, her parents caused her to have these unhealthy, uneducated feelings about sex and intimacy, you can't, like, she's told us this. She's told us where her trauma and issues with sex come from. So she can't get mad when people say, I hear you. So you have trauma relating to sex and intimacy based on your church and parents because that's what she's told us is happening. And then people are repeating it back to her and then she's mad that it's happening. It's a really difficult topic to talk about because on the one hand, we of course need to sympathize with the people who have the trauma in this area and help them understand that they're not alone. There is nothing to be ashamed of. But we also can't just be like, oh, it's normal, just ignore it, everyone has it. Because it's not normal, it's unhealthy. And it's something we need to help people work through. Does that make sense? I get that Bethany's feeling defensive about this, but it just makes me feel bad for her because she's still stuck in and encouraging other people to stay in this environment, which is causing trauma, and she refuses to acknowledge it. I hope I worded that right. It's a difficult topic to talk about. It's, again, I'm not qualified to be talking about this. Bethany definitely isn't qualified to be talking about this. But then again, I'm not selling sex advice to people, so anyway. <laughs> Following on from that, here's Bethany and Julie talking more about how the church messed them up, proving my point. Singles often feel very overlooked in church mm. culture and how church culture needs to do a better job of valuing singleness and of not making the final destination marriage, mm. but really saying, hey, you know, the scripture says that that to be single in many ways is even better to be married than to be married. So, uh, so all those conversations about singleness, I think really help singles in the church to feel validated and seen and feel like there's nothing wrong with me. Like, 
I, I can be whole too. And Specifically on that, when you say a single woman can be sexually whole and they're like, wait, what does that mean? Can you unpack that a little yeah. bit more for us? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, your definition of wholeness and brokenness are kind of based on what you think the purpose of our sexuality is. Mm. And, um, you know, our culture would tell us, well, the purpose of your sexuality is self-fulfillment. Like you have to figure out who you want to sleep with and what your desires are. You need to have the freedom to act those out. And, uh, and so they would say you're sexually broken if even you're in an environment that's restraining at all, mm. that's saying some things are wrong or sinful. Uh, so that's, that's one way of looking at it. I think traditional church culture has said you're sexually whole if you get married as a virgin and you don't cheat on your husband. Like that's wholeness. So, um, so a single woman is like, well, if I don't get married, can I be sexually whole? Or if I've got, if I get married, but I'm not a virgin, yeah. can I be sexually whole? And I think that script would make them feel like they're not whole. Yeah. But if the purpose of my sexuality is that I might know God more deeply mm-hmm. and that he would reveal his love to me, then you can be single, married, divorced. Uh, you could have a whole history of sexual sin. And if, if that all is bringing you to a place where you're right with God, and it's helping you understand the intensity of his love and his faithfulness and his healing, Mm -hmm. then you can experience sexual wholeness. Like, I get that they have good intentions, but I really hate this thorough demonization of self-fulfillment. Like, you shouldn't be aiming for that at all because it's bad and sinful. That's a really harmful mindset to push, you know? Plenty of Christians do realize that you can know God and worship God and still be true to yourself and be sexually fulfilled. They aren't mutually exclusive. Plenty of religious people in general know that, of all religions. Ultimately, what they're saying here is that whether you are single or married, you do still have to place restrictions on yourself, otherwise you're sexually broken, and that's a really harmful thing to tell people. And also, can we just please stop using the term sexually broken? Please. For the woman who's feeling like, but I don't feel like my sexuality is a good thing. Like, why would God make me with these longings and desires when I don't even know if I'm going to get married and this just feels so hard? Like, oh, why? It just feels almost cruel. Like, why would God do this? What would you say to that woman? Yeah. I mean, I think, first of all, we've got to recognize that all the good desires God has given us uh, can still be good desires, but are twisted by the fact that we live in a very broken and fallen world mm-hmm. and are even twisted by our own flesh. You know, the scripture says that our flesh is always at war with, with the work of God in our lives. And let's take another longing that we all can relate to, which is food, mm-hmm. right? So food is a good thing. Yeah. And we experience physical hunger. We experience the longing for food. We experience the satisfaction of eating food, but but our our appetites for food can be distorted too. Yeah. So we can eat all junk food or we can become obsessed with being thin uh, or we can eat out, out for comfort. And so something that's good can be misused and misdirected even from young ages. Yeah. So would you say that a woman who never gets married, never experiences sexual intimacy, is it possible for her, her to live like a satisfied and thriving life? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and let me just put it this way. And I, you're married, Bethany, but there are an awful lot of Christian married women, women who would say, yeah, I still, I still am not satisfied, mm-hmm. you know, because my satisfaction can't come through having the perfect husband or can't come through the fact that all my sexual desires are met. And side note in marriage, um, the journey of sexual intimacy is not always an easy one. And uh, it, there's a lot of tension. There's a lot of potential brokenness. So it, it's not that marriage satisfies you or marriage completely fills that need. You just keep telling on yourself, don't you? Both of you. Um, and so in the same way, like as a single woman, our satisfaction can't come just through marriage and having mm-hmm. sex. Like we weren't, one way I put it is we were not created for sex. We were created for intimacy. Mm -hmm. And so whether you're single or married, the focus has to be first, do I have intimacy with God? But second, do I have intimacy and community? Mm -hmm. Um, Do I feel like I belong somewhere? Am I seen? Am I known? Am I loved? Mm -hmm. 
And we live in a culture that is constantly sabotaging those kinds of relationships and then offering sex as a substitute. I feel like I've been on a journey of of growing intimacy with God. I I grew up in the church, Mm -hmm. you know, always was sort of that good Christian girl, like the obedient girl that wanted to please God. And that's not a bad thing, but wanting to please God as as a daughter is very different than intimately knowing God. This is just nonsense, right? Like she's not actually saying anything of any substance here. It's a lot of words, no content. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I relate to so much of what you're saying. And there's a specific moment in my life where I was, when I was dating, you know, I really wanted to get married. And so I stayed in a relationship much longer than I should have because I just thought, oh no, I'm getting older. He might be the last boat off the island, you know, he's, <laughs> there might be some red flags, but you just, you know, I was just trying so hard to make it work. And the relationship ended with some of our boundaries being compromised. And I remember just, you know, so much of my life was about like being this good girl and earning my worth before God. And so much of my desire for purity in a sense, which I know has a lot of different kind of like, connotations that come with it. But for me, it was like, I, Jesus died for me because I'm just, I'm kind of like this good person, you know, and I need to earn my worth before him. And that's kind of what gets me saved. I would have never said that out loud, but that's really how I was living. And so this moment where we cross these boundaries, I, I was just feeling like so guilty and worthless and all of these different feelings. And I remember going on a walk and I was just praying. And I remember just realizing like, this is why Jesus died for me because I don't, I can't do everything perfectly and I'm not like perfectly wise and have it all together. And there was just this sense of relief, like, wow, God's grace is so amazing in my life. And I'm just so grateful. I don't have to be like good enough to be, you know, like a Christian. And that's been a journey for me too, because I'm such a um, performer and like, okay, someone says to do something like I can do it, you know, and even getting Mm -hmm. married, it's like, oh, I I need God's grace so much, even in being a wife and now having kids. Like, wow, I have like, this is hard. For God's sake, what is even the point in this story? What, What is the relevancy? So mm-hmm. rewinding back to a woman who's in that place where she's like, okay, I don't want to, I'm, I'm single and I want to be wise in my relationships, but I, I definitely don't want to try to earn my worth before God or, you know, try yeah. to measure up. How can she steward her sexuality well without falling into that trap? Yeah. Uh, boy, I think it's really good. Um, that's a good question. One of the things that I think helps distinguish between those two is a purity mindset versus okay. an integrity mindset. Like so that. purity mindset sort of has this pass fail test mentality yes. of like you described, you probably thought I even teach this stuff, but I failed, you know, like God must be so angry with me. And yeah. I don't think I can ever teach it again because it's pass fail. And I think even with a purity mindset, like we can, we can start putting ourselves and others in categories. Like, uh, like I did it the right way. They did it the wrong way. Uh, you know, people even ask me, like, should I ever consider marrying somebody who's had premarital sex? It's like, that's a purity mindset of pass fail. Yeah. And instead, what God really calls us to is he calls us to integrity. Mm. You know, he says that if you follow me, you will love me with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Mm. And so that means that all of who I am, not just my behavior, but my heart and my fears and my wounds and my struggles and my shame Like I need to bring that all before him Mm -hmm. and invite him to redeem everything. Uh, But I think it also helps us realize that God's concerned about more than our behavior. So yes, he's concerned about our sexual behavior. So integrity means not just doing the right actions, but it means having the right heart attitude, even in terms of why we want to honor God, not out of fear, but because we belong to him. And it informs what we do with our failures and our shame and our questions. We bring it all to him. Uh, and that that also follows you into marriage if you get married. Mm-hmm. You still are called to live with sexual integrity. So it's really a lifelong journey. Again, they're saying a whole lot of nothing, aren't they? Julie then goes on to say how in culture, most couples don't know real love because they've only ever experienced erotic love and we just feel passion for each other, apparently. I don't even know what I'm doing with the air quotes anymore. Um, 
yeah, apparently, um, if we're not married and Christian, then we, we only ever feel passion for each other. It's not real love. We can't possibly know real love. But in a Christian marriage, it's different because that's real love. It's covenant, and that me or covenant. And that means it's based on a promise, and therefore it's better than our love. Yes, this woman really is here gatekeeping love. I know. She then goes on to talk about people with other religions, and oh, I can't believe I have to even have to read this out loud. She says people who worship or follow other religions, worship other gods, she says they are adulterers who are whoring after other gods. Adulterers, like you're whoring after other gods. He used sexual terminology because you belong to me. I cannot. And so as much as you might love your boyfriend and you feel that passionate love and you feel like, man, I really love this guy, if you do not have a covenant with him, which means you're married to him, then sex is inappropriate because mm. sex was given as a sign of that covenant. Mm. It's with our bodies signifying what we have just promised to do with our character. Mm. Um, so it's like loving with your character, basically. Um, mm. And I'm so grateful, Bethany, that God loves me with a covenant love because otherwise I don't think he would have stuck around for this long. <laughs> Oh, please. You can absolutely have commitment and intimacy and promises between people who aren't married. A few more quick questions, Julie. So for the woman who feels like, well, if I don't at least compromise on my own convictions or maybe even have sex with my boyfriend, like there just aren't any guys who are willing to wait for marriage who are going to want me if I have like certain boundaries or convictions. I've heard so many women say that. And that's a hard place to be to feel like, wow, if I don't you know, give my boyfriend more, he's not going to stick around. And a lot of women have just resigned. Like, that's what you got to do if you want to get married these days. What would you say to that? Yeah, I would say, first of all, there may be some reality to that. Um, you know, like we live in a culture where there are probably more single committed Christian women than there are single cr committed Christian men. And that makes me really sad. Yeah. And I know a lot of amazing single Christian women who would love to find a man who has those same values. Yeah. And that, like I said, that's just a reality. Nobody can promise you that if you say no to having sex, God is going to bring this wonderful guy. He might, but that's that's not a promise we can cling to. Mm -hmm. But here's really where, where it all kind of comes to fruition. We have to each decide what we put our confidence in. So are you going to put your confidence in finding a guy, like just getting married in compromising in that, like this man is going to save me and he's mm -hmm. worth sacrificing my values for, or are you going to put your confidence in God? Okay. Okay. Stop here. Forget all that. The important thing to be telling your viewers here is about consent, respect, and boundaries. You should never ever stay with anyone who does anything to you without your consent. You should never stay with someone who doesn't respect your boundaries. You need to be on the same page as your partner about your core values when it comes to sex and someone who doesn't respect your values and who keeps pushing you to do things that you're not comfortable with is someone who is not worth your time whether you want to have sex before marriage or you never want to get married and still want to have sex or you want to wait an amount of time or you want to save yourself till marriage or anything in between, your partner needs to be on the same page as you and respect your values around that and your boundaries around that. No exceptions, none. Yeah. What am I basing my life on? Mm -hmm. And we live in a culture that will repeatedly tell you that happiness can only come through romantic fulfillment and through marriage. Yeah. It's just not true. I wish you could come to work with me some days and listen to all the married Christian women who are struggling and who are in deep pain and deep disappointment because no man can be your salvation. Again, you keep talking a lot about miserable married women in this lesson. Like, is everything okay, ladies? Do you need to talk? So there we go, and that's the end of the lesson. Again, I'm confused because they barely actually talked about sexuality. They did not talk about sex drive at all. It's kind of like Bethany came up with the titles for the lessons, picked some guest speakers for a few of them, said, hey, let's have a chat, but then didn't actually bother to plan anything 
and when she didn't actually cover the topics for like that the lesson title said it would she just left it okay let's move on to session three and i've just turned the light on because it is getting dark here because winter so this session this lesson is called sex and intimacy through a biblical lens and this is the second of i think five of the ten lessons which are just taught by Bethany herself. It's interesting she didn't get as many guests on this one, um, maybe, I don't know, there's lots of reasons for that I guess, um, maybe people were just busy, maybe people weren't comfortable on a sexuality course for single women in the Christian community, I don't know, um, maybe, <laughs> maybe she refused to pay them, <laughs> maybe Bethany didn't, didn't have the budget to pay them, um, Maybe some of her speakers didn't want to come back because they didn't get as many sales out of the last one as they expected to. I don't know. Interesting though. But yeah. But yeah, half these lessons end up just being like Bethany chatting to a camera by herself. Which is basically my life. So I can relate, Bethany. Yeah. So in the start of this lesson, Bethany is proud of us for being here and then tells us her origin story again for the third time in three lessons. She then plugs her Girl Defined book, Sex, Purity and the Longings of a Girl's Heart, and brags about how she was single and untouched when she wrote it. On the bright side though, she now acknowledges that she wrote that book while knowing nothing, but she still wants us to buy and read the book for reasons. Um, and so when it comes to God's design for sex and intimacy, I want to kind of rewind and first talk about God's design for love and for marriage and where sex and intimacy ties into that. And now we kind of use the word sex and intimacy interchangeably, but I think often when people think of sex, they think of kind of like bodies, kind of like intercourse, like connecting. Um, but when I think of the word intimacy, to me, it's so much more holistic and so much bigger than that. Um, like if couples could go into marriage, new couples that are engaged and going on their honeymoon with a perspective more of like like a bigger picture, like not just bodies connecting and like, it's going to be hot nights of passion, you know, not just bodily, but really taking it deeper and saying like, what does it mean to be fully known and to fully know someone and to fully embrace them and love them and be completely open and vulnerable and them to do the same. Like that level of intimacy is what creates the most beautiful like sex in a sense. Um, and so that's something that as single woman, even though you're not experiencing that yet, <laughs> speak for yourself, Bethany, I mean, even though you're not experiencing that yet, um, learning to view sex and intimacy through that lens and learning to come to a place where you can be open and honest and raw and vulnerable, um, is huge. Seriously, stop acting like you're better than everyone just because you chose to get married plenty, plenty of people have real intimacy without marriage. And even within marriage, there are lots of different ways to approach marriage and partnerships and long-term partnerships. Your way isn't the only way, and it's not the only right way. And also, just because you put up boundaries before marriage uh, that you could only break down with marriage, that doesn't mean the rest of us have put those boundaries up. So plenty of us are able to experience that real intimacy that you talk about, without marriage. Because there are a lot of married women who are hiding and they might be physically vulnerable with their body, but their heart, their emotions, what they're really thinking, um, they keep it from their spouse. And so there's like a big wall and their intimacy is really hindered because of that. And it can also go vice versa. Um, and so my prayer is that as you work through this course, that you will learn to break down some of those barriers and you will learn to ultimately have a true, deep, authentic, intimate relationship with Christ. Because if you can be fully known, keep hitting my microphone, um, fully known and fully vulnerable and fully honest with Christ, we obviously know he knows everything about us, but if you can like be fully known and know him fully, like that is the most important relationship. And so if you Okay. So when it comes to marriage, um, we see a lot of people go into marriage with a, a lot of expectations, big ideas, how amazing it's going to be, how perfect it's going to be. And although it is very exciting and can be really amazing, we know that marriage isn't like 
absolutely everything. It is not um, just this, once you get married, life just becomes this perfect fairy tale romance and everything is easy. And as long as you have that attraction, it's just absolutely incredible. Like marriage, I've heard it said, is a people growing machine. Becoming a parent is a people growing machine. It's a very sanctifying, um, but it's also beautiful at the same time. It's one of those relationships you enter into, a covenant you enter into that totally sanctifies you. And through that process draws you closer together. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people in our day and age, Christian and otherwise, uh, when things get hard, they kind of give up and they don't view it as like, wow, this is, th and I have my baby monitor. So I'm trying to keep an eye on my, on my sweet little baby while she's sleeping. Um, they give up when the going gets hard and when the feelings fade, they go, oh, I guess it wasn't meant to be. When in reality, it's like, you can work through that and commit like, you're just getting to the good stuff. You're just getting to the real intimacy. I think here, Bethany's just really misunderstanding why a lot of long-term relationships or marriages end. Like, sure, you might stop dating someone casually just because you're like, meh, you know, maybe we don't have the chemistry, maybe it's just not right, or like, or, you know, some other casual kind of reason. But generally, people don't divorce someone on a whim because they fancy it that morning, you know? Generally, long-term relationships and marriages end because of big, insurmountable issues. Betrayals, lives moving in different directions, abuse, sometimes people just having different needs in life. Big issues that you can't just work through. I don't think anyone just wants to leave a long-term relationship for a bit of fun, you know? Generally, there's a real reason and a lot of thought behind it. Not everything has to be a problem you have to work through. Sometimes it's okay to say, hey, we tried for a while, didn't work out, let's go do our own things, yeah? It's funny because Bethany does, throughout the rest of this course, talk about dating quite a few people. Like, I didn't realise Bethany had dated that many people, but here we are. <laughs> And, and she gives really solid reasons for why each of those relationships ended and didn't work out. So why is it okay for her to have good reasons for relationship ending, but not other people? If she can understand, hey, we stopped dating because we realised we wanted different things in life, why can she not understand that sometimes, when you're married, you also have those feelings and separate? Breakups and divorces aren't failures. They aren't laziness. Sometimes they're absolutely the right choice. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Just because a relationship ended, that doesn't mean the entire relationship was a failure and that it wasn't worth something and enjoyable and wonderful and, you know, a good experience to have. Bethany then tells the story of Genesis again and again. We've already heard this like three times in this course already. It's just there's so much repetition. God created Adam and Eve to perfectly fit one another. You know, like if you just think about the physical body, it's like God made it that way. God made, I know this is going to make some of you uncomfortable, but like God made the penis, God made the vagina and God made them to fit perfectly together. Like our bodies tell a bigger story. Like the woman was made to receive, the man was made to give. Like there are just so many things and just even how, um, you know, conception takes place. Like all of that is so incredible. God's perfect word contains more wisdom than every chick flick and romance novel combined. And now the world would say that love and marriage, truly the foundation they would say is built on this like cosmic connection, finding your soulmate. It's really um, genuinely like infatuation feelings based. And if you watch any major chick flick, I mean, just stop and evaluate, look, what, why do two people end up together ultimately? It's because they just have this this romance and this connection. And that's, they view that as like the sign of they are meant to be together. And it's just crazy because it's like, we're making these huge life decisions on feelings and infatuation. And so we see so much in culture, how marriages and love and romance and sex, all of that is just based on infatuation and feelings and everything else kind of like, you know, is smaller from there, but that is the most important thing. Again, Bethany just has a really weird warped view of how other people live. And the only thing I can think of is she's been sheltered and is naive, you know? So few people live like this and do this. Does she really think the majority of people are getting into long-term relationships and marriages based on like, oh, well, I thought he was cute, so I married him. N no. <laughs> if that was true, there would be a lot less single people in the world because people would just be jumping into marriage willy-nilly. You know? 
This idea of actually assessing your compatibility with someone before you commit to them isn't new. You didn't invent it, Bethany. You don't have a monopoly on it. Your church didn't invent it. Your church doesn't have a monopoly on it. It's a very common thing. Even as someone who you would be disgusted by because I'm sexually active in a long-term relationship with no intentions of marrying my partner, I'm not just with him because he's good in bed. I don't know, it's one of the reasons. But no, the, the big thing is everything else about him. The way we want the same things in life, how our future plans align, how we have the same core values, how we support each other, how he is so kind and so fun and we have the same silly sense of humour and so much fun together. That's not just infatuation. I'm not just with him because he's pretty. It's still real love even without us wanting marriage, you know? And lots and lots of couples all around the world also experience that. You really do not have a monopoly on real love. You can't keep gatekeeping love. And we know like that is not what's gonna last because we can just look out and see relationships, how they're not lasting, they're not thriving. You know, very attractive celebrity couples are having all sorts of sex and it's obviously not enough to satisfy because most of them are hopping from relationship to relationship. And so I think we need to look when we're watching these chick flicks or these romance novels go, okay, how is this advice actually working out in real life? And if we're truly honest, if we're truly honest about this, we can look and say, the actors, the directors of these movies, this isn't actually working in their life. They're making this all beautiful and like with all the lights and with all the editing and making this look like this is the way. But in reality, it doesn't work. We need something better. We need to go to our creator. Again, this just screams naivety to me. Like, Bethany, you know films aren't real life, right? It's just a film. It's fiction. It's had certain bits taken out of real life and exaggerated and simplified and mim it's a film. And again, Bobby, you nearly did a mire and scared me. <sighs> One of my last videos, my Maya Angelou Bobby fell off the settee and made me jump so much. <sighs> nearly wet myself like a kid. So celebrities, again, she does realize that we can't pretend celebrity relationships are the norm, right? Because they're not. That's not how real people live their lives. Celebrities are always in the spotlight and have to think about PR and this and this and like No, we can't look to them and say like, ah, this is how people live And so instead of building a relationship on personal happiness on Personal fulfillment like that should not be the greatest goal and the greatest motivation of why you enter into a relationship Personal happiness personal fulfillment should not be the foundation of your relationship attraction should not ultimately be the foundation the foundation whether dating or or married should be this. The foundation and the goal is to glorify God, glorifying God. And then once we have that foundation, we can build from there. So what is the next thing that we should look for in a Christian marriage when it comes to viewing this from a Christian lens? So instead of it being all about sexual attraction and that being the most important thing, that does matter. But instead of that being like a foundational piece, the next most important important thing in a Christian marriage should be to pursue agape love. And the word agape love in the Bible literally means self-sacrifice. It's a Greek word used, and that's what it means. Agape love is self sacrificing love. It's love is often led by emotions. You'll hear in modern vows, um, instead of saying till death do us part, they'll say as long as our love shall last. So the choice to be in a relationship is really led by emotions, how one's feeling, if they feel like we, our love is still here, but like, what is love? Agape love is a self-sacrificing kind of love. It's a love that says, I choose to be here. I didn't just choose you on our wedding day. I choose you today. And then you wake up the next day and you say, I choose you today again. I choose you in your best moments and in your worst moments, just like you would do with your children. Um, you know, you choose them in their best moments and their worst moments. And just like God chooses us, he agapes us. Um, we, do not deserve his love, but he agapes. He says, I choose to self-sacrificially love you. This whole like, we do not deserve God's love thing, that just makes me really, really sad for them. And then this next bit, 
because in a marriage, it's not going to be all like rainbows and butterflies all the time. They're going to be those highs, but they're also going to be those lows. They're going to be hardships. They're going to be tragedies. They're going to be difficulties that you will face as a couple. And if you are just there in the relationship based on feelings, based on emotions, it's going to dwindle and it's going to fall apart. Um, and so you have to decide what kind of love am I going to build this relationship upon? Agape love chooses to faithfully love someone no matter what. When Hollywood says, I love you, it often means I love what you do for me or I love how you make me feel. The bottom line is that actually when Hollywood says, I love you, they are saying, I actually love me and I love what you can do for me. And if you stop doing what I want you to do for me, making me feel a certain way, you know, boosting my ego, um, any of that, then uh, I the, the love is no longer there. Agape love isn't about loving self at all, but about sacrificing self for the good of another. This makes me really sad for Dave, knowing how he's been feeling recently. And again, if you want to find out more about that, go check out the end of the Saga of Bethany Beale video. Dave came out with this whole, he's been miserable in his marriage and having suicidal ideation and stuff like that. It was intense. It's interesting though, because Bethany talks here about how special it is to wake up every day and choose to be with someone. And I absolutely agree. That is very special. It's one of the reasons that me and my partner don't want a traditional marriage. We don't want to be married because we love that idea of as long as we're together, it's because we are actively choosing it every day. It makes it more special, more meaningful. It's really, really lovely, you know? And it's of course really lovely if Bethany and Dave have that too. And I very much hope they do. Like, it sounds great. The problem is choosing something is only special when you actually have another option. And it's sad because what Bethany is talking about here isn't actually choice. No one is choosing to stay each day because they could leave, but they, they want to stay. No, they don't actually have that option. They're staying out of obligation. They're staying because divorce isn't permitted and they couldn't leave if they wanted to. When you talk about marriage being this covenant and this promise and an unbreakable promise and blah, 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 and divorce bad and meh, 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 it means that you, you are trapped in that marriage. Even if you want to be there, it's still a trap to some extent because you don't have the option to leave. So, I, uh, I feel like I'm rambling here. Basically, there's a huge difference between I have an obligation to stay here and I am choosing to stay here. And when you remove the choice, it becomes a whole less mean becomes a whole lot less meaningful, doesn't it? I don't know. Basically, I appreciate Bethany's sentiment, but in practice, she's not really doing what she preaches, is she? From there, it's the next layer, which is covenant promise. Instead of building your relationship on infatuation, which is a feelings-driven sort of love, and that being like an essential step, you need to view it as a covenant promise. And this is specifically within marriage. Covenant is the word meaning a promise that cannot be broken. So as we've been talking about, Hollywood marriages are based on conditions of personal happiness. We see this over and over and over again. It only lasts as long as the couple feels happy or one person might feel happy and the other person doesn't. It's not going to last. Yeah, see, I don't really see why this is a bad thing. Bethany has still yet to prove to me why a marriage or relationship ending is a bad thing. She keeps saying, oh, this is terrible because look at all these divorces. Why is a divorce bad? And again, describing marriage as an unbreakable promise is really removing choice from people, isn't it? And that really bothers me. And when we create a covenant with Christ, Christ is saying, this is a promise that cannot be broken. This is something that I'm giving to you through my self-sacrificial love. And when we enter a marriage, we are entering into a covenant as well. It's not a contract. It's not like, hey, as long as our love shall last, it's a covenant. It's something so much bigger. Staying married, therefore, is not about staying in love. It is about staying in covenant. And I remember the day that I got married, um, October of 2018. And Dave and I did not stand out there and say, as long as our love shall last. We said a lot of the traditional vows. Um, and we said, until death do us part. And the reason we said that is because 
we don't didn't expect the way that we felt on our honeymoon to be how I mean on her um uh, at the altar to to be how we felt all of the time. We were making promises that we were committing to not breaking well into the future. And that's why Dave and I regularly say, you know, throughout the week, like I choose you today. I covenant you today. Like I am uh, that wasn't just one thing now I'm stuck here. Like I say that again and again and again. I didn't just choose that once. I'm choosing it over and over and over again and it's especially important when those hard moments hit to say like we're in a covenant and not because I'm stuck here but because I want to be here and I choose you and I know when you're single it's easy to think like well I'll always feel so magically in love but you know what that kind of thinking is what gets couples in a place of misery or wanting to get divorced um Unfortunately, there are just a lot of couples who are not doing very well and who are not very happy. And if marriage and passion and romance were the answer, then more couples would be in love through the distance. But we expect romance to carry us and then we find ourselves very disappointed. So again, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but only because Bethany is repeating herself so much as well. I really don't think Bethany knows how the average relationship functions. She's seen her parents, she's seen films, and that's it. It's so bizarre to me. So then... After you have all those layers, then the very pinnacle of it all built on top of all that is sexual intimacy. The world and culture in Hollywood would flip it around, you know, like they wouldn't even have covenant. They wouldn't have all of that. But sexual intimacy and that sexual attraction and those feelings would be personal happiness would be the biggest layer for them. That would be the most important thing in a relationship. But in a Christian marriage, we're putting it the opposite. We're saying glorifying God is the foundation. Sacrificial love is the foundation. Um, agape love is the foundation. Um, entering into a covenant, choosing over and over again is the foundation. And then on top of that, what makes the most beautiful sexual um, connection is then adding sexual intimacy within the covenant marriage on top of that. So once the, those three layers are in the right order, you'll be ready for the spectacular cake topper of sexual intimacy. There's nothing shameful about sex within marriage. It's a celebration of covenant love. I think there is a mosquito in here eating me because I'm like all itchy. Bethany needs to learn how to edit. <sighs> anyway, she then says if you have sexual trauma, you need to work them out and get counseling because she doesn't want your past to become a weight you carry into the future. Forward. Instead of focusing so much on the past, if there are things you need to repent of, if there are things you need to work out, if there are things you need to get counseling for to really help you process that stuff, absolutely do that. But I don't want your um, past to become this weight that you carry into the future. Again, it just kind of feels disrespectful, doesn't it? There's another yada rant from her, just like in the marriage video. I say, use the word yada, which means a deep knowing. What does yada have to do with unmarried women? So I use this word yada. When I first learned about yada, meaning this deep knowing, God uses the word yada to describe what his, that deep knowing, his relationship with us should look like. And he also uses that relationship to talk about intimacy between a husband and a wife. And so yada is this beautiful deep knowing. It's so much more than just a physical exchange. Single women do not have to wait until marriage to experience yada and that's pretty much where this lesson ends honestly this course is boring me at this point luckily we have more interesting things to talk about coming up but at this point i was like why am i doing this i mean i still ask why am i doing it but <laughs> i think the biggest problem i had with this is that these three first lessons could have just been like one 10 minute lesson instead of like two and a half hours of that anyway session four is finding healing and wholeness from past wounds. This session brings back Joy Skarka who was a speaker in the marriage course too. This lesson is about healing from sexual trauma which is also what she spoke about in the marriage course, kind of. Their lesson's supposed to be about uh, sexual trauma but instead she just talks about porn a lot and porn being bad and masturbation being bad and why none of us should do it. The thing is what she tells us in this video and the session she did in the marriage video, actually you know, they're very, very similar. She tells the same stories in both in the same sort of way, they cover the same topics. I, yeah, in terms of her content, there's not much new in this section compared to what she did in the marriage course, but I talk about some new stuff, so keep watching. <laughs> Basically, if you're unfamiliar with her, she tells us her story again in this. And Joy's story is a sad one. Um, and I mean absolutely no disrespect to her as a person for what she's been through. I think to come out the other side having survived sexual assault is 
incredibly brave and wonderful and I commend her for speaking out about it. Absolutely do. So Joy sadly was sexually assaulted in college and in order to try and heal and cope and come to terms with what happened to her, she began to watch a lot of porn because she kind of saw it as like helping her understand what she'd been through and understand what sex is. I do think that if Bethany had a speaker who was talking about healing from sexual assault, that could have been a really important topic to cover in this course. It would have been really useful. I just think she needed to pick someone other than Joy because the stuff that is spoken about here is all just porn bad, porn evil, porn corrupted me, instead of actually talking about healing and feeling safe in your body again, you know? I think what annoyed me most about this is, like I said, Joy has told this story before in Bethany's other course, almost word for word actually, but Bethany is giggling along here and asking questions like she's never heard it before. It's very odd. I was like, I was there. I watched it with you, Bethany. We both heard this before. It... Odd. Uh, this next bit is where things start to get a little intense, so I'm gonna go and take a little break from filming and charge my camera battery and stuff like that and come back and tackle this in a little bit. Hey, okay, so I'm back and I have a little Kubi bear with me. Don't I, baby bear? And uh, yeah, let's let's just carry on with this. I've had some food, watched EastEnders, had a little break, had a little rest, rest of my voice. Isn't that right? Had a little snack? Yeah, so did you. Pardon you. You enjoyed it. Yeah, you little gravy biscuit. Good girl. Took this one out for a walk. Okay, let's uh, carry on with this. Let's jump straight back into joy. Um, it's just so cool. God kind of took my story of brokenness and pain and made it into my passion to help mm -hmm. other women. And did you want me to go into a little of my story right now? Absolutely. Does that sound good? Yeah, let's rewind though. Take us back okay. to more of your upbringing first. Like, did you grow up? you know, talking about sex? Were you, did you grow up in a Christian family? Like give us the foundation first. Yes. So we went to a, a small church and it was very much kind of the purity culture narrative, which if you're unfamiliar with that, just kind of putting shame around sexuality or just telling you just don't do it till you're married, just making it kind of a, make you afraid of it. But it's also like the more you can't have it, the more you want it, that kind of stuff. And so I would always just ask questions. I was just so curious of like, well, how far is too far? And like, what can I do in a dating relationship? Um, like, what is sex even going to be like in marriage? Just I had a lot of questions. I was very curious as a teen. And I had no safe place to ask these questions. Yeah, yeah. So I said I was a Christian, but I totally didn't understand the gospel at all. It was very much mm. like works based. I didn't understand grace. Um, and I was kind of living a double life. Like I would go to church on Sunday, be a c proper Christian in a dress kind of thing. And then like the weekdays, I would sneak around with my boyfriend and we would be like doing stuff behind the building at school, like crazy stuff now, I, like in the woods. I'm like, how, who the heck was I to do these things in the woods? I just don't understand. So I was really confused and lost yeah. and definitely acting out sexually as a way. For me, it was a way to find love, to feel loved. I had so many body image issues. I hated myself. Mm -hmm. And so this was the way I kind of felt that love and felt beautiful. The thing is, a lot of people in general do feel like this and go through this and use sex in an unhealthy way, undoubtedly. But I also find it incredibly problematic that the only or first representation of sex outside marriage in this course is this. It implies that all sex outside of marriage is unhealthy and bad because this is the example. It's implying that people only explore their sexuality as a teenager or young adult outside of marriage if they're broken or damaged or they're seeking to fulfill an empty part of them, all of which is absolute crap. Remember, we don't like these words like damaged and broken, but if you want to put it in terms of people only seek to explore their sexuality when they've experienced trauma, that's also a bunch of crap. Lots of people experiment with and explore their sexuality simply because they want to, because they're curious, because they enjoy it. Understanding and exploring your sexuality in a safe environment at your own, with lots of communication, is a really, really healthy thing to do. If you don't mind me like telling a personal story for a second, this actually reminded me of this one guy I went on a few dates with, and good girl. He um, kept like pushing and pushing for me to like tell him everything about my dating and sexual history. And I was just like, but you don't need to know. I have no STIs. I 
have never been pregnant and don't plan on being pregnant. Um, I have no exes in my life still. Um, we're using protection. What else do you need to know? Oh, I'm not sleeping with anyone else. Like, other than that, like, what else did he need to know? Nothing. But he kept pushing and pushing and pushing and wanting to know, like, more and more and more. Turns out he was absolutely, like, projecting his own issues onto me with this because, like, while he was doing all this, he had a literal shrine to his ex in his bedroom. I'm not joking. I was at his house this one time and I was like, oh, I, I need to, like, uh, get some pads, like, I'm on my period. Do you mind if we run to the shop? He went, oh, no, I think I've, I think I've got some. And I was like, oh, well, that's nice. Like, a guy who keeps pads in his house, like, keeping them spare for, like, friends or girlfriends. Like, that's, that's great, really responsible. Except then, except then he took me into his bedroom and, and, like, opens this drawer. And he was like, yeah, my ex left some here. And he pulls out, like, a whole pack of pads with, like, one missing. And in the drawer is also, like her pyjamas neatly folded and like a whole bunch of her clothes, makeup, makeup remover, some books she'd left, like all just like laid out and they'd broken up like two years ago and he'd kept all of her stuff like, yeah, it creeped me out a bit, I'll be honest. It was one of my get out of there now moments along with the little bit of the story that I'm going to tell now. So, I, anyway, I think, yeah, he was speaking out of insecurity because he still had these unresolved feelings for an ex, so I think he needed to know everything about me to know that I wasn't doing the same, I guess? I don't know. Anyway, there was definitely insecurity there, and he kept asking, he kept asking, he's like, tell me, tell me, tell me, 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 And then eventually he's like, how many people have you slept with? And when I finally, like, told him, because he wouldn't let it go, he got really quiet and was like, I, uh, I have to go think. Then he comes back a while later and he's like, hey, look, so I've been thinking and the things I really like you and um, I forgive you. And I was like, forgive me for what? I haven't done anything. And he's like, look, I just, I forgive you for how many people you've been with and I think I can get over this because I understand it. You were insecure. And I was like, what do you mean I was insecure? And he's like, well, you obviously felt insecure about yourself and felt bad about yourself and so you only slept with those people because you were trying to like fill a void, right? And I was like, no, I chose to have sex with people because I wanted to have sex with people because I thought they were pretty or nice or I liked them. <laughs> it wasn't an insecurity thing, it was a sex is fun thing. And this ended up like exploding into this big whole argument and I properly ended things not long after that because I was like, because it was like he was trying to make me ashamed of something that I wasn't ashamed about. And when he couldn't accept that I was ashamed of it, he was like, I don't know, like talking down to me and like pitying it. And I'm like, it's nothing to pity. I'm doing great. I've had fun. I'm not. It was very odd. I tell this story for two reasons. One, because this is why it's really important to have shared core values about sex and its meaning between partners. Because if you don't have that, it doesn't work, clearly. But the other thing is, this way that he was portraying sex as this thing where like, a woman gives it up, or a woman only does it because she has to, a woman only does it because she's missing something from her, like, it's absolute crap. And that mindset is what Bethany and Joy are pushing here, and I find it really, really harmful. They're acting like people who enjoy having sex are using it as some sort of unhealthy coping mechanism in the same way that some people abuse drugs or alcohol or self-harm or even food, but that's really not the case. Sure, some people probably do, I guess, misuse sex, if you want to put it that way, but that doesn't mean that every person who enjoys sex is misusing it, just as in the same way everyone who uses food isn't misusing it, or everyone who has a glass of wine isn't misusing it. For the majority of people, sex is a really healthy, fun thing to do, and it's not something we should be shaming or saying that, oh, people only do it because they have trauma. Sex is really great at being an expression of desire and love and lust and connection and bonding and all these good things, and we can't ignore that. That was kind of high school. So when I got into college, I was pretty lost still. And my third day of college, I met this guy at orientation and um, ended up being date raped by him that night. And so it kind of 
was a rock bottom moment for me and where I had been turning to sexual things. Like this was my first time having intercourse wow. too. So all the other times I was doing random things, but yeah. nevertheless, like trying to find love. Okay, again, a lot to talk about here. And honestly, most of them I think I covered in the marriage course video. Um, so there's not exactly anything new here, but there are some things I think are worth repeating. So I think the worst part of this is that it really is so victim blamey. She's implying that because she was sexually curious and explored her sexuality as a teen, then that directly caused her rape, which is a horrible thing to be promoting. She implies that if she didn't go on that date, then she wouldn't have been raped. If she hadn't done stuff with other boys, like before this man, then she wouldn't have been raped. That's the implication here, and it's disgusting and wrong, and I both feel sorry for her and angry at her for teaching other people this stuff. Rape is never the victim's fault. I don't know how many times I have to say that. Whether the person who has been raped was previously sexually active or curious or not doesn't matter. Still not their fault. It doesn't matter if you're on a date with your rapist. Still not your fault. It doesn't matter if you had a drink, what you were wearing, where you were, anything. It's not your fault. Nothing Joy did, nothing any rape victim did, caused or led to her deserving to be raped or causing the rape. The only person who causes rape is the rapist. I feel it's absolutely dangerous for Joy and Bethany to be teaching people otherwise. Joy then goes on to talk about how she had a lot of questions after her trauma and instead of dealing with them or going to therapy or like seeking help or anything like that, she ended up turning to porn and attempted to use it as a sex education tool, which is of course a bad idea. Now when I say this is a bad idea, I don't mean this to shame her. Lots of people try and heal in different ways and not all of them work. We can't shame her for that, we can't blame her for that. Sorry, it's my computer making noise. Um, she didn't know better, it's not her fault. But I do think it is important to just point out that yeah, porn is not a sex education tool. And so I had all these questions about what had happened. Like, well, was that sex? Was it my yeah. fault? And so I started Googling them and that's what led me to porn, pornography as a sex educator, which is wow. a bad sex educator. I have learned later. Um, yeah. And so it, it became like all my questions, just searching for answers. And um, it took me telling a few friends for them to be like, no, that wasn't your fault. Like you mm. said, no, you, you know, you tried to leave, like different things like that to where I finally was coming to understand what had happened. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, so it started as a, a like, curiosity, wanting answers to my questions, but then it became my coping mechanism to process mm. through the sexual trauma. So when I was lonely, when I was angry, um, when I was just, I don't know, like any, any emotion really, I just found myself turning back to it as a way to cope um, in college. So, and then in college during the same time, I was invited to crew a college ministry and heard the gospel. And so I'd say that is when I officially would be saved or understand wow. what it means to, to have a relationship with Jesus. Yeah. And so that changed everything, just like getting into scripture, growing closer to God, falling in love with him, that kind of wow. stuff. Um, and that's when I started my recovery journey too. Mm, wow. In regards to this section, again, there's a lot here. Um, first up, I am very grateful that she finally said here that the it wasn't my fault bit but it's so quickly glossed over and really doesn't undo what she implied in the last section about, you know, her sexual curiosity causing the rape and that sort of thing. So it's still overall a problem, but mm, at least it's in there. Uh, secondly, like I say, I do think it's great to point out that porn is not a sex education tool, but it would be much better to point out why instead of just being like, and therefore all porn is bad and sinful. <sighs> I think if you want to focus a lesson or part of a video on the, basically on porn in general, I think you should focus on teaching young people especially that porn is fictional, it's not real life, it's not a sex education tool, it has fictional scenes, fictional characters, fictional settings, there's nothing exciting or romantic or even sexually satisfying about the way porn is filmed and made. The acts captured in porn are not realistic and are heavily edited, they never show the messy bits, the awkward bits, the silly bits, the real bits, People generally don't look like porn actors in real life. They are covered in makeup with fancy lighting and have maybe had plastic surgeries. The average person does not look like that. We're all beautiful in our own ways, just not everyone looks beautiful in that one particular way. 
we all have a lot of different things going on and it's wonderful. In fact, I think real life's a lot more fun because there's a lot more variety, it's great. You also need to teach people that you can't expect the average person to be able to or want to do everything that a professional sex worker or porn actor or actress can do. To ask that is just completely unreasonable. I think you need to teach people that porn glosses over and rarely or never shows important things like communication, using contraception, agreeing to boundaries beforehand, uh, proper consent, stopping if someone says no, the cleanup afterwards, how to take care of your basic hygiene, all of that is missing but really important to learn about and talk about and put into practice. I think we should talk about exploitation in the industry, especially of women and minorities, which has historically been everywhere and still continues to this day. But also with that, it's worth talking about how now more and more companies are making ethically made porn. There's a lot of porn out there that is made by women for women. Let's talk about what the purpose of porn is in general, talk about how it can be good and how it can be bad, how it can be consumed safely and responsibly, and how it can be consumed unethically. Talk about the issues of consent around voyeurism in general. With porn, it allows people with voyeuristic, I guess you could say tendencies, you know, people who like to watch, it lets them fulfill an itch in a consenting way because the actors have consented to being filmed and being watched. Whereas there are unethical ways to fulfill a voyeurism fantasy and if the people being watched aren't consenting, that's not okay. I think we need to talk about the problems with how porn can often display the degradation of women and violence against women as normal when it really, really shouldn't. And I think we need to talk about the problems that arise when people become too reliant on porn or desensitized to, extre to extremely graphic content. There is so much to talk about on this topic. Bethany and Joy just don't cover any of it. They just blanket statement it with all porn bad. And it just doesn't do the topic justice. This whole lesson from Joy and Bethany is just Joy saying, I was sad, so I explored my sexuality, so all sex outside marriage is bad, and then I was hurt, so I watched porn, and therefore all, por all porn is bad, which is not a helpful or healthy viewpoint to be promoting to people for money. You know, the majority of, of, of ladies watching are going to be single, maybe dating, maybe engaged, but in that like not yet married stage of life. And I know that we have a lot of women who are coming to the table with um, either their own like secrets, their own um, just hurts, their own wounds, their own just maybe even choices that they've made, but a lot of I've never told anyone this before. And so we're hearing you say, like I opened up and shared about like the really hard things, the really even, you know, terrible, sinful thing that happened to me. And I know we have women who are saying like any, any, whatever's happened in my life, choices I've made or sins that have done against me, like I can't tell anyone, this is too scary, too big. And then if I do open up, I'm going to have to face this and process through it. And I don't want to do that. So can you take us back to like, you know, that first moment in college where you're date raped, which is just absolutely horrific. And then it kind of snowballs into, you know, this whole part of your story. How did you find the courage to open up and share with someone about what was going on behind the scenes? I do think this is actually a really, really good question. I have to commend Bethany for asking it. This is excellent. Not sure I like the implication that being raped is a sinful thing, but let's just assume she misspoke here by accident and give her the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, great question. And if this is you, if, if you're like feeling this scared and afraid to, to share, like I have been there, it is so scary because also like the, a few, one of the first times I shared it with someone, um, they questioned me like, you know, really? what were you doing there? What were you wearing? Like blaming a lot of self blaming. And so a lot of times, sadly, like that is what the response we get. And that kind of scares us from ever sharing again. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know how long it took me after that to even share again. So wow. if that happened to you too, like, I'm sorry that you had to go through that experience because it, it makes it even harder to want to share again. This is a genuinely great thing to tell the audience, not groundbreaking or worth paying for, but good, important, you know? But what was really like the big moment, the game changer for me was at this point, I was involved in my college ministry. I was going to like Bible studies and different things and they had a women's night. And so I went to this women's night and they had one of the women share their stories. And it was the first time I'd ever heard a Christian woman, woman use the word masturbation and pornography in her story. I had never heard that before. Yeah. I didn't even know women 
could struggle with it, yeah. that women did struggle with it. I had so much shame thinking I was so weird for being the only woman struggling with this. I had mm. heard pastors talk about it for men. Like I heard a sermon where the, the pastor was like, all right, men, this one's for you. Listen up, women, you can tune out for a little bit. I got to speak to the men. And what does that do? It just makes more wow. shame. I felt like I even questioned, like, did God mess up when he created me? Like, am I too sexual than other people? So I just had all these these issues and questions. So anyway, so I'm at this, this is a women's event, and this woman shares her story. And I'm like, wow, okay. So afterwards, I went up and was able to tell her that I had been struggling too. And we started to meet together and get discipled and stuff. And I like to say she went first so that I could go second. Okay, so on the one hand here, Telling the audience that it's good to speak about your experiences without shame, great, wonderful, really commend that. Understanding that having sexual urges is not just a man's problem, but that women are sexual too, again, great, love that. Calling out the negative influence of purity culture there, great, brilliant, this could have been so good. But the implication that masturbating or enjoying looking at sexual images is somehow something which makes you broken or need fixing is not okay. You don't struggle with masturbation. Masturbation is a completely normal and healthy practice which many species of animal do, not just humans, and it's not something anyone should feel ashamed about because it's a completely natural act. But my biggest problem with this is the insinuation that Joy needed mentoring and healing from watching too much porn but not healing from the trauma of being raped and attacked by a person she thought she could trust. Sure, the porn might be a coping mechanism in this very specific case, but here the implication is, well, as someone helps me stop watching porn, then everything is okay. When in reality, that's a really unhealthy way of looking at things because she's still got the actual trauma from the attack underneath that hasn't been addressed. So far, honestly, this lesson is really hit and miss when it comes to such a sensitive topic and it's, mm, it's not a topic you want to be hit and miss with, is it? What I would like to have seen here is to get a licensed therapist who has worked alongside many survivors of sexual assault, talking about some of the ways that people can work through it, recommending certain therapies and types of support group. I'd like to hear them recommend some exercises that people can do when they start to feel guilt or shame or anxiety. I'd like to hear about how the healing process is different for different people, um, especially when it comes to differences in, for example, dealing with childhood sexual assault and sexual assault as an adult. Is it different at all? In what ways? Are there different ways people can heal from different traumas? I'd like to hear about how to choose the right therapist for you. I'd like to hear about how to support a partner who has struggled with being sexually assaulted either in the past or more recently. I'd like to hear recommendations about what you can do or the process for reporting sexual assault in different countries. I'd like to hear about how to make the choice of whether you want to report a sexual assault or not because it's really a difficult decision for so many people. It's a very complicated topic. It's not a matter of, oh, just do it because the whole act of reporting an attack can be re-traumatizing all over again and there are very good reasons why some people choose not to. I'd like to see a full discussion on consent here. What is consent? How do you verbally or physically communicate that you are giving consent? How do you understand that someone else is communicating consent to you? How can you have these conversations with your partner and set boundaries before you're ever intimate? I think there's so much that could be talked about in this topic that just isn't. Bethany, you wouldn't even know how many people send me a message on Instagram mm. saying, hey, thanks for going first. Here I am going second. You're the first person I'm telling this to. Wow. I'm, I'm, and I just thank them and be like, thank you. You're so brave. Like that was a huge step to even share that with anyone, let alone a stranger that you've never met. Um, so yeah, so that's a little bit of how that happened. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about this community um, during this mentorship course is we not only do they get access to our speakers like you, you know, so y'all can totally connect with Joy um, on Instagram and, um, you know, you can be one of those where you can reach out. You're like, I don't really know her, but I just want to take that first brave step. And this seems like a good way just to get my story out there. You can totally do that with Joy. You can also in our private Facebook group, you can, you know, share what you feel comfortable with. Um, it's always such an encouragement to see the other ladies coming around and praying for one another and supporting one another. Um, but it's hard. We so often can feel like on these isolated little islands and like nobody knows what's actually going on in our life. 
Again, I actually think this is a good point, highlight highlighting the importance of community and having support networks you can trust. It just feels, again, a little too basic, a little too little. You've mentioned a lot about shame um, and how mm -hmm. we can just be like trapped in that. Can you unpack a little bit more? Like what, I don't know, what does sexual shame look like in someone's life and how can we start to break free from that? I know that's a really big question, but I just feel like we have a lot of shame surrounding our sexuality for many different reasons. Again, good question, but Bethany, you and your Girl Defined content are one of those reasons. Right, yeah. So let's unpack the kind of the difference between guilt and shame just to have this conversation. So like if we look at my porn addiction, my struggle with porn, like guilt would be, okay, I looked back at porn again, I sinned. I need I have I feel like I sinned against God. I did something wrong. So I confess yeah. and like ask God for forgiveness. So shame takes that to a whole new level where it becomes your identity of, okay, I am porn girl. I'll never stop looking at porn. I'm worthless because I look at porn. No one will ever love me. And, and then it even gets to the point where we doubt God will even love us. And some people even doubt their salvation because of this. And so other, other kind of issues around sexuality that cause shame, people like sexual desire. They think I have sexual desire. So that's shameful. Um, same sex attraction. Someone might feel like, you know, I'm so worthless because I struggle with this. Um, no one's ever going to want to be my friend if they knew the true me mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, so those are just some examples, but the issue with shame is that we feel so alone that no one will ever love us if they knew. Yeah. But the problem is the solution to our shame is community and is being known and yet being loved. And so we have all these women who are isolating themselves because they think, hey, I can't talk about my sexual yeah. issues. But yet when you step out into community, like I did when I shared my story, when I started being discipled, and now I'm sharing my story and helping others, that's where the true healing and freedom can begin. So it's just, I, I feel like shame is such a core piece of people stuck in sexual yeah. sin, um, addiction, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. This is mm, not such a great answer. I mean, yes, talking to people is good. Having community is good. We've already established that. But the implication here is still that these are things you should be ashamed of unless you put the work in to heal. The implication is you should feel shame if you're wanting to explore your sexuality, if you accept you're attracted to the same gender and so on, when in reality, none of those are things to be ashamed of. They're not bad things. Again, the content I would hope to see discussed here is stuff like, what is shame? Why do we feel it? What core beliefs can we find that shame originating from? What things have we been taught in our life that shape our ideas of what is and isn't shameful? I'd like to see a discussion of how we can start to look at these things a little more objectively. This thing that I'm feeling shame about, what are the real world consequences of it? Are these good or bad or neutral? this thing I'm feeling shame about, is it really a bad thing or is it good or a neutral thing? And even if it is a bad thing, does that really mean I have to feel shame for it? How do we start to go about and unpack and challenge the harmful teachings that we've internalized over the years? How do we go about switching up our brain, making use of that neuroplasticity to start seeing topics surrounding sex as neither good nor bad, but just neutral, you know, so on. I think there's a lot to be talked about. And again, it just isn't. It's very, very frustrating. Urgh. Again, I'm no expert here though. I'm just talking about this from the perspective of, look, if I was taking this course, what would I like to learn? I'm not an expert myself, so I can't really teach it you, but this is what I'd expect to see if I was paying for this and I am paying for this, so. Urgh. However, <laughs> if you would like to hear from some experts on these topics, you can check out a few of my book recommendations as I've already briefly mentioned earlier. One big recommendation around this topic of shame is a book that I did mention briefly, and that is Matthias Roberts' book, um, Beyond Shame, Creating a Healthy Sex Life on Your Own Terms. He wrote this in 2020, and Matthias is a psychotherapist specializing in religious and spiritual trauma. So he knows what he's talking about, unlike some people not to name names, Bethany. Even in just the introduction to his book, he wrote that we need to learn how to recognize shame and bring it into the light. As that happens, we're able to untangle ourselves from the effects of shame, leading not only to better sex lives, but also better lives in general. 
So the whole book very clearly is about understanding why we feel shame and learning that that shame is not necessary so we can be free of it. Whereas Joy and therefore Bethany approach this in a very different way, which is very clearly learn why you feel shame so you can stop doing that thing right now, stop it you sinner which is an attitude that all the actual experts say is really, really unhealthy and dangerous. <laughs> what a surprise! Unless the thing you're feeling shame about is hurting others, for example, having an attraction to children, cheating on your partner, something like that, then the chances are you don't need to actually change the thing you're feeling ashamed about, but simply focus on reframing your mindset. Matthias Roberts writes of sexual shame in particular, shame targets the very core of who we are and the ways we experience sexuality also exist in those core places. This is why sexual shame can feel so debilitating and how it can have such far-reaching effects in our lives. If we're told that the ways we are wired to experience love and connection and belonging are wrong, that belief has an impact on most important areas of our lives. If we're taught from an early age that sex is bad, then we believe our sexual drives must be bad too. If our sexual drives are bad, and if, and if we find that we can't control them, and we can't, then there must be something fundamentally wrong with us. Shame runs freely in these spaces. We begin to split ourselves off, finding ways to manage both our sexual drives and the shame that comes with experience them. Things get incredibly unhealthy quickly. Sexual shame ruins us. So Joy's advice to target the sexual drives and attractions and so on, for example, which gender or genders a person is attracted to, um, that's telling people to change or control something fundamental about themselves, which is of course impossible. So while Joy says, and probably even thinks to herself, that she's trying to help people feel free of shame, she is in fact only making the shame last more long term and do more damage. Roberts goes on to say that he believes it's important to move beyond shame to a healthier, more life-affirming view of sex and sexuality, especially in our faith communities. Sexuality is tied intimately to who we are as people, and it influences almost every single aspect of our lives. If shame can establish a stronghold within our sexuality, it can do a pretty good job of mucking up our lives. He continues, shamefulness is based on the presupposition that there is a right context for sexual expression and a wrong, conte wrong context for it. Any sexual activity outside of that context, whether defined by marriage, commitment, the gender of the person we desire or other criteria, is deemed bad or wrong. I know I'm reading out a lot to you here, but trust me, it's worth it. He then says, when we are taught the right context for sexual expression, at some point many of us discover that our sexuality, our sexual desire, and our fantasy lives don't exactly fit into such a neat box. We learn that we will have to struggle against our desires. If sex outside the prescribed context is bad, it would seem to follow that our desire to have sex outside that context must also be bad. Now we feel dirty and we can't shake the feeling that there's something wrong with us for desiring sex outside of the right context. This is the voice of shame telling us loud and clear, I am dirty and I am bad because I want something dirty and bad. And so by still categorizing types of sex as good and bad, Bethany and Joy are exacerbating these types of feelings of shame that they claim they wanna help with. It's like going to an AA group who are telling you to stop drinking while pouring you shots of alcohol. Hey, so editing me jumping in here and trying not to cry <laughs> because this next bit, um, I already had a bunch of tech stuff go wrong as I'm gonna tell you in a minute. And then I spent like five hours recording yesterday and I filmed all of this stuff and turns out my microphone wasn't plugged in properly for any of it. So it all sounds like it was recorded in a dustbin and I do not have the time or the energy to try and re-record it all. And I'm just, everything is going wrong with this video and I really wanted it to be good and I just feel like I keep messing up. So I'm sorry. And... <laughs> I'm just gonna try and fix it however I can, so just, yeah, I'm sorry. All right, at this point, you might have noticed I look different. I have had such drama, it's two days later, we had a whole tech issue with the camera, it's fixed now, and then yesterday was just a bad, bad day. I said most for crying, but it's okay, we're here now, we got this, let's carry on. Uh, let's, let's just take a look at another clip and try and get back into this while I can still remember how to speak and not crying. <laughs> now, something I've heard from women is that they feel like I've done all the things, you know, like I 
I prayed, I opened up and I just, I'm still stuck in this sin or I'm still stuck just like feeling trapped in this. And you've talked to, you know, just on your Instagram and on your platform about the journey of finding freedom and how it's not like this instant overnight, like, okay, you pray this prayer and then whew, tomorrow you wake up and everything is just perfect. Right. Yeah. So some people think like it's going to be this immediate thing. And even you could have seasons of healing and freedom and then something happens and it re triggers you like getting married. Like that's a, like this course, you could feel freedom and singleness. You get married and sex isn't all that you thought it would be in the beginning. That was part of my story. Trigger. There's a trigger. Um, different things you could go through a loss and you're grieving and that grief triggers you back. This could be years later. So, I like to tell my women, so I lead a lot of small groups for women who are struggling with sexual issues, sexual sin, specifically a lot of around pornography. And I tell them that like these little, they're just setbacks. It doesn't mean you haven't gone further in your freedom and your healing. It doesn't mean that you're not free and you're forever stuck in your sin. And so one practical example I say to the women is sometimes people like to count their days and like, uh, you know, it's been 20 days since I looked Mm. at porn, 30 days since I looked at porn. And while that might be helpful for some people, I don't know. I find for me and the women in my group that say day 21, you look at porn. It's just such a huge shameful setback where they feel like they have to start over. And I'm like, guys, listen, if, if in that moment you more quickly turn back to Jesus, you more quickly confess, you figure out, Hey, what triggered me? Let's make a game plan so that next time I have a way out that is Mm. further along on your freedom journey. That's not a set. That's not like you're, you've fallen off. Okay. So they're trying really hard to give some advice here and trying to help people. However, Matthias Roberts, who I'm going to remind you, is a very well, is a very well respected psychotherapist who has worked with a hell of a lot of people and done a lot of good in the world. And um, he actually tells a story in his book of some of his pla- past clients doing exactly what Bethany and Joy are telling their audience to do and it not exactly working out for them. And by not exactly working out, I mean causing a crap ton of harm. <laughs> So he tells a story of two men who both confided in each other that they had a problem with masturbation in that they both masturbated and somehow that's a problem. So they talked to each other, they set goals for how long they would each go without masturbating and so on, and for a while it did seem to be working, because Roberts writes, Isaac described how incredible it felt to have a friend he could be open with, and whenever they failed, which they always did, it felt good to not have to carry the shame alone. Good jumping baby. They were trying so hard, so earnestly to live up to a standard that told them to avoid even sexual thoughts. The problem is, this led to them both feeling even more shame than they did before. Now they weren't only feeling shameful about, you know, having sexual thoughts and masturbating, but they were feeling extra shame on top of that for failing. This ended up with one of them who failed less than the other, feeling anger towards the other, feeling superiority over him. And as Robert summarises, neither young man was living in freedom. Shame was ruling every aspect of their sexuality. And we actually see this kind of resentment and more shame coming through as Joy continues to tell her story back over on Bethany's course. My husband, um, he had never struggled with pornography. And so when we were like dating and engaged, I just thought I was the worst sinner than him. I thought I was more sexually broken. Um, I thought, oh, he doesn't have any issues. And then especially when we were struggling with like sexual sin ourselves as a couple, I thought, well, it's my fault because I'm the one who was addicted to porn and he never was. And man, what a burden to place on yourself. Um, And so what really helped me was actually Julie Slattery's book, which I know you interviewed her for this as well. And, And what Julie says is, we are all sexually broken. And when I learned that, I was like, oh, so I'm not more sexually broken than my partner here, my boyfriend. Um, He's just as sexually broken, even though it looks different. That was a game changer for me. This really is so harmful. To go back to Roberts's book, um, he goes on to discuss this saying, we can't just try harder. Trying harder doesn't get us anywhere. In fact, if we continue with this illustration, trying harder actually only propels us further into shame. Anytime we use the tools of control and avoidance to manage anything, especially our sexuality, we end up falling deeper into the muck. He ends by writing that there is a way out of this dilemma, a way across the chasm of shame into a world of sexual freedom that is deeply rooted in our values, whatever they may be. 
The other side of that chasm is a place where we can stand on our values and operate from a sturdy ground of authenticity, not feeling a need to control, avoid, or hide our sexuality. And this is really, really important stuff, and it does concern me why Joy and Bethany aren't focusing on this, but are instead focusing on pushing certain actions which do cause harm. I do have to wonder why they're pushing the exact method that a qualified, respected, successful psychotherapist, not just Matthias Roberts, but others as well, say, this does not work, it causes more harm. Why are they choosing to push that? Is it just that they haven't seen the evidence of the harm? Well, they will have seen the evidence. Maybe they don't believe the evidence of the harm it causes, or maybe they just don't care. Or maybe they're choosing to ignore it because it doesn't fit with their agenda. When it comes to overcoming feelings of shame, especially around sex, it's not just about talking to people about the things that make you feel shame in order to keep suppressing them at all costs, like Bethany and Joy want us to do. And it's not about going the complete opposite way either, which they'll have you believe is the only other option, whereby you throw all boundaries out of the window and shout, I'm shameless, anything goes. Instead, it's about starting to figure out for yourself, well, what are my actual core values? What do I actually think of sex? What do I want from sex? What are my personal boundaries? It's not about living life shamelessly with no boundaries at all. It's about living life without shame with your own personal boundaries. You also have to ask yourself, okay, if I figure out my boundaries now, can I also accept that these boundaries will likely shift and grow and adapt over time? Because as we grow, our needs, our wants, our values, and our boundaries will also grow with us. And once you've figured out that foundation, then you can start to live a life which is, like I say, not shameless, but simply free of shame. This lesson in Bethany's course really is um, an exact, I mean, not literally, but in terms of what the content covers and how it's covered. An exact copy of the lesson with Joy from Bethany's first course. Bethany asks all the same questions, Joy gives all the same answers, even down to telling the same anecdotes. There's nothing really new here, but what is new is my realisation that this is so much worse than I think I realised the first time around. They're not just giving advice and info where you're like, oh well I guess this is kind of not right. They're giving advice and info that other psychotherapists, and just therapists in general, are saying this causes harm. Don't do it. But of course they do keep doing it and they keep trying to justify it with, but the Bible says. Brilliantly though, Matthias Robbers can counter this point too. If you are interested in this, I would recommend going and reading in particular chapter 4 of his book Beyond Shame because it offers a great discussion of what biblical sexuality actually is. Matthias Roberts was raised Christian and I believe to this day is still a Christian and he manages to um, reconcile that with the fact that he is a gay sexually active man and he has helped countless other people who are to varying degrees sexually active and you know all kinds of different people of different genders and sexualities and everything so he actually really does know what he's talking about he kind of unpicks a lot of these passages and quotes that people like Bethany rely on and says well actually let's take a look at what they actually mean in context and how you know the how the bible was written affects them and also what it means for today and what we know about human psychology and what's harmful and what's not harmful turns out it's all way more complicated than bethany ever discusses in this series and honestly the way he really analyzes things in detail i trust his point of view far more than i trust bethany's this lesson then ends with a little bit more upselling and lots of go pay to join Joy's course and groups and books and blah blah blah. <laughs> and then Joy tells us that she still wants to watch porn. In fact, she wanted to watch porn just last night, but she had to fight against it. I'm, I'm talking with you guys, sharing my story, but it's not like I'm this perfect person who is completely free from porn. 
And what I mean by that is like my biggest temptation comes when I can't sleep. That's just always been my biggest trigger. And so last night my kids like were crying and crying and I'm like, I just want to sleep and I couldn't fall asleep. And so that little temptation came into my head of like, oh, well, if you just looked at porn and masturbated, you'd fall right to sleep. Mm -hmm. And like I had to fight against it and I had to pray God take that away and just work through all my different healing um, processes that I've created for myself. And ultimately I didn't turn to it and I praise God for that. But like, guys, this is it just comes back at us. Satan doesn't want us to have victory. He doesn't want us to live in freedom. And so that's why being in community and having uh, all these people who are cheering you on and praying with you is so important in your freedom journey. So it really sounds like a miserable life, if I'm being honest. Joy then tells people to go buy her book study packs, which are basically just, you get sent a book and then 12 of you, like all just random people to get together on a Zoom chat one evening and discuss it. So you get a book and like an hour on Zoom with 12 strangers and this costs 40 quid. Some of these go up to 72 quid. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Talk about money grabbing. Yeah, money grabbing, not mummy grabbing. Oh, careful. Can you see the beam? Oh, absolute rip off, mate. Okay, let's move on to the next lesson in which the other half of Girl Defined, Kristen, tells us all about masturbation. Cover your ears, young one. Cover your ears. So this lesson, Lesson 5, is titled Finding Freedom from Porn, Erotica and Masturbation. And once again, Bethany is showing her laziness because unlike all the other sessions, this lesson doesn't actually have a proper thumbnail image. Instead, she just uses like a random still from the video in which she's there looking lovely and Kristen is in a really, really awkward pose with like her mouth open and she's looking a bit gormless and like, I can't help but think this was done on purpose as some sort of like petty sibling rivalry slash jealousy thing because we know what these two sisters are like together. You've got a lot to say today, Grumble Pig. You do. You do. Do you mind if I just move the microphone a little bit away from you? I know people love your grumbles, but for some people it's a little loud. Is that okay? You're being such a good girl, aren't you? You've just got a lot to talk about. You have a lot of opinions. You do love them. Like, this isn't even the first frame of the video, so I feel like... Did Bethany purposely pick this out to make Kristen look bad? I just... I don't know. Anyway. I'm also very confused why this session was recorded over Zoom like all the others when they like literally live in the, live in the same town, don't they? Very odd. It's a choice, but there we go. Once again, they open by promoting their book and telling people to go give them more money because this course is literally just upselling. What's up, y'all? Welcome back to session number five. And this one is extra special because a lot of you have probably seen Kristen and I together on Girl Defined and we do our podcast together and our videos together, but you've probably never seen me interview her. And so this is really exciting because Kristen has been super open with her own journey. And also we've written a book together on this topic and she has kind of become an expert in this area of helping people find freedom. So Kristen, welcome to the singles course. <laughs> it's going to be amazing though, because these single women who are here, they have been so brave to join this course because a lot of people have been like, why are you doing a course on sexuality and intimacy for single women? And they've shown up and been like, Hey, we're sexual beings. Like we have struggles. If, if, if like older Christian women or Christian peers, aren't going to help us. Like, what are we supposed to do? Turn to Google? Yeah. Like, that's not a great solution. And I know we've felt that in our own ministry, Girl Defined. And that's one of the reasons we wrote Sex, Purity, and the Longings of a Girl's Heart. So girls, if you haven't grabbed that book, you know I've recommended it. You need to grab it. Yes. Uh, but let's re Bethany then asks her sister, who she literally grew up with, what her upbringing was like. We've literally heard about Bethany's upbringing, like, four times already in this series, and now we're getting the same story from her sister. Because why not, right? Why not waste more time? Let me rewind really quick, Kristen, before we get into kind of like your, you know, mid-teen years, 
rewind and take us back to growing up. What was, what were your thoughts on sexuality? Did you have, what was like your upbringing like with that? I kind of want everyone to set the stage before they get into more of their story. Yeah. So like you grew up in a Christian family with parents who loved Jesus. They were first generation Christians. So they were still learning so much themselves of like how to raise Christian children, discipleship, all of that was brand new. And I remember from a really young age having questions about my sexuality. I don't think I really knew I was having questions about my sexuality. It's just, you know, you're a kid, you're curious. You, you know, you have parts, you see boys and you know, they have different parts and you're like, what does all this mean? How does all this work together? You hear, you know, the, the hush hush word sex every now and then mentioned, or you yeah. see it on a magazine and you're kind of like, what is that? It's like this big thing, but you don't really know. And so in our family, I would say that our parents were very well intentioned. They loved us. They, they were intentional in many ways to disciple us. But I think for that generation in general, there was just a little bit of one, they were not discipled yeah. in God's design for sexuality. It was very much a hush hush conversation in their growing up life. And so they, for so many of that generation, kind of took that into their own parenting. And it was a little bit of a hush-hush for them toward their children. So I think growing up, I know you feel similarly, it wasn't really an open conversation. It wasn't something talked about regularly. So I felt a little bit like I had a lot of questions and I wasn't really sure where to go for answers. Google didn't really exist yet, I don't think. (laughs) Smartphones, tablets. So it was just kind of like this big mystery. And you know, looking back, I just wish so bad that I had had more answers. Mm. But I didn't. And as I faced some of my struggles, which I know we're going to get into with lust and masturbation, um, I I didn't understand what was going on. And I just felt a lot of shame and I didn't know how to find answers or how to find freedom. Mm -hmm. And here we have that topic of shame coming back up again in response to purity culture, almost like a pattern, a causal link, perhaps. What? I wished I would have had a lot of this teaching like before marriage. And I know I did by doing a lot of research into sex purity longings, but having a community, an open community like this, like when you're still single, like the earlier on you can get this kind of teaching and these sorts of conversations, the better. I agree. But hearing this coming from the same people who say we need to shelter all kids and teens from even knowing gay people exist is kind of ridiculous. I've said it before and I will say it again. Um, I will always be an advocate for kids and teens appropriately learning about their bodies and sex. I think it's a really important thing for them to learn about. It just has to be done appropriately. And you're going to say fair. Oh, did you just lick Tommy's paw? You are so cute. So entering my teen years, those early teen years, actually, this was my struggle was even before that. So just naturally, as a young girl, young woman, exploring my body, figuring things out and going, oh, wow, this feels really good. So masturbation became a habitual habit for me. And at the time, I honestly was so naive. I didn't even know it was something sexual. Like I had no Mm. idea what it was and I just had no context for it. I just thought, wow, this is interesting. This feels really good. I thought maybe I had discovered something that the world didn't really know about. And so as I got older, I started, you know, reading books, some books on just biblical womanhood, biblical sexuality, and started getting glimpses of like, wait a minute, this is actually a thing and it has a name and I've been struggling and oh, other people struggle. Oh, this is like something people talk about. Like I had no idea. It honestly blew my socks off. And so my struggle persisted though. And I was just so ashamed. Now this I found very, very interesting because notice how Kristen didn't feel any shame until she was taught about masturbation from a biblical perspective. That's because masturbation itself isn't a good or bad thing. It's a neutral thing. It is a neutral action. It is neither morally good nor bad. It is very natural. It is found across many, many different animal species. It's found in every human culture and time period. And it's actually something which is very normal as part of childhood development. It's not just found in adults, but in people of all ages. There is absolutely no good reason for the shame and stigma surrounding masturbation. Is that? No. In Rebecca Chalker's book, The Clitoral Truth, which I think I've referenced in other videos before and it's great, you should give it a read, she writes that masturbation is as old as life itself and it appears to be innate. She then quotes a report from the American Journal of Obstet Tricks and Gynecology. I find that word very hard to say, Ob- obstetrics. <laughs> Um, she says, or rather the report she's quoting says, we recently observed a female fetus at 32 weeks gestation touching the vulva with fingers of her right hand. The caressing movement was centered primarily on the region of the clitoris. 
movement stopped after 30 to 40 seconds and started again a few moments later. The report literally goes on to describe witnessing fetal masturbation and orgasm. In other studies, uh, male fetuses have repeatedly been seen to have erections and to touch them. Chalker goes on to write that babies as young as three or four months old have been reported to masturbate, and certainly many young children do. Uh, Vic Lou also weighs in on this, adding that for them, masturbation is about sex. It isn't a sexual thing at all. In fact, it's more sensual, sensational. It's a pure exploration of the relationship between their physical bodies and their emotional experiences, another way of learning about themselves. These physical responses are a really normal part of human development and understanding our human body. As long as as children we're allowed to explore them ourselves in a private, safe environment, there's nothing wrong with it. It is a part of development and figuring out who we are and learning about ourselves and being a part of the world around us. I'd be really interested to see how Bethany and Kristen respond to hearing this sort of thing, because like, what are they going to try and do? Claim a fetus is sinning? That'd be ridiculous! They might still do it. <laughs> there is actually a hell of a lot of research that has been done into the subject of masturbation and trying to understand how it became so taboo in society. Rebecca Chalker goes on to talk about it a little bit. She says that while a little of the whole taboo-ness, if you can call that word, originated in ancient China, the bulk of shame came from, and I quote, the 6th century CE, when the Catholic Church decreed that any sex that was not in the service of reproduction was sinful, and instituted a vigorous campaign to prevent alternative uses. People were expected to obey this restriction, to confess if they didn't, and to endure specific punishments meted out by confessors. Sound familiar? Both Chalker and the historian Tom Lacker write of a book which started mass fear around masturbation in England with a very, very long title, Onania, or The Heinous Sin of Self-Pollution and All Its Frightful Consequences in Both Sexes Considered with Physical and Spiritual Advice to Those Who Have Already Injured Themselves by This Abominable Practice and Seasonable Admonition of the Youth of the Nation of Both Sexes and Those Whose Tuition They Are Under, Whether Parents, Guardians, Masters, or Mistresses. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> Apparently, the author of this book wanted to publish his own warnings about the moral and physical dangers of the abominable practice of self-pollution, accompanied by translations of various eminent physicians' prescriptions for cures to the ills that it caused. But really, it was just written by some guy who wanted to sell what Thomas Lacker describes as quack medicine. And in the end, this book ended up kind of just being passed around between people with a little bit of a wink and a nudge and treated as softcore porn. So. Yeah. Interesting. Dr. Jolene Brighton brings up another example in her book, Is This Normal?, which I'm going to talk about in a bit more detail in just a little bit, and she writes that in 1816, French psychiatrist Jean-Étienne Escarole wrote with certainty that masturbation is recognised in all countries as a common cause of insanity. The only insane thing here is that it took until 1968 for masturbation to be removed from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM, as a diagnosable condition. Seriously. Like, you heard that right. Brighton just told us that up until 1968, so my dad was already 18 at that point, like, that's how recent this was, masturbation was in the DSM as a diagnosable condition. Ridiculous, right? We of course know all this to be nonsense, right? So why did the myth continue? Why do people like Kristen and Bethany keep perpetuating the idea that masturbation is inherently morally bad and wrong and harmful? The other major thing I think is important to bring up here before we continue on is that once again, Bethany, and in this case Kristen as well, are not defining any of the terms they're using. This is a lesson primarily about masturbation, but what is masturbation? We all kind of think we might know, but if you had to define it, how would you? Don't worry, you don't actually have to answer that. Rebecca Chalker has an answer for us. She writes, Masturbation is defined as any kind of sexual stimulation that does not include coitus. That means touching oneself on the breast, genitals, or any other part of the body in a way that is intended to elicit sexual feelings or sensations. To keep masturbation interesting, people not only use hands, vibrators, dildos, or other sex toys, but an astounding variety of objects, including feathers, rubber gloves, whipped cream, and other foodstuffs. 
cat and nine tails, even whips and instruments and apparatus traditionally used in S&M games. There's also mutual masturbation in which couples stimulate each other with or without having intercourse. What does this mean for lesbians who have very real and sexually rewarding experiences? Or for gay men or even heterosexual couples who do everything but put a penis in a vagina or anus? Aren't they having sex? Perhaps there's no such thing as masturbation, just sex with or without intercourse. Which brings me to a very, very interesting point, or at least a point that I find interesting. If masturbation by this and many other definitions is any kind of touching with intent to sexually excite someone without penis in vagina penetration, then how do Kristen and Bethany feel about things like touching yourself during sex with your husband? How do they feel about using hands and other body parts during sex with their husbands? Or are they just against sexual touching when they're alone? And if this is true, then what about when in the marriage course, Bethany and one of her guests encourage people to try self-cultivation? <coughs> Masturbation. <coughs> Apparently you need to self-cultivate in order to teach your husband what you like and better understand your body. That is, Bethany, in her last course, literally encouraged women to masturbate while they're married so they can have better sex with their husbands. So here's the breakdown is that we spend a lot of years believing that masturbation is wrong. And so any self-touching is wrong. Don't do it. And there yeah. is no scripture A that says masturbation is wrong. However, there are lots of reasons to be very cautious about what it is to be involved in that act. And so that is for another conversation. But I think self-cultivation is what I like to call it is different than masturbation. Masturbation is touching for like for stimulus and for orgasm by yourself, for yourself in a secretive, isolated way. Self-cultivation is a way to get to know your feminine body so that A, you love it and you think it's good and you like it and you're comfortable with it and you are aware of it and you're educated about what is where and what is down there. I had no education about my body, no idea what was down there. I mean, I hear a lot of women get married. They're like, I didn't know I had a clitoris. The husband yeah. doesn't know. And so if you don't know about your body, it's hard to be able to share your body. It's kind of like you have a really special gift, but it just stays in the corner and you never even opened it. And so you can't really share it with anyone because you were too scared of it. Mm -hmm. And your body is a gift and God has given it to us and we don't have to be scared of it. And so self-cultivation is simply just kind of like self-education. You can think of it that way, getting to know your body. You can touch yourself down there in order to be like, okay, this stroke, this way feels good. And then the point is then you go teach your husband. So what does this mean for this course now where Bethany and Kristen are saying that masturbation is inherently wrong in all cases? This is why Kristen and Bethany need to define their terms if they're teaching a lesson on an educational course because otherwise you just get these very, very confusing, unclear questions and things and it, oh, boo them, boo both of them. <sighs> Let's watch more of their terrible lesson. Um, for me, my struggle with masturbation was very much lust-fueled, fantasy-driven. Mm. Um, my heart was just fueled with a lot of impure thoughts, imaginations, you know, things maybe I had seen glimpses of and I would just kind of extrapolate on those in my mind. And so it was definitely not a pure act that I was engaging in. Um, and so for me, there was just a lot of shame in that in mm -hmm. realizing like, wow, I have lust in my heart and I confess it to God, but then I continue to struggle and I was too ashamed to tell anyone. I didn't even know who to tell. So here they're very clearly stating that the problem is women or just people in general having lustful thoughts outside of marriage. That's the sin. They're literally placing these boundaries and restrictions on what is a fundamental part of being human. They're saying it is bad to feel desire, it is bad to want pleasure, it is bad to be attracted to even a fictional person or scenario. And remember that this whole narrative that our basic fundamental physical and sexual desires and drives are bad is unhealthy. It causes so much shame which harms us so much. Remember what Matthias Roberts wrote earlier, if our sexual drives are bad, and if we find we can't control them, and we can't, then there must be something fundamentally wrong with us. Shame runs freely in these spaces, and things get incredibly unhealthy quickly. And once again, this is what Kristen and Bethany are encouraging. They are basically saying that there is inherent shame in being human, in being animals, in being. Now again, we cannot ignore that not everyone has 
these desires and urges, but it is important to remember that whether you do or you don't, it is normal, it is natural, it is healthy, it's a part of who you are and it's not something that needs changing or controlling or restricting. Yeah, for so many women listening, I know you can relate to this struggle of feeling like you're on an island and the mm. longer you struggle with something and you don't bring it into the light, like for me, the harder and harder it is to do, right? Because then it's like, oh my goodness, I've been struggling with this for years. Yes. How can I tell anyone? What are they going to think of me? How do I even bring this up? It just feels so awkward. It feels so weird. Now, this is something I found very interesting because I don't know if you guys noticed this, but um, did you notice that both Joy and Kristen use the exact same language and analogies when talking about this? Yeah? This whole island, boat, blah blah blah, like they both use the same ones. And let's just be real for a moment, the last lesson was meant to be about healing from sexual trauma, but instead it was all, putting your masturbation in bad, and then this lesson is all, putting your masturbation in bad, it's exactly the same. These two lessons could have just been one for all they cover. There is so much repetition on this course, and it's boring, and it's unhelpful, and it's a waste of time and money. Kristen then goes on to talk about how we need community for accountability, which again is exactly what we saw in the last session with Joy, and it's what we saw uh, Matthias Roberts as well says leads to resentment and more shame and more suffering. So. Both Joy and Kristen and Bethany, or rather all three of them, are all promoting something that is literally harmful. Kristen then tells us that we need to be careful when we confess our masturbation sins to not confess them to a man. I think the implication being that if a woman says, I masturbate, then that's gonna cause some man to have lustful thoughts and he won't be able to control himself and then you're causing him to sin, I guess. I know. Well, the enemy wants to keep us trapped in, trapped in privacy and secrecy. He wants us to feel like we're on an island alone, surrounded by the ocean, that there's no way out. There's no lifeboat. There's no way we could get help. But that's just not true. We have to take sometimes scary steps of confession in order to break the silence, mm -hmm. break the darkness, and then get on a path toward freedom. And so that was 100% true for me. So you don't just run out and confess it to any random person. You want to be really intentional yeah. to make sure, one, that if it's not your parents, that it's a trusted woman. I don't think it's a wise idea to go confess such a personal, intimate struggle to a man. I think it's much wiser to go to a godly yeah. woman. I will not comment. I will not comment. They then upsell their guide on masturbation PDF, which is not as fun as it sounds, trust me. Um, and guess how much they're charging for a couple of pages of printed nonsense, like a handful of pages. Eight quid. Eight quid. That's more than you pay for the average book. That's half a bottle of decent wine at my local bars or like Wednesday wine night. That's, that's a multi-pack of balls for Kubi. That's a, what can we get you for eight quid, baby? That's a very fancy steak for her. Yeah. But seriously though, like, take the average, well actually, I know books seem to be a little bit more expensive in America, I've noticed that, but in the UK, I'd say that your average paperback book costs about, what, six quid? Maybe up to a tenner if you're buying it from a fancy bookshop? You know, and those are books that are well-written, well-researched, well edited and generally all the work is done by people who actually know what they're talking about so you could pay less money and get a better proper two to three hundred page book instead of Kristen and Bethany's like little what ten page pdf screw that <laughs> if you do want a better way to spend your money then I really recommend the fantastic book come as you are by Emily Nagoski we mentioned it earlier it's great it talks you through the science of female anatomy, desire, sexuality, all the fun stuff, and most importantly, it talks about how understanding all of that stuff can benefit you in actual real life and your sexual relationships with both yourself and other people. Very, very useful. There's also the Come As You Are workbook, which is a great resource to use alongside that book or after you've read it, really recommend that as well. Alternatively, there's uh, Dr. Jolene Brighton's book, Is This Normal? Judgment Free Straight Talk About Your Body. It's a great resource for telling you everything about those of you who are assigned female at birth, need to know about your bodies, and has a great chapter titled, Is Masturbation Normal? And spoiler, it is. And hey, it turns out that while masturbation was removed from the DSM in 1968, in 1972, the American Medical Association 
finally recognised it as officially normal. I know! <laughs> Dr. Brighton goes on to list the many, many, many health benefits of masturbation. Dr. Brighton writes of masturbation that it can help reduce stress, improve how long and well you sleep, boost your mood, increase your self-esteem, improve your body image, ease menstrual cramps, relieve headaches, decrease pain and strengthen the muscles in and around your pelvic floor. Rebecca Chalker added even more to this conversation when she pointed out that numerous studies have shown that for many women, masturbation results in orgasm more reliably than does intercourse, and typically it produces stronger orgasms to boot. It can also help you discover the type of stimulation you like best. You're, you're in complete control of the amount and type of stimulation that you prefer. You don't need contraception or STD protection. It's sex when you want it, which is great because Sexual activity produces a natural opiate, endorphins, as well as hormones that can enhance mood and increase a sense of well-being. And it's not just an entirely solo or selfish thing, as Chris and Bethany might say, either, because as Chalker points out, some people masturbate to increase their desire for sex. So there you go, some good books there, give them a read, they're a much better use of your money than any girl-defined PDF. However, Bethany goes on to say she wants us to throw out anything, anything that encourages romance, such as books or magazines. Seriously. Uh -huh. And no matter what you're struggling with, the guide on masturbation, it offers you like such good practical biblical steps. So even if you're like, but I'm struggling with erotica or I'm struggling with porn, the guide on masturbation kind of helps with all of that just because the biblical principles and the steps to freedom are very similar. And I realized after a while, like, wow, the books that I began to start reading and enjoying became very much like they were kind of like Christian romance novels and they kind of progressed mm -hmm. from there. And I think they were, you know, some would call it like, I don't know, soft mommy porn or something like kind of, you know, these books that really they, as a single woman, they weren't fueling pure thoughts in my mind. They weren't really pushing me in a good direction. They were just kind of fueling this, a lot of discontentment and a lot of just like, oh, where, you know, imagining what if this were my life? And it just wasn't a healthy place for me. And I remember one time getting a big black garbage bag, do yourself mm -hmm. a favor and just get rid of that. So can you give yeah. us some other, like, okay, the black garbage bag, they could throw stuff away. What are some other just practical things that they can do that maybe you did? Yeah, well, you named, all of those things you named are a great one. Going through your social media, I would say is one of the biggest nowadays because back then, you know, we would talk about magazines and like, it's like, do people even read magazines anymore? I don't even know, but we know we're on our phone and statistics show that we are on our phone a lot, especially our generation and younger. We are glued to our phone. We spent hours on social media, scrolling mindlessly, getting stuck in all these rabbit holes of content. And so that is one of the biggest places I think today that yeah. we are finding ourselves trapped without even realizing it because it's just what everyone does. It's just so natural. And so I would encourage you to specifically take inventory of what is happening on your phone, what kind of content you're scrolling through, what kind of content you're looking through. Um, and, and then in tandem with that, I would say the other huge thing that is all the rage today is just binging shows on Netflix, yes. on Apple TV, you know, whatever it is, yes. the binging and just like a Friday night, like I'm going to watch half the series. And there are so many fun things. My husband and I love, you know, shows and enjoying things together, but we have to be careful because what used to be considered scandalous and like X-rated is now seeping into all mainstream content yeah, shows that are considered just mainstream shows that everybody's watching have so many sex scenes, so much raunch, so much yeah. nudity. And it's just like, oh yeah, True. I love that show. That's a great show. Everyone's watching it. Like, wait, we're all just watching like nude people have sex all yeah. the time. Like this used to not be such a normal thing. And Mm -hmm. And I was looking on our website, girldefined.com, because I just want to make sure y'all know of the resources there. Because I know for me, when I hear about something and I want to start taking, like, I'm like, okay, I'm feeling brave. I feel like I'm in the midst of this conversation. I want to take that next step now. It can be helpful to like access resources now. So I know mm -hmm. like with the book, Sex, Purity, and the Longings of Girls Heart, you're like, that's great, but it might not come in for a few days. I need something now. So on the girl, so if you go to girldefined.com slash shop, and I'll link up below, we have Finding Freedom for Masturbation, a PDF that you can download. And that is one of our best-selling PDFs. So no, you're not alone and needing that. We have another PDF, Five Strategies to Find Freedom from Sexual Sin. That's something you can get right now. Again, I'll link that for you. And then another one that I think would be super helpful, Battling Sexual Temptation. So we have those three PDFs that you can choose from and access right now. And within those, you'll get a battle plan, direction, mm -hmm. scripture that you can take and say, hey, I can start working on this right away. Again, it's crazy that Bethany is just using this course to upsell everything else. She's like, go buy our other resources because they contain this and this and this. All the stuff that I advertise is on this course, but isn't on this course because I'm just using this course to sell you more stuff. 
Do you think if I went and like bought their PDFs and books it would just upsell more things to me and I have to go and buy them and then they tell me to buy something else and then they tell me to go buy something else and then they tell me to go buy Bethany Beale's sex course and I buy Bethany Beale's sex course and it would tell me to go buy something else and then I did conquer my struggle of masturbation, I would say like my later teens, and and I did believe the lie that once I got married, you know, like, Lord, please help me get married one day. Like, I was just so hopeful to get married and like, don't, you know, I hope the rapture doesn't come before I get yes. married. Like, random thoughts like that. Like, I was just so hopeful for that and thinking that when I get married, all of my sexual dreams will come true, will be perfect, blissful, will have no problems. And, you know, I'll never struggle with any of these like lustful thoughts again wrong. Um, yeah. Getting married was a wonderful and beautiful gift. And sex with a marriage has been an amazing, wonderful thing. There has been a lot of like journeying even in that with my husband, yeah. a lot of ups and downs. But one of the things that really surprised me that I was not expecting was that once I was married, my struggle with not masturbation per se, but with allowing all of those fantasies that mm -hmm. had fueled masturbation in singleness were starting to come back into my mind like a hundred miles per hour in my mm -hmm. marriage. And I remember having moments of beautiful intimacy with my husband and then being bombarded by all of yeah. these thoughts that I had allowed to train my mind to stimulate my body with in my yeah. singleness, they were coming at me. And I'm like trying to battle these tempting thoughts. Like that's, I don't want this in my marriage bed. These thoughts, these fantasies about other people, other situations, yeah. that is not bringing holiness into my marriage bed right now. I know this isn't honoring my husband or God. Mm -hmm. And so I remember having to battle with this for years. Yeah, Kristen, it sounds like your sex life is super beautiful and fulfilling when you can't stop thinking of other people. <laughs> oh, her poor husband. But no, seriously, um, sexual fantasies, again, are normal. It's okay, everyone has them. And yeah, occasionally people's minds wander during sex with a partner. That's pretty normal and natural, don't worry about it. But, in my non-expert opinion, I would say if you find you're with your partner and you're regularly thinking about other people more than you're enjoying the moment and thinking about your par partner and what's happening there and then, then that doesn't really say good things about your relationship and your sex life. And that's maybe something you want to think about and figure out why you're thinking of other people and scenarios so often. And maybe that's something you could discuss with your partner and try to sort out between you, you know? I just, I can't get behind this whole sex is always a battle narrative because it just sounds so unhealthy and misery inducing. I cannot imagine how exhausting it must be to live that way. Godly single men live in the same world that we do and they're bombarded by all these, you know, movies and, you know, all the stuff, the internet. And it can just sometimes feel like, okay, how do I approach dating? Because we have a lot of single ladies looking to date um, in such a pornographic world. And yeah. like, when do we bring up those conversations? What if a guy, you find out you're dating him and you're like, he is struggling with porn. I mean, this isn't a core part of this conversation, but just mm -hmm. give us like a little bit of direction, maybe even a resource, um, just because I know that's going to come up in there as they're watching this. Yes. Oh, like why? I'm so mad at pornography. <laughs> it's I know. Destroying so many lives under the guise of being this like sexual freedom, yeah. pleasurable act, but it is just destroying so many people. Um, so it's just so sad, but it is true that women struggle with pornography, men struggle with pornography. Um, the numbers are still higher for men, but a lot of women struggle as well. But as you think about dating, um, I think it is so important to realize that because it is such a dominant struggle amongst people everywhere and especially high numbers with men to not mm. assume going into a relationship that that struggle isn't present. You don't also have to assume that it is, yeah. but that's why asking good questions early on in the relationship will reveal what's really going on. We have yeah. an amazing resource again at Girl Define that we just released. Um, it is a question box that is incredible. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think 170 questions. Is that yeah. how many it is now? 170 questions. 170 questions. Mm -hmm. And it is the cutest little box. It's like a physical box that has all these little cards in it. Oh, and it's cute. something that, oh, there it is, a little picture. This is an it is amazing a brand new release. Oh, look, again, more upselling. This time they want you to go and buy their 12 pound question box to take on a first date. <sighs> I love this stuff on their website. Uh, this box of cards includes questions like, how important is it to be part of a small accountability slash support group? What is your view of debt? What do you tend to do in your spare time? Are you a virgin? If not, please explain. What is your attitude towards pets? Indoor? Outdoor? 
gonna say now, if you need a box of cards to ask each other these basic questions on a first date, then are you sure you're ready for dating? But hey, if you don't want to buy a £12 box of cards, then you can buy another overpriced PDF instead with all the same questions on, but just printed out on like three pages or something. That's also eight quid like most of their PDFs. Here we can actually get a preview of more of their groundbreaking questions, such as, is there anything you would like to know about me? What are your favourite sources of news? What is your involvement in sports? And of course, what are your thoughts on alternative medicine? And what are your thoughts on immunisations? You know, actually the last one I get, because I went on this date once and the guy turned out to be an anti-vaxxer and I cried and the bartender gave me a free shot. Yeah, that's actually probably a good one to ask. <laughs> I wish I was joking, that actually happened. <laughs> worst day ever. Actually, no, that's the worst thing. It wasn't even the worst day ever. It was quite nice up until that point. Um, I just want to wrap it up here and end on a word about the heart and about just like worship mm -hmm. because we can do all the right actions, but I know it really comes down to the heart and like having a true heart of worship before God. So can you just close us out and give us just a picture of what, like, I don't know what, how true freedom is found in having a genuine heart mm -hmm. of worship. Yeah. Well, you know, the old saying goes, some saying it's like, you can't, you can't worship God and worship something else at the same time, yeah. right? Like you can only fully and truly worship one or the other. And so if our hearts are fueled by lust, you know, driven by sin constantly, that's what we're engaging in. We're not even trying to battle. Then the true worship of our heart is not going yeah. to be centered on the Lord. It's not going to be centered on his glory. Blech. And then they just end with a prayer and that's it. Nothing new. Great. Again, I feel like a course about sexuality that has a session on masturbation could actually be really useful and helpful. However, if I was making a sex course like this, the topics I'd want to cover in an episode like this would include things like discussing the differences and similarities between solo and partnered sex, how to make sure you're staying safe, so this includes things like encouraging lube when you need it, making sure you keep any toys you're using clean and how to do that, not using items which weren't specifically designed to be sex toys internally because that's how a lot of people end up in A&E and, &E. and making sure you're using the right lube with the right toys because you know if they're made of certain things and you're using for example like a silicon based juice it can cause damage and irritation and all sorts of things like that damage to both the toy and you so it's important to know what you're using and what everything is made of I also think they should cover topics like talking about the variations in how often people do or do not masturbate, talk about how there's lots of different kinds of normal, and there's no one right or wrong way to do things, or no one right or wrong frequency to do things, um, talk about how to overcome the shame and stigma society has made us feel about such a normal and natural act. I'd like them to talk more on the physical and sexual health benefits of masturbation. I also think it would be really important to discuss the pleasure gap amongst the disabled community and how to fix it because I think this is a topic that is really, really important but not talked about enough. So according to Dr. Brighton, some surveys suggest that 56% of disabled people reported difficulty self-pleasuring with 63% citing hand limitations as a primary challenge. And don't forget people with invisible disabilities are affected too. You can you also have to take into account things like people who have chronic pain issues. Um, for them, sometimes masturbation is physically impossible because of the pain they're feeling. There are, however, solutions, but we don't get those solutions unless we talk about the problem. So for example, there are some companies that make sex toys specifically for people with disabilities to give them an extra helping hand, if you pardon the pun, which I think is wonderful and something which not enough people know about. Again, I think talking about this stuff is something we need to normalise. And finally, I think it's really important to talk about the topic of masturbation in regards to transgender people. There's a really great chapter on this in the book Bang! Masturbation for People of All Genders by Vic Liu, which talks about how to navigate self-pleasure while potentially feeling dysphoria. It talks about the changes your bodies go through when you start taking hormones and how that affects your relationship with yourself and how you can or may want to self-pleasure yourself in those cases. It talks about what those changes in hormones mean for sex with other people as well as with yourself. Again, something which isn't spoken about enough but that I think is a really useful and important topic. So there you go and that's just like a brief overview of things that I would want to be included but which aren't. There are actually so many more topics that could be talked about and Kristen and Bethany just refuse to and I think that's a real shame. But with that, let's move on to the next session. Session 6 is titled Compatibility, Virginity and the Wedding Night. 
So this lesson features Carissa King and hey, look, we're back to properly made thumbnails. Isn't it crazy how Bethany only missed that for the one sister that she's known to be jealous of? Hmm. Okay, based on the title of this lesson, I have thoughts. <laughs> Let's start with them. Yes, compatibility is a huge topic and absolutely should be discussed. I always say it is better to be happy alone than with the wrong person, so I fully support this topic and I think there's a hell of a lot to talk about in it. On the topic of virginity, again, I am a full well, I've said this before, but virginity is a social construct and I'm a little dubious about the way they're going to talk about it. I'm a little dubious about the way people in general talk about it. I have a lot of thoughts. Um, I actually, I went back and found all my old videos and to paraphrase myself when talking about virginity, so uh, if you'll let me just quote me, <laughs> there's no objective definition of loss of virginity from a biological or physiological perspective. There's no obvious physical change for males after they've had sex for the first time, and there's no universal physical change for all females after they've had sex for the first time. The idea that hymens break after you've had sex is an outdated one. All hymens are different. Different shapes, different sizes, different placements, different levels of stretchiness. Some do break or tear or change via activities like sex or activities other than sex. Some hymens will never break or tear no matter how many times you have sex or do any other activities. If you are interested in finding out a little bit more about this, then I recommend Flo Perry's book, How to Have Feminist Sex, which is great. It's cute, it's short, it's fun, it's accessible, it's got some beautiful artwork in it, and it's a really, really great little resource. Otherwise, there's a great section in Emily Nagoski's Come As You Are, where she writes, you may or may not have a hymen, which is a thin membrane along the lower edge of your vaginal opening. She goes on to say the hymen doesn't break or stay broken forever, like some kind of freshness seal. If a hymen tears or bruises, it heals, and the size of a hymen doesn't vary depending on whether a vagina has been penetrated. Also, it doesn't usually bleed. Any blood with first penetration is more likely due to general vaginal tearing from lack of lubrication than damage to the hymen. She's a, she goes on to say, what does change when a woman begins having the hymen stretch regularly is that it grows more flexible. And as a woman's hormones change as she approaches the end of adolescence around 25 years old, the hymen is likely to atrophy and become much less noticeable, if it was noticeable at all. There's a massive variation in how hymens can look and act and feel and where they're placed. There's not just one way to have a hymen. This is what I mean, it's not a universal thing. Again, to quote Nagoski, some women are born without hymens, others have imperforate hymens, a thin but solid membrane covering all of the vaginal op opening, or microperforate hymens, many tiny holes in an otherwise solid membrane. Some women have septic hymens, which feel like a strand of skin stretching, stretching across the mouth of the vagina. Some women's hymens are durable, others are fragile. Some disappear early in adolescence, some are still evident past menopause. So to look back at this in the context of virginity, if it's not defined by something physical and biological, then we can say the only way it's actually defined is by society, and those definitions can change with time and place and culture. Therefore, it's a social construct. Traditional ideas of virginity are so narrow that most people only ever think about intercourse where a penis penetrates a vagina as being real sex where you can lose your virginity. But these traditional definitions of virginity don't take into account other ways to have sex. They don't take into account same-sex couples. They don't take into account how it differs for different people with different preferences. Is loss of virginity really about just having or putting a penis in a vagina? Or is there more to it than that? Can a gay man or woman never really have sex if they never have a penis put in their vagina or never put their penis in a vagina? Even if they're regularly having sex with other women or anal sex with other men. In terms of both genders, where does anal sex fall into this discussion? If you're a woman who has had anal sex but not vaginal, are you a virgin or not? What about oral sex? What about touching each other with hands? If so, where on the body? Do orgasms come into the definition of all? And ultimately, we have to ask, why does it matter? Why do we need to talk about virginity at all? Why do we put value on virginity? And maybe we should stop. As Ricky Bergen writes, virginity has been used as a marker of purity and morality, but neither of these virtues were necessarily strictly about the girl in question. 
They go on to discuss how a sexually active girl was seen as a disappointment to her family and as a sign that her father couldn't control her. And let's be honest, the idea that a person lacks morality if they've had penetrative sex is so bizarre and unfounded, right? <laughs> I think instead of considering things in terms of am I a virgin or am I not a virgin, we should be looking at more important questions and considering them for ourselves and our own lives. For example, am I ready to be emotionally and physically intimate with someone? What does that really mean? What are my boundaries? What would I like to try? What would I like to wait to try? What would I never like to do? Is this the right person to do this with? Do I have a time frame in mind for when I'd like this to happen? Can I effectively and safely communicate my needs to this person? Can they effectively and safely communicate their needs to me? Have we discussed consent and boundaries? Are we being safe? Are we using condoms? Are we using other contraception? Have we had STI tests before being intimate? Have we discussed these things at all? And after a sexual experience, you might want to ask yourself, well, how do I feel now? Am I sexually satisfied? Do I still feel safe? Do I still feel comfortable? What did I like? What didn't I like? Is there anything I wish went differently? And so on. And the important thing about these questions is that these aren't ones you just ask the first time you ever have sex. These are the kinds of questions you can keep coming back to with every single sexual experience and every single sexual partner. If you look at sex this way of always asking, is this the right person? Am I feeling safe doing this? Am I comfortable doing this? Have we discussed these important boundaries and safety issues and so on? Then that's going to be far more, I guess, useful to you and your partner than just, am I a virgin or not, you know? And finally, to go back to the video title on the topic of the wedding night, I think they mean the first time having sex, which again, I think is something worth talking about and preparing people for but I extend that to include all forms of physical intimacy, so not just the first time you have sex, but the first time you're emotionally or physically intimate with someone. Let's talk about how do you get ready for that, how do you know you're ready, how do you prepare for that, and so on. And again, I think it's worth noting that this should be something you do when you're ready to do it, not when society says you should be ready. So yeah, now my opening thoughts. Do I talk too much? Absolutely. Is there anything we can do about that now? potentially delete all my footage, but I'm probably not going to do that. So let's move on. I want to just, you know, tell the girls who are watching right now, the young women who are watching about that, because I know a lot of them are hoping one day that they'll, if they're not already dating, that they will be dating and really hoping to get to marriage soon. That's kind of the phase of life that they're all in. So they hear dear young married couple and they're like, yes, please. I want to be a dear young married couple. So I'm not. Anyway, now we get into the sales pitch again. I, again, I can't believe I'm paying for this. I'm paying to be advertised to. <laughs> what am I doing with my life? If I donated one pound of my own money to Refuge every time Bethany and her guests try to upsell me something in this course, I would be bankrupt by the end of it. <laughs> oh yeah, so many wonderful things to look forward to. And I am gonna link all of that girls in your workbook. And I think it's really important for single women to get answers to their questions. Cause if we as Christians and women who are a little bit older than them don't, aren't willing to open up and share, you know, they're going to turn to Google and who knows where they'll end up. So one yes. of the biggest questions I get from single women is about compatibility, sexual compatibility. How important <laughs> is sexual compatibility in a marriage? So let's kind of zoom out a bit on this question and just start with compatibility in general. It's really the world's idea. It's this idea that I'm going to find someone that one person that is going to accept me for who I am and is not going to try to change me and will grow happily ever after. And they think that that's what compatibility is. Wait, what? Says who? Like, I don't think anyone thinks that this is what compatibility means, right? What? Compatibility is about how well you work together while you're in a relationship, both as individuals and as a team. It's about how well you work together to create something greater than the sum of your parts. Can you build a productive, happy life together, regardless of what that specifically looks like to you? So this involves asking things like, do your core values align? Do you both have goals and dreams and aspirations which align? Do you both want the same things out of a relationship on a day-to-day -day basis? For example, one of the reasons I broke up with my last long-term partner many years ago now uh, was that we, in my eyes, stopped being compatible. The older we got, the more he was pushing for marriage and to have a kid one day, and he saw our day-to-day -day life as him being this, like, you know, kind of douchey banker who hung out with his other rich colleagues and did cocaine, 
and expected me to just be like sat at home waiting for him to come back and you know be okay with that and he started getting jealous when I was like going out with my friends or like he kind of didn't like me doing gig photography so much and like all those things I loved and I started to realize as I got older I was like god well I'm not really sure I want marriage and I definitely don't want this kid he's pushing for and I'm not happy with our day-to-day -day life where I'm just kind of sat around waiting for him to come home and everything's on his schedule and he's doing these drugs that I don't like. Like, it was a whole thing. So I started to realise, damn, we have very different visions of where we see our lives going. And instead of trying to change him or um, change myself and force myself to fit into this life that wasn't right for me, I needed to leave and give us both a chance to find the lives that would be right for us, you know? So I did, and while I don't regret being in that relationship while I was, yeah. I think leaving at the time I did was the exact right choice for both of us, because we stopped being compatible. I don't think anyone in the real world, like this is an absolute straw man from Bethany, yeah. I guess, I don't think anyone in the real world really thinks compatibility means happily ever after with no problems, yeah. that's just unrealistic. But it is important to not go into a relationship thinking one or both of you needs to change your core values or behaviour to make it work because that's just unfair on everyone involved. So that's why when I started dating again and I met my partner now, I focused on finding someone who matched with those core values of mine. So someone who didn't necessarily want to get traditionally married, someone who didn't want to have kids, someone who was fine with us both having our own personal spaces and being quite independent but still being there for each other when we needed each other, you know? Thinking about compatibility is, in my opinion and in the opinion of many relationship experts, one of the most important things you can do when you meet someone new. I don't understand where Carissa gets this weird strawman argument from here, but I'm not gonna let her keep getting away with spouting this nonsense. And trust me, as this lesson goes on, it gets worse and worse and worse. And I just have no patience for it. Um, when in reality, God made marriage to change us. Uh, marriage is about sanctification. It's about becoming more and more like God. And if he brings this person into our life who uh, functions as a full length mirror in front of us and says, whoa, buddy, here's where you need to change. That's a good thing. This sounds horrible. This sounds absolutely horrible. Yeah, when you're in a long-term relationship with someone, you'll likely both change over time. Ideally, you're going to grow and change together, but that might not realistically happen, you know? But going into a relationship in the first place and saying, I'm going to point out your flaws and change you, and you are going to change me, feels incredibly unhealthy, you know? We're three minutes and 50 seconds into this lesson, and I already hate this woman. This, in my opinion, is the worst lesson in this course and i'm not sure how much of that is because the content is bad and how much is just because i honestly cannot stand carissa i i'm probably a bit biased here i find her very very annoying so i just want to start with compatibility let's kind of narrow that down now to sexual compatibility mm -hmm. um if God designed marriage to change us and gave us a spouse to help us change and become more and more like Christ, I believe that applies to our sex life too. It's not that we need to, you know, know ahead of time exactly who I am sexually and you need to know who you are sexually so that we can test it out and find out if we're sexually compatible. It's just not something we see in scripture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot we don't see in scripture. Doesn't mean it's not important. As Matthias Roberts said earlier, and I'm paraphrasing here, our sexuality, our sexual preferences, our desires, our likes, our hates, our needs, our wants, our action, our attractions, our turn-offs, it's all such a big innate part of who we are. And so many parts of that are things that we cannot change. So why should we want to be with someone who's trying to change who we are at our core against what is natural? Why would we want to be with someone who clashes with a fundamental, unchangeable part of us? That just seems like a recipe for unhappiness and misery for everyone involved. Saying sexual compatibility is not important is kind of like saying, well, I have foods that I like and foods that I don't like. Some foods are healthier for me than others. I have foods which I'm allergic to. I might also have certain health conditions which require me to eat or avoid certain foods. Um, and that, that's a fundamental part of who I am. I can't change what I have allergies to or what 
tastes I like and don't like and that sort of thing, right? But I am going to pick a box at random and whatever is inside that box is going to be the food I eat for the rest of my life. And yeah, you might get your favourite meal and that's great, but you might also get a food that you hate. You'll still get nutrition, but you'll never really enjoy a meal again because, you know, it's something that you don't like and you'll never really like the taste of, but now you're stuck eating it every day. Or you might get a food that you're allergic to and now you're stuck with that every single day. So your choice is nothing at all or it kills you. So in this analogy, if I was in that situation, I have a choice between I can look through a menu, sample the food and then make my decision, or I can take the risk and potentially end up with the shellfish platter. I'm allergic to shellfish and mollusks, so that would kill me. If I'm faced with that choice, then I know which one I'm choosing. I want to check out the full menu, sample the goods, and then make my decision, you know? And it's the same with sex and sexual compatibility. Sure, you can take the risks of an unknown and it might pay off, but it also might not. Some of us, obviously not all of us, but a lot of us, like to make educated choices and understand ourselves and others and weigh up our options before we make a choice. So let's say um, there's a sex act that you really, really, really do not like and never want to do, and it turns out that your partner it's their favourite thing in the world. They absolutely love it. Why would you risk ending up with someone where you might end up clashing over something like that that's so big and is going to impact your lives together when you could just find out beforehand before you commit to them whether you clash or not? And if there's a clash, you each go your separate ways, you know? Sexuality is such a wide spectrum. You can be attracted to all kinds of genders or looks or body types or personalities. Uh, you can have certain tastes sexually. You can want to do some things and not others. You can have different styles. You might be more dominant or more submissive. There are so many variables and it can be really helpful to find out if you're on the same page as someone before you commit to them for life, you know? It is much better to end up with someone who likes the same things as you do, who is attracted who is as attracted to you as you are to them, who can fulfill your needs as much as you can fulfill theirs. How is that a bad thing? And how can you deny that that exists, that kind of sexual compatibility with someone? So when it comes to like getting married and say they've decided to save sex for a marriage and then they go on their honeymoon and they're like, oh my goodness, this is not at all what we expected. This is actually kind of, maybe they're like, this is kind of disappointing. And they start, maybe she starts having doubts. Like, did I marry the wrong person? Like what if a woman ends up in that place where it's a struggle from the beginning and she's just like, this is hard. What can she do? What should she do in a situation like that? Yeah. I, I think I got all of your question. It cut out there for a minute, Bethany. So I don't know what you want to do in terms of editing? Absolutely nothing. She does absolutely nothing. But I think I understood the question. Um, so there are situations where people, you know, are on their honeymoon or they come back from their honeymoon. And um, from a sexual perspective, since this is a sex course, they say, I don't know if we know what's going on. I don't know if we even know how to have sex. Maybe they didn't have sex on their honeymoon. I've had couples where they haven't consummated their marriage even for years at a time. It's very rare, but that happens. And um, there are answers for you. Um, we have worked with couples through this issue, not just of sexual frustration, but um, getting married and realizing like there's so much more about this person I didn't know. And now I need to learn that. Hey, you're going to keep learning about your spouse. They're a living, breathing, endless book to be read. And that's going to be some frustrating parts that you read. And that's going to be some really cool, exciting, exhilarating parts that you read. So um, yeah, I think you need to reach out. You need to get some help. Find a mentor, a pastor, a counselor, and sit down and do some work with this person. You guys probably need to do some reading, get some education on board when it comes to sexuality in particular, um, and have some accountability. You know, have someone who's 
saying, hey, did you read that? What were your thoughts? What were your questions on this chapter? And um, accountability and conversation go a long way, especially with someone who's seasoned and understands what you're going through and can walk you through that. Okay, so I've heard this before where a single... Wait, did you see that just then? That was a cut. That was an editing cut. That is the first time Bethany has added an editing cut in any of her courses. Oh, what did she cut out? How bad was it that Bethany actually edited? I find this very exciting. I want another gossip. <laughs> no, but seriously, um, jokes aside, I am in two minds about how to respond to this because on the one hand, yes, sex is always about learning and growing and you figure stuff out and you find out new wonderful things about your partner and that's great. That's really nice. And I'm always, always, always going to be an advocate for people getting more sex education, no matter how old or experienced they are. You are never too old to learn new things. I'm still 30 and learning new stuff all the time. These videos I make are a fantastic opportunity for me to do a ton of research and learn things I didn't even know about, you know? But, on the other hand, one, Carissa makes it sound a bit boring and like a chore, but maybe I'm just hearing that because I don't really like her. And two, even with all the learning and trying and education in the world, sometimes you're just not right with someone. And it is okay to say, hey, you know what? I don't think we're sexually compatible. Maybe we just go our own ways, you know? You can't force what isn't there. If you have different kinks or turn-ons that are incompatible, no amount of talking to a mentor is gonna change that, unfortunately. Some people are just different and that's okay. Like, what was that comedy with Neil Patrick Harris where he was like in a relationship for like most of his life and then he gets divorced and he tries going on a date and then the first person he takes home, like they're making out and then it turns out that they're both bottoms and they're like, oh, what do we do now? <laughs> it's quite funny. Like, some things you just can't reconcile, you know, and that's okay. You know, it's fine. Different people are going to respond differently. For some, sex might not be all that important, and it's part of like, you know what, this is fine. It might not be that satisfying for me, but I'll stay with them anyway because everything else is great. But for other people, sex is a huge part of a relationship, and they need that sexual compatibility to have a fulfilling relationship overall and stay with someone and really have those romantic feelings grow. And so for those people, if they're not sexually compatible, they may want to leave a relationship. And that is absolutely okay too. Again, there's no one right way to do this. You just need to work out what you value and what's right for you, you know? But please don't let Carissa fool you. Sexual compatibility is a real thing. Just like general compatibility in a relationship is a real thing. Single people have said, like, um, you know, biologically, there are certain people sexually that just fit better together. Like they can have an enjoyable sexual experience. And if you end up with the wrong person, like biologically, you're just, no matter how hard you try, no matter how much you work at it, like biologically, your body's just, they operate a little bit differently. They have, they just don't have the right makeup to really have a thriving sexual experience together. And I've heard people say this and say, so if you end up with someone where you don't, I guess, jive biologically, you're just either going to have a lifetime of disappointment or you need to find that person that you jive with. And, and, you know, maybe that's why you need to test drive it before. And so that's a concern for single people. I was, I'm just curious what you would say to that kind of argument. Yeah. I see, this is what I mean about her annoying me. I cannot deal with this smug laughter and derision from someone who literally does not know what they're talking about. You know, she has no obvious formal training or work experience in anything related to sexuality. Her PhD is from the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary and is, and is in theology and biblical interpretation. And she's been married to the same guy for 15 years, which is the same amount of time I've personally been sexually active. So it's not like she's talking from a lot of experience. So I just feel like when you don't have the education or the life experience to back it up, and then on top of that, when you don't have the research to back it up, and you don't have the work experience to back it up, and you're personally profiting from telling people sexual compatibility doesn't exist because you're charging $900 for two hours of counseling, I don't trust you. She doesn't have any experience that actually backs up what she's saying, that sexual compatibility isn't real. But she benefits from telling people that sexual compatibility isn't real because she can charge them nearly a thousand dollars for two hours of her time. So yeah, I don't trust her. I don't. I don't know, maybe this might just be like my bias showing, but I think this Carissa person is the first 
person from both of Bethany's courses that I've had this like real visceral reaction to where I'm just like there's something off about her I no do not trust her I get major mean girl vibes no I just want this lesson to be over I just I don't know I don't know what it is you know sometimes when you just get like a gut feeling about someone I know some people are gonna be like in the good bias is showing you yeah it is I know it is, and it's okay, I'm not a journalist. I don't need to be impartial. I am an opinion and social commentary channel. I give my opinions and commentary and my feelings come out and they are a part of this. And in this case, my feelings say no. I have a lot of responses to that argument. If I was talking to someone who asked that question though, first I would ask them like, what do what do they mean? Are they saying biologically, like in terms of frequency, like preference of frequency? Are they talking about body parts that physically don't go together? Um, I I don't hear of people saying that their body parts physically wouldn't go together. So I don't. I think that's a myth. If that's a concern for you, I think that's a myth. Your body parts will go together. God designed them. If you are a male and a female, your body parts will go together. Um, but in terms of frequency, this is a common concern, especially in the church. We hear, you know, that men want sex more frequently than women. That's not always the case. Um, in fact, we like to not think about it in terms of high drive and low drive, because then that's when that like compatibility question comes into play. Like, I need to find someone who has just as high of a drive as me. Well, in the beginning, it's very likely that you're both going to be pretty high drive. OK, <laughs> so if you're trying to test drive something ahead of time. Uh, most likely that test drive is going to result in you both having a pretty high drive anyway. Um, but mm -hmm. let's let's even get away from the terms high drive and low drive. Um, there is a model. It's called the dual control model. And it says that we all have a sexual excitation system and we all have a sexual inhibition system. Basically, I just think of that as accelerators and brakes. So we all have accelerators and we all have brakes. Now, there are people who have more sensitive brakes and uh, less sensitive accelerators and vice versa. Oh, you know what? I actually like that they're talking about this. We mentioned the dual control system earlier, accelerators, brakes, all that sort of thing. Completely legit, really important to learn about and talk about. They are right that there are ways to deal with an incompatibility between partners, but not all incompatibilities have to be dealt with and resolved. Sometimes they are insurmountable and you might just want to, you know. But anyway, like I say, I think the dual control system is something really worth learning about, but Carissa's really annoying and explains it poorly, so instead I suggest you go and read Emily Nagoski's explanation of it in her book, Come As You. Come As You Are? Yeah, Come As You Are. I think I've said that title so many times now, it's just not sounding like real words to me. Anyway. Um, but yeah, kind of same stuff here with sex drive, like sex drive can fluctuate over time and change with different people depending on what else is going on in your life, stresses, health issues, how new the relationship is, all that is fine, she does make some good points here, but this idea that, you know, sometimes parts don't fit together, like, sometimes they actually just don't, and the fact that, like, she hasn't had any work experience in this field, nor personal experience, I can see kind of her naivety showing here. So I think it was Emily Nagoski who wrote, was it her? I might be wrong, but it, it was someone like Emily Nagoski who said that most sex therapists have to go through um, a certain kind of training, basically kind of like desensitizing them to everything and getting them really familiar and comfortable with basically anything their clients can throw at them in, in regards to sex. So. This is to make sure they don't seem shocked at anything a client says, make sure they don't judge anything a client says negatively, to make sure uh, they know what normal is and what isn't. And so part of this is things like looking at thousands of images and videos of penises and vulvas and, you know, sexual body parts to know what they should look like, what's normal, what isn't, what's healthy, what isn't, when they should tell people to go to the doctor and when they should reassure people that, hey, no, you're absolutely normal, don't worry about it, you're fine. But I think when you don't actually have any training in that field and you don't have any personal experiences yourself with a variety of different body parts and experiences and stuff like that, then I don't, I'm not saying you need both. I'm saying like it can kind of be an either or. But like when you don't have that, I can understand why she might just be like, oh yeah, well in theory, everything should fit with everything. It's all fine. But in reality, that's it's not the case. It's not. I think I said this in my video on Bethany's marriage course, but 
all vaginas and penises are different and some people have preferences for what they like in others genitals over others and that's absolutely fine you know and i think as long as you're not shaming anyone's body and you're not being disrespectful it is okay to someone it is okay to say to someone hey like this isn't really what i'm into i don't quite think we're compatible in this way let's find other people you know because some people like they cannot stand an average or larger penis. They need something smaller because that's what feels good and that's what doesn't hurt them, you know? Some people will want a slightly larger penis because a small one maybe doesn't quite satisfy them the same. For some people, they might just want something nice and in the middle and average because too big can hurt them and too small just isn't quite what they're into. And that's absolutely fine. And it's the same the other way around as well. Some people, like vaginas come in all different shapes and sizes and feelings and it's okay for someone to say you know what this isn't quite working for me with my body it doesn't quite feel as good as i would like it doesn't do this for me this is okay you know don't worry you're lovely down there anyway you just you know need to find a different person than me that's all or maybe a different penis than me <laughs> point is yeah sometimes people aren't physically compatible and it happens and it's sad that it happens but it does and it's reality you know i also really didn't like the not so subtle homophobia in here with her line of like well as long as you're male and female in the show but she's also just discounting so much here because it's not just about shapes and sinus 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 <laughs> because it's not just about shapes and sizes of genitals like i said earlier tastes and kinks all play a big part in compatibility two extremely submissive people who aren't willing to play the other role if they want a more dominant partner, aren't really going to be too compatible long term, are they? Someone whose main thing is being into feet isn't going to be too compatible with someone who hates feet, their feet being touched or hates touching other people's feet, you know? And they're just like a couple of examples. There's so much more to it than that. It's extremely complicated. But overall, it's okay to not be sexually compatible with someone. And when it comes to things like sexual boundaries, that's not something you should ever ever have to compromise on. Like imagine you've never discussed this and you get married and you're like well I hate anal but you love it so I guess I'll do it on Sundays just for you babe. Or oh what's that you love being spanked. I'm not really comfortable doing that so I guess you just have to never experience that again yeah. Compromise babe just compromise. You know just find someone who can give you what you need to the extent you need it right. Not everything in life has to be a compromise. And yet, you're not going to find someone who wants exactly the same thing as you all the time. Of course not, that's unrealistic. But you're not looking for that. You're looking for overall compatibility, overall ease of being together, and overall similarity. You know, it is possible. You just have to be realistic about it. So as someone who, like you, has counseled so many couples, so many individuals, has been married for 15 plus years, what would you say is the key to a really enjoyable, passionate marriage and sexual relationship within marriage. Talk about sex before, during, and after sex. This is key because people think it all has to do with the bedroom. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. If you're talking intimately, you're connected throughout the day and you're talking both about sex and not about sex, but you're communicating well, you are going to have a more passionate sex life. Yeah, as much as I don't like Carissa, I do thoroughly agree with her here, actually. She is completely right, and for once, I have nothing snarky to say. I think for some of our viewers right now, they're thinking, okay, well, that's hard to imagine, like, being so open and comfortable talking about sex, because that's, like, intimacy. Like, that's really knowing each other. And I, you know, I am, maybe it's a woman who's saying, like, maybe I've had sex before, but I'm hoping to save it for marriage now, or I've never had sex before, and I just haven't, like, that. Ha this hasn't been a topic of discussion. It's kind of just been a personal thing. I, I haven't had a lot of people, a parent or a mentor, or someone talk about sex in you know, in any depth or in any detail, so it feels really awkward and uncomfortable. Yeah, I can see that, but the thing I always, always, always say in my videos is if you can't communicate about sex with your partner, then you shouldn't be having sex with them, you know? And I think this is true whether it's your first time or your hundredth time or whatever, you know? Pretty much all the experts say that if you can communicate openly with your partner and communicate well and understand each other, then that's how you're going to have the best, most fulfilling relationships, both in terms of your everyday stuff and your sexual relationship. 
And yeah, talking about it might be difficult at first, but it's something that does get easier with practice. And you just have to like get off that first little hump and you'll both start to feel far more comfortable and at ease with each other. And talking about this stuff does get easier with time. One of the big things is that you shouldn't be afraid to name body parts. Like Bethany actually said way back at the beginning of this course, you know, you shouldn't be afraid to say these things and say, you know, name your vulva, your clitoris, your, you can talk about your penis and your testicles in these different areas and, you know, be open to saying to your partner, I like this. I like when you touch me here. Hey, can you do this to me, please? But also you should be prepared to say, oh, I'm not really a fan of that. Oh, do you mind if we change up to something else? Or, you know what, that was maybe a little too hard for me, let's try it a different way. Then in a shocking, shocking turn of events, something completely unexpected, um, instead of Bethany trying to upsell her guest's products, the guest upsells Bethany's. I know that you didn't see that coming, did you? Carissa tries to sell Bethany's book, wild. Then Carissa tells us she likes to start book groups at bachelorette parties, which sounds fun. Um, and then there's this clip. I hate it. Please enjoy. I remember as a teen, you know, like coming home from like youth or the youth went out to eat or to, you know, whatever, to coffee. And like my mom would be like, so tell me, like, who'd you talk to? How'd this go? Da, da, da. And I remember as a young teen, her asking me, like when I would talk to a boy or something and I mean, absolutely innocent, just talking, right? Like mm -hmm. having a conversation at coffee with all the other youth group around and, you know, that I like kind of liked him and whatever. He's cute. Da, da, da. He asked me this question and yeah. And when we left, he gave me a side hug and, you know, and my mom would ask me questions like, and it might sound cringe. Okay. But my mom would ask me questions like, so how did you feel in your body when that happened? And like what she was getting at is, did you get turned on? Right. And so like, I could freely say, I felt butterflies in my stomach. And, and then I got to the place where I could say, yeah. And actually I felt like I got kind of wet when that happened. Mm -hmm. And then she could be like, that's normal. That's really good. Like God made you that way. And then because that, that was affirmed and that was natural, now we could have boundary conversations. Like that's yeah. going to make you want to do more things, you know, when you, even though a side hug is completely fine, like be careful that that doesn't that doesn't progress into more when you're friends at 14 or 15 years old, you know, like it was, it was a healthy discipleship. Most women don't have that. One of the biggest questions we get asked, Carissa, is this, is it awkward being a virgin on your wedding night? And there's a lot <laughs> of fear that it's just going to be so awkward, so cringe, like you, the word you just used and just like, oh, like almost a fear of getting married and having sex because you're like, this is just going to be awkward. What would you say to that? Yeah. Oh man. The, the classic question, right? I would say with 100% excitement, certainty, and enthusiasm that it was a beautiful experience being a virgin on my wedding night. Um, man, how cool that, and, and I know there are women who this is not the case, so I am, I'm going to speak to the women who are virgins who are saying, is it awkward and should I remain a virgin? I'm going to speak to you right now. How cool that out of all the other possible outcomes that could have happened, you get to walk into this wedding night completely blank slated and get to like learn and have all those moments of, of, you know, clumsiness or not knowing what happens and getting to experience that with your husband forever. Like this is the person you're going to be with for the rest mm -hmm. of your life. And you get to look back 15 years from now and go, remember our wedding night when we didn't know what happens when this happens? And remember when we had to try this differently? And guess what? 15 years later, even after you're seasoned and, and well-versed when it comes to sex, you're still going to be trying things differently. Like you're still going to go, I wonder what would happen if we try it this way. And that's beautiful. I love that you get to experience this with your husband for the rest of your life and how cool you get to start on your wedding night. And that's, that's what happened for us. And I would say it was not awkward. It was exciting and it was special and sacred and beautiful. Honestly, talking about first times is kind of hard because for a lot of people, no matter when it is or who you're with, it will be awkward for a lot of people and that is fine and that is normal for Carissa it wasn't 
For me personally it wasn't, but for a lot of people it is, and that's okay, whether it is or isn't, all good, all good. But here's the thing, you don't need to be a virgin on your wedding night for your first time to be special and sacred and beautiful. My first time was wonderful and I have zero regrets and it was as perfect as I could have asked for and that wasn't on my wedding night because I never planned to get married and it also wasn't with my current partner. Still special, sex with my partner now, still special, you know? And I really believe that Carissa would doubt that that's possible but it really is. And it's also possible for a lot of people for sex their first time to be really really awkward and also special and beautiful, you know? Things can be more than one thing at once. There really is no one right way to have your first time, you've just got to do what's right for you, you know? And you know what, if your first time isn't great, so what? Your next time will be better, and then your next time will be better, and your next time will be better. And then the next time I'll be a bit crappy again. But then the next time will be better. And that's the thing about sex, is it's different every time and with every partner. And just because one time is really, really good, it doesn't diminish the other times that are really, really good or make them less special, you know? And if you have a few bad or awkward times, that doesn't stop the other times being special. It's just... Some of us will have those special moments with multiple people. Some of us will have those special moments with only one person. All of it is okay. The important thing to remember is that having previous partners doesn't influence what the experience is like with the person you're currently with. It's like... <laughs> I watched Doctor Who last night, so this is like in my head right now. Um, but try not to give away too many spoilers. When the Doctor like meets the Celestial Toymaker again, and he's like, oh, I'm going to have to play his game. And the doctor's like worrying because he was like, but I won last time, so chances are I'll lose this time. And Donna's like, no, no, no. Like, as my granddad says, like, the dice don't remember the game. And it's like, um, I think the word for this is called like the gambler's fallacy, where they seem to think that like, oh my God, it's, you know, the roulette table's landed on black so many times, it's going to be red next time, right? Not the case at all. Every time you start a new game, the odds revert back to the same thing, because there's no memory of what came before. Every time you flip a coin, it's still a 50-50 chance of heads or tails. Every time you roll a dice, it's still a 1 in 6 chance of the numbers you get, or more if you're playing with multi-sided dice. You know what I'm trying to say? Um, and it's kind of the same with sex. Every time you have it, it's a new experience, and every time has the potential to be awkward and clumsy, or beautiful and satisfying and special and momentous, you know what I mean? Every new partner is something fresh and new and a new experience. Every interaction with them is a new, fresh experience, you know? And so that means even if there have been people before or not, it doesn't matter because with the right person, because with the right person it's going to be so special. It's almost like a bit of a paradox because in a way, Everything that's come before has made you who you are and helps you understand yourself more and that is going to lead into better experiences overall. But at the same time, everything that's come before kind of doesn't matter in that moment and you're just there experiencing it with this wonderful person and it's special then. So I think my overall point is, and I'm rambling a bit, I'm happy for you Carissa, but your lifestyle isn't the only way to do things. And there are so many right options and you just need to figure out what's right for you. And even if we don't end up with the option or outcome that we thought we wanted and we get something else, that doesn't mean it can't still be fantastic, you know? And there we go, I think the Doctor Who stuff is still in my head. <laughs> um, okay. One question that we've had from them is this, should sex come easy in marriage? Um, should it be something that is, you know, like, yeah, it takes work, but it's generally like, I mean, how hard can it be? It should be pretty easy. We should have like a fairly easy time. It should just be pretty, you know, pleasurable from the start. Uh, you know, that whole idea, like ease. It, is sex within marriage easy? And I don't know, unpack that for us. <laughs> I'm going to start with your original question because I think it's on target. You said, should it be easy? Shoulds <laughs> are so common when it comes to questions around sex. Shoulds bring shame though. If we are talking in terms of what should happen and how it should be, then when the minute you don't align with that should, all of a sudden the shame comes in. And it's like, oh, I'm not a real woman. I'm not functioning right. And this should be easy. This should come naturally. This should be. 
So let's take the shoulds off the table and let's just talk about what it's like. Okay. Um, it's different from season to season. There are going to be seasons where sex does not feel easy. And I think that's quite normal. I've experienced that for myself. I've, ex- I've heard of it in so many of my clients' lives. There are seasons where sex does not come easily. There are seasons where sex feels like, man, is this out of a novel or out of a movie or like this just is fairy tale-ish um, and everything in between. Okay. So- okay. So it's just common sense. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. I don't care. I just, oh God, this lesson's dragging so much. It's been half an hour and I felt like it took me two hours to get through. It just, not a fan of this one. Do not like. Bethany then asks what single women should do if they're scared of sex. And Carissa says pain from sex is normal, which is good, I guess. But then she doesn't really say anything else that's useful. She doesn't give any practical advice about, you know, like using lubrication and relaxing and blah 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 and all of that stuff. I think we covered most of that in the marriage course, so I'm not going to go into it too much now. Um, she just says things like, expect good things to happen. Okay, I guess. And then of course, get mentorship. Do it. Which, again, is fine for her to say because she's selling that mentorship for a lot of money. This lesson was the longest 34 minutes of my life. Now, let's move on to the next one. You know what, I've just had the exact same camera problem as I had two days ago and I'm thoroughly annoyed where my camera battery said it was on three bars, like full bars. Full bars? I don't know, whatever the full bars is. And then out of nowhere it just absolutely died on me and I lost the last ten minutes that I filmed. And it is very, very frustrating, isn't it, Koo? Do I come for a snuggle? Mama needs it. I do. Hi, Hi, gorgeous. Come here. Come to Mama. Come to Mama. You want, you want me to come to you? Yeah, my little lazy bones. My little lazy bones. Hello. Should we try this again, baby? Yeah, should we try this again? Oh, no, you're off. Goodbye. Goodbye. Session seven. Single and surviving or single and thriving. This one is taught by Bethany by herself. So I do have to say I agree with Bethany's premise here. One of the big things uh, that I say over and over in my videos, and I've probably said in this video a lot too, is that it is better to be happy alone than with the wrong person. And I'm a big believer in the idea that the best relationships are the ones where both or all parties are generally satisfied with their lives on their own and have other stuff going on outside of the relationship. So I'm not saying you have to be perfect before you even think about dating, but you do at least need to be content in your own life if you want a relationship to be good and fun, you know? A relationship isn't a magic fix to all the problems in your life, it's like a lovely bonus on top of everything else. I've used this analogy before, but it's kind of like a nice meal, you know? You need to fill up on your main course first, which is your important stuff. You need your proteins, your minerals, your fats, your carbohydrates and all that good stuff. Um, and you need to get all that stuff in life first, you know, your health, your self-esteem, your having friends, having hobbies, having a career or job you don't hate. You know, you need that contentment in life. And that's, that's your main meal, that should be your main focus. And if you're still hungry after that, you can go and get a pudding. Now, some people like pudding more than others, some people want pudding more than others, and all of that's okay. Some people find they can eat lots of pudding, some people don't have room for much pudding at all. And don't even get me started on the kinds of pudding you can have. Cake, trifles, cheesecakes, pies, tarts, mousses, so many options depending on what you like. If you haven't guessed it, the pudding in this analogy is like a relationship on top of everything else. It should add to your life, it should make it better. Just like a pudding makes a meal better, but it's not the main focus. It would be unhealthy to constantly skip your main meal and jump straight to pudding, and it's the same in life. It would be unhealthy to skip looking after yourself and focus everything on a relationship, or to sit a while around waiting for a relationship, or to think, hmm, things will only be good once I get in a relationship. You need the main bits first, and the relationship is just the excellent pudding on top of an otherwise fulfilling main meal, you know? It might sound easy for me to say because I've always been quite an independent person. I love doing things for myself, by myself, living by myself. I have more hobbies than I realistically have time for. But I still found that even though I thought I had my main meal down and sorted and was good, I was actually still missing one of the little veggie sides, you know? And I hadn't actually worked on my self-esteem. And my best relationship only came after I'd worked on building up my self-esteem and started realising that, hang on a minute, 
I don't just need to settle for anyone who'll want me because turns out that's not really that rare and I do have a right to be a little picky and be like, hang on a minute, what's actually right for me? Who is right for me? What do I actually need? You know, so once I'd done that work on myself, only then did I end up in a really, really good relationship. For my sister though, it was really different. Like she'd been in a relationship for, I don't know, 18 odd years when she found out her nasty, nasty now ex-wife um, had been cheating on her for years. And it was really difficult for at first going through that breakup and losing that relationship because this was the first time in her adult life she'd been alone and she didn't quite know how to cope with it. She was like 40 years old and I remember her calling me up in tears because she was trying to return a pair of jeans to a shop in Meadow Hall and she was like, I don't know how to do it myself. I'm scared to go in there alone. I've never done this without Charlotte. Like, what do I do? And it was completely understandable, you know? She'd always had a partner by her side for all those little things in life and she was so worried now that she didn't have that and she was like, well, how do I do it alone? What if people think I'm weird? What if I mess up? She had so, so many worries and she had to work on that for herself before she could even think about getting into another relationship. So in that scenario, I sat with her on the phone and I helped calm her down. I talked her through the next steps and she was amazing. And she went in, she returned those jeans and it was just a small thing, but it was a big step towards independence for her and it was huge. And then after a couple of years of pulling herself together and starting to realize how brilliant and incredible and wonderful she was on her own and starting to see that amazing side of her that I'd always seen, and then she, finally met someone else. She got her main meal sorted, she was back to being herself again, she was back to being fulfilled, and then she went, maybe, maybe I can fit in a little pudding. And that's when she met Karen, her now wife, who is one of the most amazing people I've ever met, and a little put to bits. She's like another sister, you know? And it's great because, again, Karen isn't her main meal. Sarah Jane's got plenty of other stuff going on in her life, but, but Karen is that little extra pudding at the end of the meal that really brings out the best in her and makes her so happy, and I love that for her. So, so me and my sister had very different things missing from our own lives before we got into relationships, but we could only get into fulfilling relationships after we both fulfilled those core needs for ourselves. And I just kind of hope that that can kind of like maybe inspire you guys a little bit and show you what I mean by that analogy and you know what I'm trying to say and this isn't just true for women as well absolutely the same can be applied to men and non-binary people as well absolutely like to use my partner as an example he's a cisgender man but um I'm actually the first person he's ever been in a serious relationship with like he's casually dated before he's like been out with a couple of people a few times but up until I think he was like 20 seven I think he was when we met he was just very focused on himself and getting his life to where he wanted it to be so he worked really hard in uni he cultivated this amazing group of friends who are the loveliest most wonderful people he got a job working for like one of his dream companies and he's doing some absolutely amazing things um and I am so so incredibly proud of him uh he moved to Leeds he got his own place he properly sorted his life out and then he thought you know what I'm in a good place now maybe you should think about dating again and a couple of weeks later he met me and we just clicked and everything worked it was wonderful and honestly if this is like the easiest least traumatic relationship I've ever been in because I think we'd both done so much work on ourselves individually before we met it really was like the relationship with each other was just this little extra added bonus on top and it's been great been really great. One book which really helped me and my sister when we were between long-term relationships was, Ka was uh, Catherine Gray's The Unexpected Joy of Being Single and I really recommend that book. It's great. It's part personal memoir and part pure inspiration for why life can be so incredible when you're single and free and really embracing all of that and I recommend it to everyone. I really do. Also on a completely unrelated note, I also really recommend her book, The Unexpected Joy of Being Sober, which also really helped me just reevaluate my own relationship with alcohol and helped me understand a few of my sober friends on like a whole new level. Like, I've never had an issue with alcohol, um, and I wasn't even like worried about my relationship with it, but it was really nice to just evaluate and like now just sometimes think, hang on, like, well, why am I drinking in this social setting? Do I need to? Am I doing it because I enjoy the taste of this or because I'm anxious about something? And now I can kind of reevaluate. and there are certain times, like, I've now been to like whole parties where I've been sober and it's really, really nice to just kind of reevaluate and be like, oh, I can't do this. It's 
nice. Anyway, completely off the point, just thought I'd throw that little recommendation out there. Anyway, let's get back to seeing what Bethany has to say. Most singles find themselves either in a place of survival and just kind of hoping to view their singleness as a season to get through until real life begins or a season of thriving where they're like, yes, I don't know what the future holds. I'm trusting God, but I am thriving in this season. A lot of you may find yourself in the survival season, but wanting to move to the thriving season. And my prayer for you is that you won't just strive to survive these years because the truth is we don't know the future. We don't know God's plan. Yeah, this is actually all fine. You know, good, good job, Bethany. No complaints here. I don't want you to leave this course and to stay where you are. I want you to leave this course with new hope, with new direction, with new purpose in your singleness. Whether you have been single for your whole life, you've never dated. Whether you've dated before, maybe some of you have even been engaged and you're like, I was so close. So today I'm actually going to share a little bit more about my story. Um, a lot of you heard it kind of in the beginning, but I'm going to go into a little bit more depth um, just to give you hopefully some encouragement in the season that you're in. So a lot of you know, I got married at 30. I'm 34 now, have two kids, but I imagined myself like many of you probably getting married in my early twenties and that I just assumed, you know, like if we have a good desire, like if we desire to get married, if we desire to be a wife, if we desire to have children, these things that God calls blessings that he literally encourages us as women to do, like surely he would provide a godly husband and make that happen in my life. And so I remember I didn't date throughout high school because I was really committed to like intentionally dating, being an intentional relationship. And so when I turned 19, I went to a singles group and met, I was actually going to meet the guy that my friend was really into and they were kind of like talking at the time and his best friend and I really hit it off. So neither of us were, were there like for the purpose of meeting each other. We were there like with our friends who were like each interested in each other. And then the two of us ended up hitting it off after like almost a year of being friends. We ended up dating and I was now 20 at this point. And I just thought, honestly, I was like, oh my goodness, like my life is working out exactly the way that I had hoped. And I 100% thought we were just going to get married. And I just thought like, okay, here's my future. Here's my life. We're going to get married. We'll have kids. Like this is what life is all about. And the relationship did not end in marriage. Obviously, um, he actually broke it off. He felt like we were just two different people going in two different directions and looking back, I definitely agree with him. But as a naive 20 year old, I just thought, oh, things will just like work out. Like it's all probably just fine, you know? And in reality, like beliefs wise, Christianity wise, I guess like we were, we were on two pretty different pages, but I just, I was very naive at 20 and 19 and 20. I have a very, um, like fantastical view of the world. I, I was just very naive. You know, Bethany, we've heard your stories again and again and again. <laughs> but honestly, like how horrifying is that? that Bethany could be planning on getting married and spending her entire life with a person before she even knew what the act of sex was. I do find that slightly terrifying, you know? And that that's not a comment on Bethany herself. That's a comment on how awful her parents were at educating her. They failed this young woman so much and they failed all of their children repeatedly and it really does make me angry. It really does. I think it's like, Bethany's brother Michael said, you know, <sighs> Bethany and Kristen are just pawns in this bigger game. They're not really the bad guys here, but they're being used by the bad guys in a really unfair way. That said, they're in their mid-30s now, so, you know, at some point they do have to take some responsibility for the harm that they're causing, and we have to realise that, well, you know, it's not like they're naive children just parroting their parents. These are grown adult women who are doing the same thing. So it, mm, difficult, difficult. And so that relationship ended and I was devastated because I'm like, what am I going to do with my future? And if you've been in a dating relationship, some of you know, like when you awaken those feelings and you start to imagine that you're going to be a you know married woman by the next year, it can be hard sometimes to take that step back and go, whoa, I'm now in a season of singleness. And so I just let myself mourn the loss of that relationship. It really, to me, had almost felt like I lost my best friend. I lost like this whole dream and this future. It was also really hard for me because I felt like the direction my ex-boyfriend was going in wasn't like a good direction. 
and he kind of entered like the party scene again. And it was just like, like kind of like back to college days, but he was not in college. Um, and it was just heartbreaking in that sense too. So there was just so much I was processing so much. I was mourning and I just let myself like for a long time, just let myself cry and be sad about it. I do find it really interesting that throughout all of this, Bethany has not spoken about the possibility of women or even men, I guess, uh, but like most women in this case, wanting to stay single long term. She's acting like marriage and kids are a goal for everyone when really they are not, N not at all. Um, I'm personally sort of in the middle, you know, I love my relationship and my partner, but we don't want a traditional marriage and we don't want kids. So I guess by Bethany's logic, I would be counted as single forever, but I'm not really single. So, mm -hmm. but there are plenty of people who do just want to be single forever. And yeah, Bethany doesn't seem to like really realize they exist. <laughs> But I guess, I guess it does kind of make sense. There is this myth perpetuated today that, um, and it has been for a really long time, that all women want and crave and just can't do without romantic love. And yet more and more of us are starting to realise that this is absolute nonsense. And the change is slow and stressful, but at least it's happening a little bit, I guess. Um, in her book Spinster, A Life of One's Own, Kate Bollock writes, Whom to marry and when it will happen? These two questions define every woman's existence, regardless of where she was raised or what religion she does or doesn't practice. She may grow up to love women instead of men, or to decide she simply doesn't believe in marriage. No matter. These dual contingencies govern her until they're answered, even if the answers are nobody and never. Men have their own problems. This isn't one of them. Which, to me, really highlights the double standard that so many of us women face today. But all it goes on to write, the single woman has always been stigmatised as a lonely old spinster with too many cats, for example. Perceptions of her have fluctuated so wildly across the decades that she's never merely a living, breathing being, but is also a lightning rod for attitudes towards women in general. She's selfless, Lady Liberty, Florence Nightingale, Mother Teresa. She's charmingly eccentric, Mary Poppins, Holly Golightly, Auntie Mame. She's powerful. Rosie the Riveter, Wonder Woman, Joan of Arc. Which is to say that in spite of her prevalence, a single woman is nearly always considered an anomaly, an aberration from the social order. Jenny Tates also talks about this in her book, How to be Single and Happy, Science-Based Strategies for Keeping Your Sanity While Looking for a Soulmate, in which she reminds us, women get the brunt of this pressure to couple up. There's still no acceptable female equivalent to a confirmed bachelor in our culture. Ages ago, older women who weren't married were looked upon as old maids, a concept that's never entirely left our psyches. Even the most well-intentioned family members and friends can make uncoupled women feel like there's something wrong with them, with comments like, don't worry, you'll meet someone, as if that's the only way you'll be okay. I can't help but feel like using phrases like season of singleness and reassuring her audience that it's okay if God decides you should stay single forever. Bethany's actually causing more harm than good because she's taking away all agency from women. She implies that every single woman should be actively striving to be in a traditional hetero marriage and that if we don't get that, it's because it was God's will. And if we do get that, it's because it was God's will. She completely discounts the experiences and choices of women who decided, I don't want to be married. I want a different kind of relationship. I don't want any relationship at all. Or even, yes, this is the relationship I want. She really does repeatedly strip herself and other women of any agency. And that is, to no exaggeration, dangerous. Uh, but I just remember like wanting so bad to get married, wanting so bad to be in a relationship. And so um, I, in my mid-20s, ended up dating again, courting, whatever you want to call it. It was like intentional dating. And um, after a while, the relationship ended and... There I was again in my mid twenties thinking like, okay, great. A few years went by. I entered another pretty intentional relationship and that one ended as well. I, it was like an amazing guy, but I just like two, we were just too different and I could not get excited about the relationship. I prayed so long and hard and at the wisdom and advice of many older godly married people, they just said, you know, just because things look great on paper doesn't always mean in real life they work out. And so that relationship ended. And here I find myself like late twenties wondering, okay, like maybe I'm going to be single forever. She's just describing such a normal situation here. And 
I really think this is something many, many women go through, and I really hate when Bethany acts like this idea of intentionally dating is something only Christian women do, or that it's this new, shocking revelation, because it's, it's really not. A lot of people do intentionally date, and it can be really helpful to have a think before you get involved with anyone. What am I looking for right now? What do I need? What can I give to someone else? And am I communicating that effectively to this person? I think the difference is that Bethany doesn't realise there are lots of different outcomes for intentional dating for people, not just marriage. I guess for me, intentional dating means being a little more self-aware and proactive than just let's just see where this is going and drag it out with no purpose. To me, intentionally dating someone can mean going into something and thinking, I just want to have fun, let's keep this casual, but still going into dating with that intention. Or it can mean, I want something long term and these are my needs for that, let's see if this is the right person to fill that gap? Gap's the wrong word, but you know what I'm trying to say. Both of those things and anything in between are intentional in my eyes, but for Bethany it specifically means with the intention of trying to marry this person and have them impregnate me. So there's a difference there, I guess. And again, the importance of defining terms. <laughs> All that aside though, it turns out Bethany does have a really average dating experience by the sounds of it. She's just like any other woman our age, you know? Sure, she didn't kiss any of her boyfriends, but she dated quite a few people with varying degrees of seriousness until she found the person that she thought was the right person for her. I just think that one, she needs to remind her audience that just because a relationship ended, that doesn't mean it was bad. It wasn't necessarily a bad relationship or a bad experience. Even relationships which end can have been wonderful at the time. Not every relationship is meant to last forever, and even bad relationships can help us learn more about who we are and what we need and want in life. And two, can we please stop pretending that getting married at 30 is crazy and old and shocking because it's not. I was 29 when I met my now partner, he was 27 I think, nearly 28, but um, I still felt incredibly young at that age and like I have most of my life ahead of me. And if we break up tomorrow or in 10 years, that doesn't mean life is over for me and I'll never experience romantic love again because I'm just too old to do that. That's just silly. It's never too late. You're never too old. You know, in fact, sometimes getting into a serious relationship when you're older can be a really, really good thing. The more sure you are of yourself, the more confident you are, the more you know yourself, the more you understand other people better so you can treat your partner better. This all increases as you get older and that's a really, really good thing. And people are generally getting married or settling down when they're older these days and that only seems like a good thing because overall people are happier in general and those relationships are proving to be more satisfying for those involved. In Rebecca Traster's book, All the Single Ladies, Unmarried Women and the Rise of an Independent Nation, she provides us with a ton of interesting stats around all of this. Now, this was published back in 2016, so things have probably changed again in the last seven, nearly eight years, and now I feel old again. Uh, but this, this is a good reference to talk about some of this stuff. So she writes, In 2009, the proportion of American women who were married dropped below 50%. <laughs> and that median age of marriage that had remained between 20 and 22 from 1890 to 1980, today the median age of first marriage for women is around 27 and much higher than that in many cities. She goes on to write, For the first time in American history, single women, including those who were never married, widowed, divorced or separated, outnumbered married men. Perhaps even more strikingly, the number of adults younger than 34 who had never married was up to 46%, rising 12 percentage points in the last decade. For women under 30, the likelihood of being married had become astonishingly small. Today, only around 20% of Americans between the ages of 18 and 29 are wed, compared to nearly 60% in 1960. And I kind of love that for us. I mean, I'm not American, but us being women around the world in general. I love that for us. Great! Some people like to pretend that divorce is getting more and more common and act like that's a bad thing, but 
it's really not. Divorce rates did increase as women got more freedoms in general. We were finally able to have our own bank accounts in the 70s to get a mortgage to buy property, we had better access to birth control so we didn't have to worry so much about the whole unwed mother stigma or jump into or stay with the first marriage. No fault divorce made it easier for unhappy couples to amicably split and continue their lives separately. And you know what? This increase in divorce rates did lead to people being happier overall. Wild, isn't it? When you let people control their own lives, they're happy about it. Shocking, I know. If you ask a lot of conservatives like Bethany, they like to throw out this argument that feminism is bad because we're seeing more and more divorce every year, but that's not actually true. As divorce became easier to get and more socially acceptable, of course people were going to go for it if it's right for them, and divorce rates did increase. But you forget that what's happening at the same time is that more and more people now have the option to wait for the right person to marry or to never marry at all. So after that initial increase in divorce, you actually start to see the rate decreasing. Because, because of two reasons. One, there are fewer marriages overall, so there are fewer to end in divorce. And two, the marriages that are happening are now more based on choice and not force, and they end up being happier overall, so less people are wanting to divorce. Who would have thought that higher quality marriages lead to lower rates of divorce? Again, shocking, and yet conservatives still like to tell us that divorce rates are increasing, and remember when actually the last few years we've started to see a decrease. Uh, in Kate Bollock Spinster, she tells us that the per capita divorce rate has dropped from its all-time peak in 1981 of about 5.3 divorces per thousand people. It has dropped since 1981, and it continues to drop. Sure, a couple of little fluctuations here and there, but the overall trend? Less divorce. At the same time though, uh, she does remind us that today nearly half of marriages end in divorce, suggesting that even though we have more choice, that doesn't necessarily mean a relationship will make us happy, and that the thing that actually makes us happy isn't a relationship, but the choice whether to be in a relationship or not. Anyway, enough of me rabbiting, let's get back to Bethany. Trust and surrender really became the theme of my life. There's a book by Nancy Lee DeMoss, she's now Nancy DeMoss Wolgamuth, but Nancy Lee, DeMo Nancy Lee DeMoss, a book called Surrender. It's just, that's the title of it, Surrender. I read that multiple times. It's a really short book and it encouraged my heart so much because I wanted to live that life of surrender. I didn't want to live life just with the plans that I had. I wanted to live life like with the plans that God had for me. And see, again, we get this theme of removing agency from people, especially women. I just can't support that at all. Sorry. Some of what that looked like was just being really intentional to get involved and build community in the season I was in. So not like dreading getting involved in church, not dreading it, getting involved with other singles, but saying, you know what, this is where I am today. So I actually joined a um, Bible study fellowship group. So they have those all over the world, BSF. Some of you might've heard of it. Um, it's a Bible study fellowship group and ours was a young adults one. So it was basically anyone 40 and under. So you have people like 18 to 40 and it is married and single. So it's a variety of people. Uh, but I was like, you know what? I want to be around other people, my own age, whether they're married, whether they're single and really start to build intentional community where we're just discussing the word, but we're also having fun together and just being really encouraged in this season. And so I did that for several years and it was amazing, built some amazing friendships there. I actually do think this is pretty great advice. And you have to remember that your things don't have to be church related. They can be anything at all. So for me, I have my writing group here in Leeds, having hobbies and such a good strong group of friends is really important whether you're single or not and so to some extent I can't fault Bethany at all for giving this advice I really can't it's a shame she's just centering it around her personal interests and saying you need to join a church group and a bible study but like it's a shame it's a little her focus still but really what she's just trying to say is like make sure you have other things going on in your life pursue your hobbies and interests and passion and I think that's good advice I'm waving my hands a lot sorry <laughs> When you are lonely, when you are all alone, it really makes your life feel like something you are surviving and something that is just miserable. Um, but when you have community, when you have deep friendships, deep community, it really makes your life feel like something you are thriving in because we were not made to do life alone. So even one day, if God has marriage in your future, your husband cannot and should not be everything for you. Again, absolutely yes. Good job, Bethany. I'm pleasantly surprised. Then Bethany just reads a bunch of emails from people who saw, who all say they're sad because they're single and then she starts debunking myths and things that people say to single people including this one. 
another one. Most girls get married. It'll definitely happen to you someday. And we've talked about that. I have said statistically, most women will get married. And that is true. According to statistics, 10 years down the road, a lot of you will probably be married. So that is true, but it won't definitely happen to you someday. There is a chance that you could be a part of a percentage that do not end up getting married today. So just because there is a percentage, a high percentage, doesn't mean that that is true for you though. Wow. Way to be encouraging, Bethany. Seriously though, I have a little bit of an issue when people use statistics as predictors for social events and occurrences and stuff like that. Now, statistics are useful. Don't get me wrong, I quote statistics in this video, plenty. Um, they show us patterns and trends and they allow us to think, oh, we can see this pattern is happening. Let's examine why. Let's have a think about what this means. What has caused this? Why is this happening? What consequences is this going to have? And when it comes to something out of our control, like say the weather, it might be useful, for example, to know there's a 40% chance of a thunderstorm that'll hit this town or something like that, for example. But when it comes to things like social interactions and patterns in human behavior, I don't think trying to predict what will happen with stats is useful because once again, it takes agency away from people. So let's look at a stat like the one we used earlier. Only around 20% of Americans between the ages of 18 and 29 are wed compared to nearly 60% in 1960. This does not mean you have a 20% chance of being married before 29. This does not mean you are three times less likely to be married before 29 than you were in 1960. What this means for the individual is, hey, these are the overall patterns, but we still need to ask, what do you want? Some people like Bethany look at stats like this and they try and use it to say, the stats will predict your behavior instead of what it actually is, which is your behavior will influence the stats. Does that make sense? In reality, humans don't sit around thinking, well, if only one in five women are married before 29 and two of my friends are already married, then it can't possibly happen for me. People aren't marrying less frequently because something out of their control is stopping them. They're marrying less frequently because it's their choice. People are choosing to wait longer to focus on other things first and realizing marriage isn't for them at all. The stats are influenced by behavior. The stats don't predict behavior. I'm going to keep saying that. Your relationships in life are not based on chance, but they're based on your actions and decisions and wants and needs. If you want a relationship, you need to take the steps to make it happen. Meet people, talk to them, ask people on dates. You can't just sit around and say, well, statistically, I should have met someone right now. So why haven't I? Just this whole thing bothers me a bit. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I need to run there. So here are three lies and three biblical truths to back them up. So the first lie, the lie that Satan wants you to believe. I won't be happy until, I'm sorry, I won't be fully satisfied until I'm married. I won't be fully satisfied until I'm married. This is a lie. And most of us won't say this out loud, but we can see it in the way that we live, in the way that we talk, in the way that we act. We view this season as a season of survival. One day when life really starts, then I'll be really happy. We believe this lie that we're in like this in-between that we can't truly be fully satisfied. Um, and we also show this in our actions. We think that like we need to get more married in order to have like a true purpose and to be satisfied. And so we manipulate circumstances. We get into relationships. We know we shouldn't. We manipulate um relationships. We are extra flirtatious around guys. We're dropping into the DMs. We're getting on online to date when we, we haven't really prayed about it or we haven't sought wisdom about it. Um, we become desperate and discontent. Um, we also can respond with anger and jealousy, uh, because we think that we need marriage in order to truly thrive. According to a recent survey, 70% of the single women said they would feel better about themselves if they had a boyfriend or attention from a guy. Mm. Okay, okay, wow. Well, a lot to unpack here. First, yes, she's right to some extent, as I was saying earlier, relations, relationships aren't everything, not at all. They can't just suddenly make everything in life better. Treat them as a nice bonus, you know, not your main meal. However, I don't agree with her shaming people for actively looking for a relationship by asking people a date, by asking people on dates or meeting people or putting yourself out there. That seems really, really silly. 
You can't do or achieve anything if you don't put effort in. And the same thing comes to dating. You're not going to actually meet people unless you put yourself out there. Asking someone out or looking for a date is not and never will be a bad thing. When it becomes your only focus in life, sure, that's probably going to impact you negatively. But there's nothing wrong with saying, you know what, I think this thing would be nice. I'm going to take some steps to find it. And finally, and I think this is the most important point and the most annoying one. What survey? You can't just say a recent survey and then give us no context for the survey. Even when I quoted stats from books and stuff, you can go and read those books and they reference exactly what survey and study it's from. Bethany gives us nothing. You cannot just give us numbers and no source. Let us know where it's from so we can look this up for ourselves. How do we know you're not just pulling numbers from your bum? <laughs> the thing is, I do believe this could legitimately be a real finding for a real survey because others have found similar things and there's still a lot of stigma online about being single and a lot of people still falling for the idea that you need a relationship to make them whole and blah blah blah. But unlike Bethany, I could provide sources for these claims that you can check out for yourself. <laughs> In her 2018 book, Jenny Tates writes about the work of social psychologist Bella DiPaolo, who studies the stigma in society around being signal. Of DiPaolo's work, Tates writes, compared to those described as in relationships, singles were rated as less extroverted, agreeable, and attractive. They were also judged as having lower self-esteem and life satisfaction. This finding was backed up by writing by Kate Bollock, which tells us, we like to pretend that only single people are lonely and coupled them to cure. This belief dates back to Plato's myth about the first human beings, shaped like spheres with four hands and legs apiece and two faces. She goes on to write, every life includes at least some loneliness. Most people merely suffer it like a recurrent pain that can subside for months or years at a time and then blaze up when conditions are just right. Moving to a new city where you don't know anyone, staying in a bad marriage, losing someone you love, even just running an errand, when out of nowhere you feel at your core how alone we all are in this world. And it takes everything you've got to not set your basket of groceries on the linoleum and walk out to the supermarket. So she highlights in her book Spinster how every woman goes through periods of happiness and contentment and loneliness and depression, and how this is something we can work through and work on ourselves and not just hope or expect a relationship to fix. Feelings of loneliness are common when you, whether you're in a relationship or not. Being single doesn't automatically mean you'll be lonely, and being in a relationship doesn't automatically mean you won't be. Lonely is a problem that we all have to solve as individuals, but it has many solutions, not just, ooh, being in a relationship and get married. Tates goes on to tell us more studies about relationships and happiness, for example, in a remarkable study looking at more than 24,000 people over the course of 15 years, utilizing data from something called the German Socioeconomic Panel Study, Michigan State University professor Richard Lucas and his colleagues noticed, an, noticed that on average, most people reverted back to their happiness baseline after an initial emotional uptick following marriage. Lucas and his colleagues concluded, on average, people only get a very small boost from marriage approximately only one tenth of one point on an 11 point scale. That's a mere one percent. The authors shared the unsexy finding that there were as many people who ended up less happy after marriage as there were who reported to be more content. So this suggests that even though a lot of people expected marriage to be a big boost of their happiness, most of their happiness was actually, just in life in general, was actually decided by other factors going on in their lives. So, you know, their job, their money struggles, their health, their family life in general. Basically, marriage will not fix everything for you. <sighs> One more proof? Okay. Furthermore, <laughs> Tate's references another study, which is Research led by sociologist David Johnson at the Pennsylvania State University suggests that people who marry and stay married tend to report feeling above average life satisfaction before they wed, which again supports the idea that marriage arises from happiness, not the other way around. Positive effect or feeling grateful and acting upbeat is not only related to feeling happy, it's strongly associated with living a longer life. As for Bethany's recent survey, I couldn't find evidence of which one she was referencing by googling her stats that she read out, so I have no idea how legitimate that is. I tried looking in the singles workbook that came with the course because, like the marriage course one, had like a couple of... well there wasn't really sources in there, it was just like, go buy this course and this book and so on, but I thought maybe she'd have put a source for it, but 
literally nothing. So I have no idea what she was referencing or if it's legit, so what can we do? Then she just ends this lesson by going into some more stuff about how God doesn't owe you anything and it's a lot of the same stuff we've heard before, so let's skip over it and bored, let's move on. Session 8. We have three more to go. We've got this, guys. We can get through this. Session 8 is titled Managing Your Cycle, Hormones and Fertility, and honestly this was the lesson that I was personally least interested in because this just, yeah, not really my kind of thing, not what I'm into. This lesson features Bethany, not Bethany at all. I mean, it does feature Bethany, sadly. <laughs> This lesson features Rebecca Gill, who is also one of Bethany's sisters. Now this confuses me a bit in general because I did some googling uh, before I even watched this lesson and it turns out that Rebecca sells this guide called The Well-Nourished Woman for $50, which is what she describes as a step-by-step -step guide to balancing your hormones, healing your gut and working out with your cycle. And she posts a lot about hormones and food on Instagram but she doesn't have any qualifications. Also, she's charging $50 for just like a download of a crappily made book. Where do these women get their prices from? Because they're absurd. Hormones are insanely complicated and the people who help work with people's hormones generally have had many, many years of medical training. It's so complicated. I only studied them for like one brief module at uni when I was doing biomed and even I don't feel qualified enough to give other people advice on them. So Rebecca hasn't even had that. She's not even had like a tenth of that, and yet she's... I did wonder for a while why Bethany chose to include her sister in this and not an actual expert on the topic, and I was like, maybe she didn't have to pay if it was her sister. <laughs> I don't know, either way it's kind of concerning. Um, I did look at Rebecca's Instagram and I found this one comment from a person saying they were interested in the PDF but wanted to know if Rebecca had any qualifications in nutrition, to which Rebecca replied, it is based on my own experience and research I've done. It's one thing to be like, yeah, I've done some research, so let me tell you about this cool thing I found out about volcanoes. That's fine, I guess. Yeah, cool. But it's another to be like, yeah, I did some research, now pay me $50 for me to mess around with your health and hormones. You know what I mean? It feels irresponsible. Another person left a comment, I've always been a follower and fan of Girl Defined, so this is not a personal attack on you. However, I'm currently studying to be a nutritionist. It's the hardest three years I've ever been through in terms of education. I thought I knew a lot before starting the process to get qualified, but now I realise I didn't know anywhere near as much as I do now. I'm still learning and have a long way to go. I appreciate you've learned a lot and want to share that to help people, but selling self-written material when you're not a qualified nutritionist is incredibly dangerous. And it's also very insulting to people like myself who are taking time and money to get qualified in order to give safe advice to individuals. I really disagree with selling nutritional information without having nutritional qualifications to back it up. It can be quite harmful as every individual is different and one size doesn't fit all. That's where sometimes functional testing is important. I wish you all the best with your passion and so glad you're feeling better, but please don't sell material like this if you aren't qualified in the field. Can we all just have a little round of applause for this person, please? Thank you. Good job, person. Thank you. I also downloaded a free sample of Rebecca's guide and it's just full of pages of quotes from other people, which I'm not really sure if she got permission to use because this is clearly not transformative content, but I mean, at least she's referencing that they're quotes, I guess? That's something. Rebecca also never bothers to actually define her terms or explain anything, it seems, at least not in this little sample. Uh, like here, what is a volatile organic compound and why should I be worried about them? How do we know they might be connected with headaches and cancer? If they are connected, then what research has been done into their use in candles and the direct impact on our health? If research has found these to be harmful, then how are candle manufacturers still allowed to use them? I want to know more. You can't just make some vague claims like this and then not back anything up or explain it more and expect people to pay for this stuff. She then has this whole page on toxic products, which may be the vaguest term I've heard in one of these things. She writes that, I have almost completely switched over every single product I use to be non-toxic. What does that even mean in this context? It is all so vague and not useful. It's like, imagine if I put together a book where I was like, hi guys, I'm a nutritionist now and I recommend you all eat good food and avoid bad food and definitely avoid poison foods. I personally have cut out nearly all poison foods from my diet because 
my digestive system is a really big part of my body, so now I only eat non-poisonous foods. That's useful, right? Give me money! On this page, Rebecca tells us, I use a castor oil pack probably five times a week for about an hour or two in the morning while I'm making breakfast or doing my quiet time. I used to wear it at night before I was married, but that isn't happening anymore. I don't think my husband would love that. Haha. Ha. Basically, you put the castor oil on a piece of wool or cloth and lay it on your abdomen, specifically over your liver. It's a great way to cleanse the liver and detox the body. There is no medical evidence to suggest that this actually has any positive impact on the liver. Rebecca is talking out of her bum. The only source Rebecca provides for this on how or why this works is from the company that sells these castor oil packs and it contains vague, unproven nonsense claims like It's a combination of both mechanical and neurological because the Queen of Thrones castor oil pack stimulates the body's skin receptors which stimulate the natural oxytocin, oxytocin feedback loop activating the vagus nerve, shifting the body into a rest and digest state where liver detox is optimised. A lot of big words there, sounds a little technical, but really it's incredibly vague and not really saying much at all, and when you look at THEIR source for that claim, it's very confusing, because their source, the paper, is actually about how human skin-to-skin -skin contact and social touch can stimulate certain receptors on the skin, which then stimulate oxytocin production, and can help us feel good and enter the rest and digest state. In other words, the paper is about how being touched by other people feels nice and can help us relax. What does this have to do with your castor oil packs? And did you really think no one would bother to check your claims? Having human to human skin contact is not the same as you stuffing some castor oil on your stomach. <laughs> so with all this in mind, I did not have high hopes for this lesson, but let's give it a watch. And funnily enough, Rebecca doesn't even- sorry, oh my god. Bethany doesn't even give Rebecca a chance to speak for the entire first minute of this lesson. And why am I getting their names so mixed up? They're not even that similar. Um, well, I mean, it started probably growing up in like childhood, you know, um, I think, and I share a lot of this in my ebook, but a, a lot of the mindset that I had around food was um, based on the people around me or just like the culture at the time. Um, and I, a lot of that was very diet culture, yo-yo dieting, like everything was about like being on a diet. And I just remember like, <laughs> there was like, people were doing like the lemonade cleanse and like the raw food diet, like so many different diets were going on. And I just remember that kind of being like, oh, okay, well, if we all have to be on diets, it's because we all have to be like really skinny. Like we have to, you know, fit this status quo or whatever. Yeah. And so that kind of mindset really was hurtful as like I grew up because that, and that's just like, that's the culture we live in. You know, it's like everybody yeah. everywhere. Like you get on Instagram and it's like, oh, like meal replacement shakes and like, you know, ways to like lose weight or like, you know, yeah. like weighing yourself or whatever. And so that's just, you know, that can be so hurtful for like a girl, especially that's yeah. just trying to figure out like, hey, well, like, am I the right size? Or like, you know, do yeah. I need to lose weight? Do I need to, do I need to go on these diets that everyone else is going on? And so a lot of that started when I was younger. And then as I grew older, that definitely was like always there. Like I always needed to be on some sort of diet or if I wasn't, then I felt really bad. Like, oh, we've got to do something like, okay, well this week I'm going to start, you know, cutting out sugar or something. I think one year, my New Year's resolution was literally like, I'm not going to eat sugar for the whole year. And that totally wow. did not last like even a month, <laughs> but it was. Um, a lot of that just caused so much stress on my mindset and on my body. And then just like how I even viewed my body that I was never, I, I could never be enough almost in some ways. Like I, I, I could never be the right size. Cause I like, who's deciding what the right size is, you know, it's like how, how skinny is skinny enough. <laughs> okay. So we are clearly talking about major disordered eating and body image issues here. Like really, really serious stuff that affects so many people, not just women. I think this is really serious stuff to talk, it, it's really important stuff to talk about. And I just, one, I guess I don't really understand why it's in a sex course for single Christian women, but okay, I guess. And all that said, I think these sensitive complex topics should be spoken about by a professional and handled respectfully by a professional, not just a woman who has struggled and is still struggling and did a little bit of googling, you know?
I'm all for people sharing their own stories online, but to sell their story and pass it off as them being an expert nutritionist because they struggle with an eating disorder themselves just doesn't quite sit right with me. She's had no formal training. She's had no real training. She doesn't have the qualifications. And so I think as I got probably like later teens, so I'm, I'm 24 now, um, but I think later teens, I started getting more specifically like gut related issues. Um, and then that's, that led into like early 20s, so like 20, 21, 22, that age range. And that just looked like slowly just getting like really bad bloating and heartburn and constipation. <laughs> um, I'm just saying, but if you're a nutritionist who giggles like a child when you say the word constipation, then maybe you aren't really mature enough to be teaching a course on nutrition. She then says that her entire knowledge base essentially comes from the fact that she worked with a nutritionist and her nutritionist really helps her and it took two to three years for her to start feeling okay and better about food. But this is kind of confusing because if things got really bad when she was 22, and it took two to three years for her to start feeling better, but Rebecca is now only 24, then she really must have become an expert in things overnight, you know? None of this is adding up. Yeah, well, and it goes right into, you ended up writing a book, an instant downloadable book, sorry, just dropped my phone, um, <laughs> called The Well-Nourished Woman. And it's interesting because I actually used the same nutritionist that Rebecca did because I had all sorts of migraines. I was going through all, like a bunch of miscarriages. And so that's what I'm telling you. Like you think you're thinking like, okay, well, what, what the heck? Like, why does it matter? Okay. I'm bloated or like, I can't really eat anything. Like what's the big deal. But a lot of you are on here because you want to be a mom one day. You want to get married one day. Or some people just want to feel healthy because they like to take care of themselves, not because they want to pop out babies. So if you're listening and you're like, okay, what the heck did she do? What are the nitty gritty mm. details? I strongly encourage you. And I'll put a link in um, your notes so that you can grab a copy of her ebook. She did not leave a link in the workbook. There are no links in the workbook. <laughs> I'm also so sick of this pay for my resource so I can tell you to go pay for more resources thing. It is so scammy. You talked about body image and you said how when you were eating really restrictively, you started losing weight. And I remember that point in your life where <laughs> I was actually more concerned. I was like, Max, you're withering away. Like, <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, Cause you were just so incredibly skinny cause you couldn't like eat anything. But I know it's hard because then on one hand you have people being like, oh my gosh, you look amazing. Cause we live in a psycho world where basically if you're like a skeleton, people praise you, which is ridiculous. But then we're so mm -hmm. unhealthy. All right, Bethany, it's one thing for you to talk about health, but there's no need for you to get all shamey with people who are skinnier than you. Like, I have no problem with her talking about the health problems associated with being too thin or too fat, eating too much or too little, but when you start referring to people as skeletons and saying people are psycho for liking the way certain bodies look, that's just unnecessary, isn't it? Uh, but I just want to know, going back to your singleness, before, or maybe even when you and Daniel started dating, how did body image and like your view of yourself impact your view of dating and marriage? And even you can talk about now, mm -hmm. like, what has your journey been like specifically with body image? I do think this is a very good question, but at this point we've got 10 minutes and th yeah, and 38 seconds into the lesson and we haven't even mentioned anything from the lesson's title. So I'm kind of confused where this is going. I think it's interesting because I think at that point you're kind of like, oh yeah, like, well, he's so cute and this is great and I feel great about myself. And so you know, that once you get married though, you're like, okay, well, but like, it, you know, we're stuck for life. So it's like, does he, like, does he still like me? You know, like, obviously he like loves me so much, but like, you just have those thoughts yeah. about, okay, but that person's like thinner than I am. Or like, you know, yeah. what, like you're obviously like way more exposed when you get married than before. And so you're just, you know, you kind of compare yourself to other women or you kind of doubt like, okay, wait, does he actually like, is he just stuck with me? Or does he really want to be with me? Like, does he really yeah. love me? Yeah, that doesn't sound healthy. And this is literally epitomizing all the problems I mentioned earlier. Again, I get body image issues and stuff like that are really important to talk about. But again, I just don't think Rebecca is the right person to be talking about this. That much is clear, right? Bethany then says that our bodies change with age, which is true. And that it's only the world who obsesses about youth and not godly women which I think is just silly since abuse of minors and grooming of girls is disproportionately high amongst fundamentalist Christian communities. Isn't it? 
Yeah, I'm looking at you, Pastor Joshua Wesley, or as you might know him, Mr. I'm in my mid-twenties and my girlfriend is finally 18 because I've been grooming her since she was 14. Look how that's paid off. Then Bethany does say some genuinely nice stuff about, you know, confidence being the most attractive thing about people. Cool. And then 16 minutes in, Bethany finally asks about the female cycle and what it tells us about our health. I want to talk more specifically about the female cycle. And that is something that might seem like, what, why are we talking about this? But I have learned more and more what a marker of health that is. And so I'm just curious to learn from you, Rebecca, someone who's studied this a lot more than me. What does the female cycle teach women about their health and how can like our single women watching like, I don't know, use their cycle as a way to figure out if their hormones are balanced, if they're not, all mm -hmm. the things. And we kind of view it from like almost a negative lens. Like, oh, it's so annoying. It's such a burden. Like, I, I mean, it is, it is hard. It is like, let's be real. It is annoying. It is hard. But having more of that just like overall negative mindset around it yeah. can just be so hurtful because like whether or not you're trying to get pregnant right now, like your body is always just wanting to get pregnant. Like every month it wants to get pregnant, even when you're single, even when you're married, like it, that's just God's natural design. And I yeah. think that's so beautiful. Like bringing and nurturing life is amazing. And so I think instead of viewing it so much from like a negative perspective, view it more as like, like, wow, this is such a gift that I am able to bring life to the world. If I didn't have it, I wouldn't be able to bring life. And yeah. you may not want that right now, but one day you may. And so we are absolutely allowed to have our own feelings about our bodies, including being disgusted with certain body parts on our own bodies if we want. If you want kids and value your fertility, then yeah, great. Absolutely feel this way. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm not going to sit here and have people like Rebecca tut at me and tell me I'm terrible because I don't find my body doing something that I don't want it to do beautiful. For me, I never want kids, so I hate, 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 hate everything about my cycle. I hate my terrible debilitating periods. I hate ovulation cramps. I hate the constant fear and risk and stress of a proper pregnancy. It's exhausting and I am thoroughly disgusted by what is inside my body. Last weekend I ended up in hospital overnight because I had an ovarian cyst which ruptured and it was the worst pain I've ever experienced in my life. It was horrific. I spent the entire day in hospital having multiple tests done, peeing in cups constantly, having my blood taken, going for abdominal scans, uh, making sure there wasn't too serious damage and my ovary hadn't like got itself twisted in the process and stuff like that. You can probably still see I've got like little bruises all over me from where the student doctor <laughs> Didn't place a cannula right. Bless her, she struggled. As of recording, and even when I was writing the script, I am still in pain. <laughs> like, it still hurts. And I think the worst part of it was, like, while I was in so much pain and suffering, all I could think about was that it was a part of my body causing this pain that I didn't even want in the first place, that I didn't even want to be there. There was this one point where I was, like, curled up in my hospital bed, like, clutching my stomach in agony and crying because I felt like all of this was happening for no good reason. I don't want my body to ovulate. I don't want ovaries. I don't want a uterus. And even though I don't ever want any of that in there and it disgusts me that it's in there, it was now causing me even more suffering and pain on top of that. And I'm sorry if I just don't find anything beautiful in that at all. And I'm not the only one who feels that way. I have read stories from trans guys and non-binary people about how much dysphoria they feel when they get their period, or even just things like experiencing ovulation cramps and how if they had to go through pregnancy as well, it would just be too much for them. I had this one guy reach out to me on Instagram when I was talking about my ovarian cyst, and he said that he'd had one as well. And it was like, not only was he dealing with the excruciating pain from the cyst, but then it was bringing on like more body dysmorphia. And he was like, I'm a guy, I shouldn't even have this in here. And it was a struggle for him as well. So I don't think that's beautiful for any of us. I just feel like maybe Rebecca and Bethany need a little more compassion and empathy for other people. Because while it's wonderful that they value this part of their body and find it beautiful, surely they have to realize that not everyone feels that way and you shouldn't shame us for not feeling that way. Rebecca then attempts to get scientific, but it's just so vague. I think some of the big reasons that you even want to be having like a consistent cycle is that it it can um show you your hormones um because in your cycle obviously you have like lots of different hormones that are rising and dropping and rising and dropping throughout the whole like 28 days month period 
Um, and if those are off or you're not having it, then that means like you're not ovulating or those hormones aren't like rising and falling like they should mm. be. And that can just honestly cause a lot of problems like further down the line, like gut issues or um, just really bad, like mood swings or um, obviously like not able to get pregnant. That's a huge problem <laughs> with not mm. having a consistent period. Again, I think this is important to talk about, but it's so vague and basic that it's not really helping anyone or anything, right? At this point, if this was an actual lesson taught by actual experts, the things I'd like to see are like, okay, so what specifically are these hormones that you're talking about? Where are they produced in the body? What do they do? How do they fluctuate throughout the month? What does this mean for the average woman on a day-to-day -day basis? What is an irregular cycle? What are, what are the other signs that there's an irregularity in hormone production or something like that? And let's talk about more than just the reproductive system, yeah? Because reproductive hormones can affect more things than just what's happening in terms of sex, puberty, reproduction and so on. Let's cover that. Let's also cover non-reproductive hormones as well. So you've got your met metabolic hormones, mood hormones, growth hormones, homeostasis hormones and so on. Let's talk about them too, they're important. And then to get back to periods, let's talk about exactly what is happening physically in our body at each stage of our cycle and what's normal and what isn't and what we can expect and what should be a worry. Let's get really specific, you know? But they don't do any of that. If you are interested in finding out the answers to those questions and so much more, then I thoroughly recommend Dr. Jolene Brighton's book, Is This Normal? It's one I've mentioned before in this video, but chapter nine of that book is titled, Is My Menstrual Cycle Normal? And it covers all of this stuff and more. She also covers topics related to menopause. She covers topics related to conditions like PCOS, PMS, and the lesser known but incredibly difficult PMDD. Chapter 10 of her book, then covers is my period normal and goes into what a period actually is, what you should expect and when you should be concerned. And then chapter 12 goes into the link between things like a good sleep schedule, good nutrition and how that helps regulate your hormones and monthly cycle. It's everything Bethany makes out this lesson of hers is about except Brighton actually delivers in her book and knows what she's talking about and has the experience and it's a lot less expensive. And then finally, chapter 13 of Dr. Brighton's book covers what lifestyle changes can help if you have certain hormone imbalances. The only real fact that Rebecca keeps repeating over and over is how it's not normal to skip or miss periods and how that's a sign of a hormonal imbalance, a hormonal imbalance. But I think that's something that every person with a basic such as sex education knows, right? So I'm not sure why she's making out that it's this big groundbreaking thing. But that kind of just speaks to me about the lack of education in this family and it makes me quite sad. <laughs> it's so sad because so many women who get married, they don't understand their body. They don't understand their cycle. And Yeah, because they're not being educated properly. And whose fault is that? <clears throat> Your parents. So can you talk to us about other aspects of our health, things that can show us whether we have bad health, good health? I know mm. like when I worked with a nutritionist, um, your... <laughs> <laughs> like pooping was a big part of it too. Like, are you yes. pooping daily? What does it look like? So what are other signs outside of the cycle of good or bad hormone health? Mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, a, a big sign that I definitely see now, real like kind of I did being able to identify it is so many women, like if you notice, like they're like, oh, I'm so cold. And it's like a hundred degrees outside and they like bring a sweater with them. And you're like, how are you cold right now? Like, yeah. it's so hot. Yeah, because a lot of women struggle with poor circulation and generally lower body temperatures. It can be a marker of ill health. It might not be. It is a lot more complex than that. Rebecca then just goes through more basic things like hair loss, weak nails, issues with bowel movements. There's nothing really new here, no specifics. It's all quite dull. This is just kind of one big ad for Rebecca's terrible book and not actually anything to really do with anything. I don't really get what it's doing in this course except to give her sister a boosted sales. Bethany then throws out stuff like painful periods are also a sign of bad health but then just skips over it and doesn't talk about it in any day detail at all. And honestly at this point I think there is a larger and much more important conversation to have here and it's one I've discussed briefly in other videos too and that is the way that in general women's health problems are not taken as seriously as men's. Women's pain in general is not taken as seriously as men's pain and this leads to a huge disparity in healthcare for men and women. I know just talking personally, um, I've been seeing doctors for like three years now about my bad periods, maybe longer, and they still don't know exactly what the cause is or 
what to do about it. It's a night. Well, actually, no. I do have a solution now. Um, it is a nightmare. But I'll I'll tell you about my health stuff in a bit because one of those things. Um, but if you've seen any of my other feminist videos on my channel which touch on healthcare in general, then you'll have seen me quote a great, great book called Invisible Women, Data Bias in a World Designed for Men by Caroline Criado Perez. She writes that period pain, also known as dysmenorrhea, similarly affects up to 90% of women and according to the American Academy of Family Physi Physicians, it affects daily life of around 1 in 5 women. The level of pain women experience on a monthly basis has been described as almost as bad as a heart attack, but despite how common it is and how bad the pain can be, there is precious little that doctors can or will do for you. In other videos I've spoken about how Viagra could be a fantastic treatment for bad period pain, but so far serious studies into it just haven't been done because it's not been deemed an important enough issue. Yet they were fine funding a study into using it for erectile dysfunction. Apparently erectile dysfunction is important enough, but women's debilitating pain isn't. <sighs> right. And this isn't the only problem either. With issues like endometriosis, according to Perez, it takes an average of 8 years to diagnose in the UK, an average of 10 years to diagnose in the US, and there is currently no cure. And although the disease is thought to affect 1 in 10 women, which is around 176 million worldwide, it took until 2017 for England's National Institute for Health and Care Excellence to release its first ever guidance to doctors for dealing with it. Their main recommendation? Listen to women. And it's not just when it comes to periods and anything to do with our cycles as well. Just in general, women's pain isn't taken as seriously as men's. To quote Perez one more time, even if they're treated for their pain, women routinely have to wait longer than men to receive that treatment. And this is especially true for women of colour, in particular black women. Alison J. McGregor writes in her book, Sex Matters, How Male-Centric Medicine Endangers Women's Health and What We Can Do About It, which is another book I really recommend. She writes, The discrimination women encounter as medical patients is magnified when they are black, Asian, indigenous, Latinx, or ethnically diverse, when their access to health services is, re is restricted, and when they don't identify with the gender norms medicine ascribes to biological womanhood. Pardon you. She goes on to say that structural racism intertwines insidiously with gender bias. 22% of black women in the United States have experienced discrimination when they visited a doctor or clinic. The racist discounting of black women's physical and psychological pain means they are prescribed fewer medications and are more vulnerable to misdiagnosis or having their diagnoses dangerously delayed. And these disparities are killing them. And this is exactly the same across numerous countries, including the UK. And then of course we need to consider what is known as Yentl syndrome as well. Uh, Perez defines this as the phenomenon whereby women are misdiagnosed and poorly treated unless their symptoms or diseases conform to that of men. So basically a lot of the time when illnesses are studied, uh, they're studied in men. So the common heart attack symptoms, for example, that we're taught to look for, for example, like pain in the arm and stuff like that, um, they're actually only really common in men. Women generally display very different symptoms of a heart attack, which is why most women's heart problems go undiagnosed or misdiagnosed, and therefore uh, women are more likely to die or have serious consequences from a heart attack than men are. It's the same for a lot of treatments too. Most clinical trials over the years have been carried out on men or women who were at a stage in their monthly cycle where their hormones were most similar to men's. Therefore, a lot of these trials didn't take into account the fact that the fact that many of these medications can not only affect women differently to men, but will affect women differently at different points in their cycles. A lot of the time they also don't take into account pregnancy and how that can interfere with medication, or how medication can interfere with pregnancy, which is how we ended up with issues like thalidomide slipping through the neck, causing thousands of babies to be born with disabilities. Anyway, my point is that having conversations around women's health is really, really important and one that we should be having. And I kind of wish that Bethany and Rebecca touched on this because they had a really good opportunity to talk about this and they just missed it. It's a shame. I do keep finding myself asking, what are people actually paying for with this course? Like both of us did, we did like deep dives into our health. And that's something you can definitely do. Connect with Rebecca if you're wanting more details on that. If you're like, wow, I want to like, like, I think I have serious health issues. You can connect. Like what's the best way to connect with you if they have more questions or if they're like wanting to be pointed in a specific direction? How would they reach out to you? 
Yeah, probably mostly through Instagram. It's just at the okay. Rebecca Gill. And it's R E B K A H. <laughs> G-I-L-L. -L. Perfect. Okay. So you yes, can totally connect with Rebecca there. Send her a DM if you're wanting more details, like on any of the things that she's mentioned. Um, again, like I've said, starting with the well-nourished woman, her book, which you'll have the link to is definitely the best place to start with. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No, sorry. No. If you think you have serious health problems, do not do this. If you have a serious health problem, go see a doctor. I know the healthcare system is screwed in America, but I don't care where you are. Your first port of call should always be, when you think there's something serious, a trained professional, and not just a random 24 year old on Instagram who just learned the basics of what menstruation is. Just to give you a little bit of a personal example about the importance of actually going to see a medical professional. Um, in one of my last videos, I told you all about like some health problems I've been having and stuff like that. And um, a lot of you gave me your ideas for what it could be down in the comments. Um, like, I didn't ask, you just get, did. And like, I appreciate your concern and everything. And you all meant well. And you were like, hey, maybe ask your doctor about this and this sort of thing. And um, all, all good and everything. But the thing is, none of you got it right. Not a single person. And that's because, no, no offense, but you're not my doctors. And this is the importance of actually going to see your doctor. So a lot of people were saying to me, like, it could be mm. chronic fatigue, it could be long COVID, it could be um, fibromyalgia, it could be... God, I can't even think what some of the other things were. Um, I think thyroid problems were a big thing that came up, um, and that was one of the things I was worried about as well, because my mum has thyroid problems. You all had these different suggestions for stuff it could be, and not one of you got it right. Um, Turns out the problem I have is a really serious gastritis. Um, so basically because I have had bad periods for so long, I have to take a lot of ibuprofen every month to deal with the pain. Because I also have anxiety issues, I take sertraline every day to help with anxiety basically. These two medications together can really irritate your stomach when you take them for a long period of time. So <laughs> that's what started to happen to me. And my stomach lining was getting incredibly irritated it's incredibly sore, my stomach is incredibly tender, which led to an overproduction of acid. Because of that, I couldn't eat as much at a time, and that was leading to the feelings of sickness and nausea every time I tried to eat. It was causing these hot flushes, it was causing a lot of like dizzy spells and stuff like that. And then because I wasn't physically eating enough, my stomach was getting more irritated and the lining was getting more sore and I was producing more acid and it was a big, terrible, cyclical thing. That in turn caused all my other problems because I thought, because I thought, well, I'm eating until I feel sick. That must be mean, mean I'm eating until I'm full. So I must be eating enough. I was not eating enough. Turns out I managed to offset a lot of it by taking like a vitamin and mineral supplement, but in a lot of ways I'm a little bit malnourished. I'm physically not getting enough food. I'm not getting enough calories in the day, which is what led to the mass fatigue, led to the dizzy spells, led to um, a suppressed immune system, which was meaning I was getting all these colds really frequently. All of it came back to gastritis. And I wouldn't have found that out without going to see my actual GP and getting tests done and all of that stuff. So that's what it is. I'm on a medication now, which over the next two months should help repair my stomach lining. I have, um, I'm getting a consultation with a nurse soon so I can get an implant, not an implant, um, I get the coil fitted so that will hopefully stop my periods so I won't have the issue with period pain and then after that we're going to do a review to see how my stomach lining has healed and whether I'll need to take the medication for as long as I'm on the sertraline or if I'll be okay without the medication and hopefully the sertraline won't cause any more damage. We'll see. I tell the story to say Medical professionals are professionals for a reason. If you have a problem, don't listen to some random person online. Actually, please go see your doctor. And I know, I know, American healthcare is absolutely screwed. I understand that, it's a terrible system, but that doesn't mean you should listen to ignorant people online. It, uh, I just, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what to tell you. Like in singleness, how can women specifically, like what are some foods they can start incorporating? Okay, it can't just be me. This is a bizarre question, right? Like a really, really bizarre question. I'm also confused because one of the things that Rebecca recommends is pasteurized dairy or raw milk. But aren't they opposites? You have, and if you're able to get access to it, I know like food is just like, can be so expensive, but if you're able to get like, 
pasture-raised meat, pasture-raised dairy, things like that, or raw milk. Isn't raw milk unpasteurized dairy? I'm not a food expert, so please tell me if I'm wrong, but unpasteurized milk and raw milk is debatable in its safety. Some people say it's very unsafe. So if she's saying, yeah, have pasteurized milk or raw milk, they're opposites. I just, I, do, I don't think she realizes what she's saying. It's very confusing. It's very odd, right? She then offers the absolutely groundbreaking advice of getting eight hours of sleep a night. Shocking. Um, and then Bethany ends with this incredibly dangerous advice. I just encourage you, you know, like don't go to the traditional outlets of learning about health and their recommendations, because if you look at most people, especially if you're in America, we're really not doing too well. So I think we need to start going to different resources that actually seem to have maybe the life and the health that we want. Um, and Rebecca is one of those. Again, stop it. And then there's a final all birth control bad for like 30 seconds, which is something I think I covered in my review of the marriage course, so I won't go over here. This video was already far too long and my Kubi is so grumbly because she wants to go for a walk, bless her. Yeah, also, again, random thought, isn't it interesting that Bethany gave this sister a proper flattering thumbnail for the lesson, but not Kristen? Mm -hmm. Okay, we have two more lessons to go, but I'm gonna go take Kyra on a walk because she's my little grumble pig and she is having a grumble grumble and she has been so grumpy while I've been filming this last bit. So, I'm gonna take a break, take her out, and I'll see you guys soon. Oh, hi again. You might notice it is yet again another day. This video, yeah, oh my God, it has been a marathon to film. It just, it keeps going and going, doesn't it, baby? And it's so exhausting. And in some ways, it's a good thing that I got so exhausted. Uh, it was actually two days ago now when I was filming the last bit because it turns out my microphone wasn't plugged in properly and it all sounds like it was recorded inside of one of those old metal dustbins so <sighs> at least this should hopefully have decent audio as long as nothing goes wrong. I'm currently absolutely exhausted because of the wonderful sponsor of this video. I am on a little bit of a deadline with it so I'm working very hard. I'm getting no sleep at the minute but it's gonna be worth it isn't it Kubi there? It's gonna be worth it! So, with that in mind, let's get through this together. We've got this. Session nine is led by Bethany Beale herself and is called Sex Questions Single Women Are Too Afraid to Ask. I figured going into this that a lot of this stuff would be stuff that Bethany had already kind of covered in the videos so far or stuff that she covered in the marriage course. So I figured this would be more of a recap and we could probably get through it quite quickly. So, let's take a look at some clips. What's up? You made it. You are almost to the very last session and today is going to be a blast because I have on my phone a ton of questions that you all have submitted through Instagram, through polls, um, and they're all questions specifically by single women and they're probably really similar to the questions you have. And question number one, how do I control my sex drive in a godly way as a single woman? What if I'm single forever? So, sometimes when we talk about sex drive, we can think of it in different ways. So let's kind of clarify that first. Um, so let's see, I have heard people, um, let's see, I'm going to just look up a definition for you all. So I was going to say libido, maybe a term that some of you all are familiar with, um, libido. So this is according to just like the internet, like the main description libido, which means sex drive or the desire for sex varies dramatically from one person to the next. It also varies depending on a person's preferences and life circumstances. Libido can be affected by medical conditions, hormone levels, medications, lifestyle, and relationship problems. Okay, on the one hand, yes, brilliant, I have to commend Bethany straight off the bat because she is finally defining her terms. Brilliant. But, Bethany, you knew you were going to be talking about this. You had the questions prepped beforehand. Could you not have found a definition beforehand and prepared it instead of just googling on the spot and reading the first thing that comes up without checking that it's the best definition, that it's from a credible source, that it's useful? It just it kind of screams laziness to me, you know? A little frustrating. So if you, when we talk about sex drive, when we talk about libido, it's just a desire for sexual activity. Um, so I would say that when you think of sex drive, a libido, I think those are very like in a physical sense, like you want to be close to someone, you want to experience that physical pleasure. Um, and what we've learned throughout the this course is that true 
intimacy, like true physical sexual intimacy is so much more than just like these urges and the bodily exchanges. So um, as Christian women, we need to think of our sex drive a little bit more holistically and not just like, oh, I'm like this animal and I have these urges and I need to get them satisfied. Um, because if that were the case, then we would just be animals and we would like mate and it wouldn't be personal. Um, like when animals mate, it's not like an intimate relationship. This is so weird, but you know, um, they are just doing what like is in their nature and there isn't a relationship. But we are animals, Bethany. We literally are. You can't deny that. But yeah, other than the whole animal thing, just so much of what Bethany is saying here is so limiting and shaming for people. Again, these themes of shame are coming back up over and over again. And it's something that we really need to work hard to try and combat. Sex is a natural part of being a living being. And I say not just human and not just animal because sex is something that is there in pretty much all living creatures. Some living creatures do reproduce asexually, but for the most part, sex is a very normal thing. But it's also really important to remember that there is a huge amount of fluctuation in terms of what normal is. That is, there are lots and lots of normals when it comes to sex. Some people want lots of sex, some people want it not at all. Some people want sex with the opposite gender, some people want sex with the same gender, some people want both. Some people only want one partner, some people want many. Despite what Bethany is saying here, there isn't actually one right way to experience attraction and desire. What is normal to you is going to be different to what is normal to me, but they're both still normal. Some of us want emotional intimacy before sex, some of us need sex before emotional intimacy. Some of us can disconnect them completely. For some of us, they're completely intertwined and always will be. And for some of us, that changes and fluctuates throughout our entire lives. And I don't know what this is. <laughs> what is mama doing? Am I bad dancing? Yeah. If at any or all parts of your life, you only want a physical relationship with someone with no emotional connection, as long as you are communicating that to your partner or partners beforehand, there is nothing wrong with that. Again, coming back to a book that I've spoken about so much in this video, Beyond Shame by Matthias Roberts, he tells us that we need to basically um, evaluate our own personal core values when it comes to sex. He writes that, once we know our core values, we have a ground from which to evaluate our decisions. We can look at the choices we're making and ask, does this align with who I want to be? And honestly, that is the only hard and fast rule you need to follow other than obvious things to do with consent and so on. Be consensual, be safe, be respectful to your partner or partners. Everything else comes down to does this align with who I want to be? And you can reevaluate. I see, Kyra. <laughs> and you can reevaluate that as many times as you want and figure it out. And at any time in your life. <laughs> you are such a grumble pig. Would you like a snack? Yeah? Rebecca Traster has a really interesting discussion about female sexuality, particularly among single women in her book, All the Single Ladies. Definitely, I think this is another one really worth a read, as are all the books I've mentioned in this video, actually. Um, I don't really have the time to go into the nuances of it all right now, but to give you a very vague overview, she argues that the vast increase in the number of single women is to be celebrated, not because single don't... <sighs> Not because singleness is in and of itself better or more desirable than coupledom. There are now an infinite number of alternate routes open. They wind around combinations of love, sex, partnership, parenthood, work, and friendship at different speeds. Single female life is not prescription, but it's opposite. Liberation. She goes on to say many unmarried women have sex. Some of them even have so much sex. After all, the increased freedom to have socially sanctioned sex with contraception, with a variety of partners to whom they are not obligated to chain themselves for life, is one of the chief reasons that there are so many unmarried women. Bethany and co like to paint this like it's a bad thing, but really, how is it? How can freedom and liberation to this extent be a bad thing if it's what people are choosing and it's making them happy? If you don't want that kind of sexual freedom, that's okay, you don't have to have it. That's what choice is all about. Traster goes on to say, when it comes to stories that women tell or don't tell about sex, the interesting part isn't necessarily the fact of the sex. It's the increasing variety of sexual paths open to women. The diversity of choices made by different women, or sometimes by an individual woman, over the course of her adulthood. Some women have multiple partners, some have none. Again, it comes back to defining your core values around sex and being true to yourself. And there's no one right or wrong way to do that. 
just because women now can have a number of sexual partners uh, without risk of, you know, uh, unwanted pregnancies and stuff like that, that doesn't mean you have to. If that's not what's right for you, you do not have to do it. But at the same time, it's not okay for you to shame other people who do want to do that. It's about understanding what you want for yourself, but being open and respectful of the idea that other people can do what's right for themselves as well. Their selves? Themselves? Themse themselves, right? Words. Traster continues by arguing when we encounter women who are motivated by a spirit of conquest, who do not experience sexual hang-ups or guilt, who do not want touchy-feely ties with all or any of their sexual partners, and who do not in fact want to commit to them. This is but one of the ways that women get labelled sluts and deviants, considered unwell or unfit or unfeminine or damaged. So she's pointing out here that there is still social stigma, even though women now have more of these freedoms, there's still a social social stigma around it. Um, I've heard people talk about men in particular who will, uh, who really believe a like evolutionary perspective of sex and intimacy. And they will talk about like how men are just like these wild animals basically, and how um, their natural desire and their natural inkling is to just be with lots of women. Like they're like monkeys or something. And the reality is, is that God designed men and women to be with one person for life. And I think it's only when we step into um, a mindset, a perspective that truly isn't in line with God's word that we end up in that place. Bethany's displaying this. Remember her comment about how uh, men wanting multiple partners are being like animals. Not only is that offensive to men, but it's also offensive to the women who also want multiple partners and non-committed sex. Wanting that doesn't make you like an animal. It's just another way of being human and expressing yourself and being true to yourself. One final quote from Traster, and she says, the slow realization that women's sexuality when truly unleashed from hetero and marital expectation might begin to look more like traditionally male sexuality is the stuff of social, economic, and sexual revolution. And she argues that when women have this confident, liberated attitude to sex, it's, and I quote, makes her scary because it doesn't conform to what we think we know about what women desire. And this is because male sexuality is considered normal, healthy. Female sexuality is still liable to be viewed as immoral. So there's still absolutely this double standard at play when it comes to female sexuality. Traster finishes up this particular chapter in her book by pointing out that while sex with multiple partners isn't without some risks which need to be evaluated, for example, you know, there is still risk of pregnancy and STDs and, um, sexual violence and also like, you know, emotional hurt and stuff like that. There are risks that you need to be evaluated. She also says, it increases the odds of finding someone with whom you have terrific sex and of learning more about what turns you on and what turns you off, how your body works and how other people's body works, which just to me personally sounds pretty damn good. And to a lot of women, that sounds pretty damn good. And to some women, it doesn't sound worth it. And that's okay too. It's a shame that Bethany is still in the policing the majority of women's bodies and sex lives part of her journey, isn't it? We're seeing some progress with Bethany, but just not enough. Math. But anyway, back to the question. How do I control my sex drive in a godly way as a single woman? What if I'm single forever? So I think it's important too to note that your sex drive isn't the same all of the time. If we're talking about those physical longings for sex, um, to be close to someone, physical intimacy, intercourse, whatever, um, it doesn't look the same all the time. It can vary depending on the time of the month with your cycle. Very much you can have times where you're, it's more heightened, where you have that more like that longing because of hormones to be close to someone. Your body is in the time of, truly like wanting to make a baby. So it's really like ex ready and excited and wanting to welcome in. Again, I do think this is really great for Bethany to point out. It's not a hugely detailed point, but you know, good info for once, really. And so here's the deal is that when it comes to your sex drive, it's not just this thing that you are like a victim to that you are like, oh my gosh, my sex drive is just like out of control and at certain times and I am just like a slave to it and I'm just going to be miserable forever. There are actually a lot of things that you can do to make your sex drive really serve you and not the other way around. I was talking to Dr. Julie Slattery once and she was saying that a huge problem for single women 
is that a lot of single women don't have a lot of a strong purpose, strong direction. They don't have a lot going on in their life. A lot of single women are very bored, actually. And so it leaves them just a lot of time to fantasize and um, get into pornography or masturbation or erotica, or they just are like a victim to their sex drive because they're not using that energy and that um, the hormones and their life in a fulfilling direction. They're just kind of like, oh, when will this start? And they just feel like a victim to it. Oh God, this this bit though, like how is this not a joke? A lot of women are bored and so full victim to masturbation. You just, you can't make this stuff up, can you? Sorry, I was just getting bored of filming. Don't mind me, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Her solution though is that you should play pickleball. <laughs> Oh my God. If single women really started becoming more intentional and started filling up their schedules with good things, with good friendships, with good physical activities, you know, joining a, um, you know, there are like women's sports, joining a pickleball team. I feel like I've been making this video for so long, I'm starting to get a little delirious, but no, this is really what she says, play pickleball. What is it with Fundy's obsessions and pickleball, hmm? The other thing that can be really helpful in this season is to make sure that you are not pouring things into your life that are going to be difficult for you to handle and that will only fuel this drive that you can't completely satisfy. So if you are watching a ton of chick flicks, romance movies, following accounts that um, are marriage related, following people that are always ooey gooey gooey, like those can be really good things, but it might not be the best thing for you in this season. So you have to know like, huh, I mean, it might even be me on Instagram. I'm talking about marriage and sex all the time over there. And you might be like, yeah, that's not the best thing for me in this season. Like I get it, you know, I was there too. This bit I found bizarre because like my notes just say, has she really got people to pay her money just so she can say, unfollow me, I'm a bad influence on you? <laughs> and then this next part has absolutely nothing to do about sex or the sex course, but it's just the most revolting thing I've ever heard. And if I had to suffer through this and nearly puke because it did make me gag, so do you. Warning, this is revolting. You may want to skip it if you don't like... I don't even know why, I don't even know how to content warning this it if you're squeamish skip it Woo! we are going there y'all we are going there and i'm very thirsty hmm. i will show y'all so i got this little cap it's like falling off right now i got this little cap on my because a fly and i'm gonna sneeze now a fly flew in my straw and i didn't know it and i drank it I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Bless me. And it was still alive. And I felt it moving around in my mouth. And so I spit it into my hand. And then I looked down and there was a big black fly like swimming around in my hand. And I threw it on the ground and squashed it. So now forever and ever, amen, I have to have something covering my straw because I am absolutely terrified. Okay. That was a little sidebar. Okay. I can't believe I actually paid to hear that when in actuality, I wish I could have paid to not hear that. How these, this, these are the questions I love because single women need answers to these questions. How to be less nervous about the pain that can come with losing your virginity. I want to do a, um, I don't know. I want more women to know about this. So one, it is not always painful. It, you will talk to, if you talk to 50 women who were virgins on their wedding night or the virgins the first time, obviously they had sex, um, you'll get 50 different experiences, 50 different answers. It really is not across the board. Just because you are virgin does not mean that sex will be painful. There are plenty of women who are virgins and sex is not painful at all. It really just depends on your makeup and your body and really like how tight you are um, down in your vagina area. And that really is different for everyone. This is decent, this is okay to content, but I think this would have been a really good time to talk about hymens. Uh, we had a bit on this earlier when we talked about virginity being a social construct and the differences in hymens and stuff. I think I also talked about this quite a bit in the marriage course and the difference in how hymens can form, how they change throughout your life, all that sort of thing. Flo Perry in her book, How to Have Feminist Sex, talks about hymens quite a lot. Really interesting stuff, I recommend that. Overall though, this isn't too bad. Uh, she mentions things like how tensing up can cause more pain and some other bits like that. Again, it's not really quite enough information and not something worth paying for, but at least it's not incorrect here. So 
I can't complain too much. Something that I would strongly recommend is finding a local pelvic floor therapist. And you can find a female. There are a lot of females that work in this field. I personally, when I see the OB or a pelvic floor therapist, I personally like to see a female because I just feel more comfortable um, and I feel like they get me and all of that. So you can just look in your area, pelvic floor therapist. And you're not going necessarily because you have a bunch of problems, but you're going to get your pelvic floor, which is everything kind of down there, um, evaluated, checked out, and to make sure that you aren't um, struggling with a ton of tightness, that you aren't struggling with um, different issues down there. And like, it can be hard to know, like, well, everything feels fine, but sometimes you can go down there and they can find like muscle spasms within like your actual vagina. They can find, um, there, there can just be issues or they can say, wow, like you do have an extremely tight, you're very tight down there and they can give you exercises and things that you can do to help loosen it. And that doesn't mean you have to be uh, about to have sex to go and do those things. Like, you know, I've never really heard of this being like a standard thing and like advice given to most people. Um, but if it is, please let me know down in the comments. This bit gets repeated a lot for a lot of this lesson, actually. And then uh, about, you know, getting a pelvic floor evaluated and blah, blah, blah. Um, and then the rest of this lesson is just stuff we've already covered over in the marriage course. And then Bethany tells people to go buy the marriage course too. So fun times. Skipping forward a bit. We have this talking about masturbation again. Can past, strug- can past struggles with masturbation cause difficulty reaching an orgasm with a partner? And some of you probably just flinched like, oh my gosh, she just said that word. But again, these are questions that single women have. And if we as women, Christian women, aren't willing to talk about these things in a healthy, appropriate way, you know you're going to go to Google and you're going to get all sorts of advice. Um, And so I think it's better to have these open and honest conversations. And if at any point, any topic, any question, you're like, oh, I don't really want to listen to it, just skip it over. Skip it to the next one. Come back if you want to later. Um, There are a lot of things for women that can cause problems with orgasm outside of a past struggle with masturbation. Um, Mental you know, just not really being in a good mental place, being distracted, um, being, uh, having feelings like something's wrong with your body, um, expecting way too much, thinking you're taking too long, just all of those sorts of lies and issues and problems can cause problems with orgasm. Um, of course, past struggles of masturbation can cause, um, like, it's not like it's going to cause problems, but it could cause different, what do you call them? Not roadblocks, roadblocks, like turtles that you, turtles, hurdles that you might have to work through. Again, Bethany is only addressing the shame problem again here. She's not, what she's not addressing is the fact that, especially for women, a familiarity with your body through masturbation often leads to a better, more satisfying sex life because you already know what you like and you can communicate that to your partner and you can bring it in to your partner's sex if you want. So the answer you're looking for, Bethany, is simply no. Then there's a bunch more repeated stuff that I'm going to skip over. Um, Let's just try and speed through this last lesson now because this video is already far too long. Question 10 is titled, what if I never get married or have sex? I'm expecting a fair bit of repetition in this too. Because how do you drag out Bethany's answer of, no, you're not allowed sex, play some sports and join a Bible group for 25 whole minutes? I don't know, but she manages it. And I thought I talked a lot. Welcome to session 10. You made it to the very end of the ultimate sex mentorship course for single women. Not a high percentage of people actually make it to the very end. So I'm super proud of you for getting through the Q&A, for getting through all of the sessions and getting to this point today. This is one of those few times in life I wish I wasn't in the top percentile of something. Now, throughout this course, we got a bunch of questions and The one that was asked over and over and over again, I want to pull it up so it's in your own um, words, but um, over and over and over and over again, I got questions about um, being single forever, never experiencing sexual intimacy. And I wanted to read it to you all, but I'm, where is my, where is my screenshot of it? Um, But essentially, oh yeah, yeah. Okay. So here's one of them. What should a woman do in the event she never marries, but still has needs? Also this, what if I never get married or experience sex? So those sorts of questions were asked 
quite a bit um, when the topic of this course came up. And even um, just in the DMs and in conversations with you all, that is one of the biggest questions that you want to know. Like, what if I get never get married? And what if I never experience sexual intimacy? What if I am single forever? And so that's kind of what we're going to focus on today. And so you start off with all these questions, like, should I go to online dating? Um, should I lower my standards? There's all sorts of questions that single women turn to to find an answer to this question because the thought is kind of like, well, maybe there's something standing in the way of me getting married. And so if I can remove that thing, then I'll actually be able to get there more quickly. And so for some single women, they feel like, well, turning to online dating is the answer or maybe lowering my standards is the answer because I have high standards and the guys around me just, you know, the guys aren't going to, guys don't want to wait. Guys don't want to, you know, have, you know, wait for a girl like me. So if I don't lower my standards, I'm not going to get a guy. All of these thoughts can start to enter our minds and we need to make sure we have like good wisdom to either answer those questions or combat them if they are lies. Oh, um, yeah, she basically starts to say here that we shouldn't lower our standards just to get into a relationship quickly. And I actually really 100% agree with this. I think it's very, very good advice. You will find a lot of people online now saying, okay, you see a lot of men online now saying that women have too high standards. Uh, we all need to lower our standards and stop being so picky. And you're, um, one of the things I got told a lot while I was single was that um, I would end up alone because I was narrowing my dating pool too much. And I'm like, but that's the point. We shouldn't be there being like, oh, let's have a thousand potential love interests and I'll go with the first one that shows an interest in me. No, I don't want to do that. I'd rather narrow it down and narrow it down and narrow it down until I have like three potential love interests and then go, okay, now let's get to know each other and see if this is a fit, you know? Because I'd rather have a lower amount of high quality potential partners than just go with the first one of many that shows an interest. Because yeah, it might take you longer to find this high quality partner, but it's gonna produce a better quality relationship overall, a better match between you, you know? So in this case, I actually think Bethany is talking some sense for once and good on her. A bunch of lies that single women have either you know, thought or believed or heard. And then I want to combat them with some scripture and some truth. And now these lies might not all, um, might not all relate to you, but I think some of them will. Lie number one, I would be more valuable if I had a boyfriend or husband. The truth is that nothing can add to my value. I am fully loved and valued as a child of God to know that there is nothing good you can do and nothing bad you can do to take away from the worth that God has already given you. You don't earn your worth and you don't lose your worth. Your worth isn't something that you can like create or decrease. Your worth comes from Christ and who he says you are and what he has done for you. That's where your worth comes from. You know, all the biblical stuff aside here, yeah, I love that she says getting married won't make you better or more special or any of that stuff, but the concept of none of your actions increasing or decreasing your worth is kind of worrying to me because that's how so many people kept letting people like Josh Duggar get away with their crimes for so long. And with Bethany's history in the IBLP, and that's what Josh Duggar was a part of too, this is kind of worrying. A lot of the stuff I covered in my IBLP slash Duggar video was how, you know, people like Josh Duggar, he literally molested children, but was told by everyone around him that God still loved him, which meant that everyone around him, including his victims, needed to forgive him. Because even though he did something bad, that doesn't make him a bad person in the eyes of God. It's really harmful. Like, the IBLP really pushes this sort of narrative, and I have a whole section of it on, in my video on them, about how they literally have whole resources for teaching people how to forgive their abusers, because abuse, especially of children, is so common amongst the IBLP. And this idea that just because you did something bad, it doesn't make you a bad person, is fine generally for the world, you know? People mess up all the time, people make mistakes all the time, and you're right, messing up once doesn't make you a bad person. But when it comes to the more serious stuff, I think it's important to point out that, yeah, sometimes people are just bad people, and some people don't deserve our forgiveness. Child abusers, people who commit domestic violence, um, certain types of bullies don't deserve our forgiveness, and we don't have to offer that forgiveness if we don't want. I don't know, maybe I'm getting sidetracked here. It just, it's just basically the mindset that Bethany is preaching here. 
is exactly what the IBLP and other people push that's really, really harmful. It's just thankfully Bethany's pushing it in a less harmful context, but it just worries me overall, you know, words and stuff. Then there's five more minutes of content of being like, oh, God loves you so much, and me, 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 before Bethany goes on to talk about Marilyn Monroe again. Her and Kristen wrote about this in their first book, and I covered it when I reviewed that a couple of years back now. Um, Bethany is basically using this narrative again of like, see, she had everything. Men worshipped her and she still wasn't happy. Therefore, we shouldn't embrace our sexuality. But it's absolute crap. She's completely missing the struggles and trauma that Marilyn Monroe went through. Marilyn Monroe was repeatedly abused by people and assaulted and degraded and not taken seriously. People literally used her as a sex object instead of seeing her as a woman she was with a sexuality. It was dehumanizing. This woman suffered so much and to use her as an example of, see, sex will only make you miserable when you can barely even count some of the ways she was used as men as sex and, you know, because instead it was rape. It feels thoroughly disrespectful and I don't like it. And then honestly, there's nothing really new in the end of this lesson, except Bethany selling more of her PDFs. So thank God those last two were quick. I could not deal with much more. In conclusion, this is too much. This video is too long. I've spent too much of this year watching and listening to Bethany Beale. I would like 2024 to be mostly Bethany free, please. Please, please don't make me talk about Bethany again for a long time. It's too much. And also, I would rather not give Bethany any more money. The, I think it's 70 pound each I've had to spend on these courses and I would really rather not do that again. I know I'm trying to offset what I gave her with the donations to charity and by using money made from these videos to give to charity, but at the same time, I still feel guilty for giving her anything for this kind of content, you know? So I'd rather not do that again, please. So there's that. In regards to this course and my thoughts overall, I thought this course wouldn't be as bad as the marriage one and I can't believe how wrong I was. Isn't it right? While there wasn't quite as much blatant misinformation in this course, um, there were still so many harmful ideologies being pushed and there was this overall narrative of shame running through everything that I really had a big problem with and there was just a lot of information missed out that would have been useful that Bethany just decided, yeah, CBA, not gonna put it in. The actual bits of information in this course which are useful and good could easily have been edited down to I don't know, like a 15 minute video if you cut out all the nonsense. This course, even at the discounted rate of 70 quid that I paid for it, is, is not worth the money. I would say it's absolutely not worth your time. I do not encourage anyone else to go out and buy it. Um, but I hope that along the way throughout my video, I've at least been able to add some value to this and transform her content into something which has been educational and hopefully a little bit entertaining along the way as well. I hope you maybe have learned something from my commentary and if you'd like to use this video as a jumping off point to go and learn more about some topics you're interested in then of course I thoroughly recommend you go and check out the sponsor of today's video, Valesa, who um, basically they're all about providing amazing resources for women to feel comfortable and confident in their sexuality as well as offering things like amazing sex toys for you to really get to know yourself and understand your body and just have a little bit of fun, you know? I do have another massive video that I'm currently working on which I was hoping to get out before Christmas but at this point I don't think it will be so hopefully it'll still be out in December if not it'll be early January for you guys I'm very excited for you to see that one too um, but for now thank you so much for your patience in getting through this video especially with the dodgy audio issues thank you for your patience in how long it's taken me to make this Koopy Bear is so grumpy today aren't you Piglet? Thank you for your patience in hearing her grumbles while she's talking a lot. You okay? Um, yeah, thank you once again to Balesa for sponsoring this video. And thank you to everyone who is supporting my work over on Patreon because without you, I couldn't keep making videos like this, which are potentially gonna be quite heavily demonetized by YouTube. A few of my videos have been recently the, um, no, I know, it's okay. The Jimmy Savile one was demonetized. I don't have high hopes for this one. So all your support over on Patreon really, really helps and allows me to keep making these videos for you to enjoy and hopefully learn something from. So with that in mind, I'm gonna finally stop talking, rest my voice for a little bit and hope you all <laughs> have a wonderful 
Christmas, holidays, winter time, whatever you celebrate, I'm gonna go take this little bear for a little walk, aren't I? My little grumble pig. And if I don't speak to you guys again before the end of the year, I hope you have a wonderful new year. Thank you all for all the amazing support and kindness you've shown me this year. Thank you for all the videos you've watched, all the nice comments you've left. This really has been, despite a hell of a lot of difficult stuff going on in my private life with my health and some of the stuff behind the scenes, um, in terms of people watching my videos and stuff, this has been my best year yet on YouTube and I am so grateful for all the continued support and how amazing you guys are and to every single person who's reached out to me and told me your story, who's told, you know, the people who've told me what's going on in their lives, how my videos have helped them, the people who've sent gifts for me and Kyra, all those little things help so, so much and they keep me going and when I'm having the bad weeks like this week where all my tech issues were going on and I was just like, crying constantly and I've been up till like 1, 2, 3 a.m. in the morning editing and I'm going to be doing that tonight as well. While all that's been going on, you guys and your nice comments and like all the little things you've done for me, it helps so so much and I can't put into words how grateful I am. So thank you so much, I appreciate you guys and I will see you very soon, maybe next year.